you guys. Um, a lot of noise in the background. Hold on, let me see just to make sure. Okay. So I've been asked to uh, talk about minimizing your learning curve with the direct anterior approach. This is my experience training as a posterior surgeon and going anterior. These are my disclosures, but truly the biggest disclosure I think is that I was traditionally trained as a posterior trained surgeon. Like I never did any anterior anything during my residency or fellowship. And it's about six years into uh, practice that I decided to switch to the anterior approach. So one of the biggest questions is why would you even consider changing, right? Why was I interested in the DA approach? And I think I really wanted to become a circumferential surgeon, being, getting, being comfortable getting into the hip from the front side or back. I wanted to be able to critically evaluate the literature, a lot of literature coming out on the anterior approach. I don't know if the socket looks nice. I don't know if the femur is hard. If I've never done it, I don't know how to evaluate what the literature is on that. Most importantly, residents and fellows are now asking specifically in the U.S. to learn the anterior approach. If you don't offer that option, they will not consider your fellowship as a very highly competitive fellowship. I will tell you personally, and this is a true thing, marketing had nothing to do with it. Prior to me switching to the anterior approach, I had less than a handful of patients in about seven years that asked me about what approach I do. They said, I've got a hip problem fix my hip and I trust you to do it. Thank you so much. So you can imagine when I switched approaches, I was very nervous, I had a lot of anxiety. I was panicking and not because I didn't think I could do it, but it was more that I wasn't having a problem with my posterior approaches. So my question was, what problem am I trying to solve? So this required a very dedicated approach, right? You'll see these five steps. I'm gonna go through these very quickly. Two to three months it took me to figure out how to do the anterior approach properly. So the step one was really focusing on the anatomy and literature on the anterior approach. Yeah, I know what the anatomy is in the front of the hip. I learned this in medical school, but I'm not used to seeing the hip from this angle, and this perspective on a routine basis. Right now, you've got to think about capsular structures that are different. They're on the opposite side of what I was actually taught to think about. And I've got different parts of the capsule that are important, that are putting different stresses on the hip that are going to result in specific deformities around the hip that I need to address. I found this, uh, this technique paper from Frederick Lowe from Paris, and it was a lot about specific things about the capsule. And he gave a lot of really, really detailed overview of capsular attachments and portions of the capsule things I've never thought about during my training. And I had to really start thinking about where these structures were in my field of vision compared to what I've been used to like seeing. So after doing an anatomy review, I ended up going to see one of my mentors perform three total hip replacements. This is Tyler Goldberg from Texas Orthopedics in Austin, Texas. Phenomenal educator, excellent surgeon, but very systematic on how he approached the anterior hip. And it was great. I got to spend time with him and I watched him do three hip replacements. I watched his video. I watched it in preparation for his surgery. I watched it after I watched his surgery. And then I created this detail annotated documents. This is a 32 page document that I created over time after watching Tyler Goldberg on how to perform an anterior hip. And then I was given the opportunity at that point, so this is the first four to six weeks, to go watch his mentor, right? So my mentor's mentor performed three total hips. I went to France, and I went to go see Frederick Loeb. And if any of you have seen Frederick Loeb before, he is a tremendous surgeon, master surgeon. And he does a total hip replacement by himself with just his scrub tech. Maybe he has this pneumatic arm that you can see here that holds a retractor. And he does this in 30 minutes to a pretty small incision with no x-ray. And when you look at the post-operative x-ray, it's spot on perfect. So I was very convinced that I was like, this is what I want to learn. Okay. And then after watching my mentor's mentor perform three total hip replacements, I went to a cadaver lab. And I asked the company that was sponsoring the lab to say, hey, listen, Tyler Goldberg is going to do a demonstration on a cadaver. They said, yes. I said, can I assist him on that? They said, sure. And I said, if he does a hip on one side, can you have me do a hip on the other side? They said, sure. I said, can I pick the cadaver? They said, not a problem. 
They said, why? I said, I want to pick the cadaver, the most muscular cadaver or the most obese cadaver. I want to see what he's going to do differently. The hardest part for me as a posterior trained surgeon is looking at the exposure, right? Okay, I can see the three colors and figure out where I need to make my fascial incision. Not a problem. But now raising my hand means something different, meaning this is anniversion and retroversion versus dropping my hand, which is really more abduction angle. And really getting that orientation was tough. And, and for me, really the screws were actually tough for me. It was in a different spot. And I had to really train my brain to actually tilt 90 degrees from what I was used to seeing. This was really, really tough. Thinking about what releases I need to do on the femur to get the femur up and out to where I want to see it. And coming up with a systematic way to do this, right? This is your pubofemoral ligament. This is the ischiofemoral capsule. There's your obturator internus. There's your piriformis for really tough cases. And God, you don't really ever want to release the externus. But again, I'm seeing these from a different angle. The orientation's off. Performing our first cases, I had Tyler Goldberg actually come in and he scrubbed into my first two cases. He didn't touch the patient, scrubbed in right next to me. And he said, your incision is in the wrong spot. Your retractor is a little bit too low. I need you to rotate the leg one more click. But my anxiety level was one-tenth of what it would have been if he wasn't standing there. The next three cases we did as a team. And then I went to another cadaver lab with my physician assistant. And then after 30 cases, we went back and went to go see Tyler Goldberg again. And it was great because my PA came with me. And my PA said, we don't get this view back in Philadelphia. Figure out what he's doing differently. Okay. And then after 60 cases, Tyler Goldberg came back up to Penn, visited me, watched me do two cases. And it was great because I learned a couple more tricks. And then he signed off on me being an instructor to help teach other surgeons how to do an anterior hip. I'll tell you one of the biggest things that we did was having a team-based approach, right? Having a team engaged in learning. Having my PA attend that second cadaveric course was incredible. Having him come back to that second visit to Tyler Goldberg, critical. We created this annotated procedure book. We review that book all the time and continually add more iterations to the book based on what we learn. And I had my scrub tech, my scrub nurse, my circulating nurse, anesthesia, radiology, all involved as the team to say, we're all learning a new approach. It's not just me as the surgeon. The team reviewed Tyler Goldberg's video the night before surgery for the first 30 or 40 cases. And after every single one of the first 40 cases, we debriefed afterwards as a team to say what went well, what didn't go well, what do we need to do better? We created our own video. This is for the residents and fellows, but this is another opportunity for me to really think about how I want to put this approach together. Learning curve. So I'll give you some data. First five cases, 87 minute average tourniquet, uh, average time, uh, surgical time, 310 cc's of blood loss. We weren't that good in the first five cases. Went back. Next 20 cases, average time dropped by 36 minutes. And our average blood loss lost, uh, dropped by about 90 cc's. That's right around the time that we went back and go went to go see Tyler Goldberg again for another iteration of three more cases. Next 130 cases or so dropped another 10 minutes in average time, another 100 cc's in blood loss. And if I look at my first several 130 cases or so, 160 cases, I had great, one greater trope fracture, which was my error. I didn't do a good job. I was trying to cut the femoral neck and I let my blade skive a little bit laterally. Had one injection, one, one infection that had one IND poly exchange. And I had a patient that had a Vancouver type C fracture five weeks post-op no instability issues on the anterior approach. And if I look at, this is actually one of our primary care doctors. This is 10 days post-op, came back in. He's 78 years old in this image, walking with no cane, no crutch. And on the right side, we did his hip. His left hip was on deck to get replaced. So I was sold. So for people in the audience who are thinking about doing the anterior hip and you're thinking about starting, how do you figure out what your green light indications are early in your learning curve? I think I look at four things. I look at deformity, soft tissue, bone stock, and BMI. Deformity should be minimal deformity, no sclerosis in the canal. You want a long valgus neck and you don't want a narrow iliac flare. You want a, sorry, you want a narrow iliac flare. You don't want one that's very wide. 
mild to moderate muscularity, minimal to moderate osteophytes. You want someone who does not have a lot of osteoporosis. Most patients who have osteoporosis are thin, but you worry about them because their bone stock is not that great. BMI, obviously you want someone who has a low BMI. Contraindications, I think early in your learning curve, you don't want someone who's got large deformities, severe DDH, really sclerotic canal in Philadelphia. I have a lot of patients that have avascular necrosis, second to sec secondary to sickle cell disease, short varus neck, wide iliac flare makes it harder. Very muscular patients, a lot of osteophytes, previous radiation to that hip. And then you think about some of these things, osteoporosis, conversion, total hips, any type of bone loss or revision, that's not what you want to do in the beginning. And obviously BMI above 40, you got to be careful, I think, when you're starting out. Last couple of slides, we actually put together a paper last year on how to safely implement the anterior approach, converting from a mini posterior approach and thinking about how to do this systematically. We retrospectively reviewed all of our prospective data. We had two cohorts of patients, my first 100 consecutive direct anterior approach hips compared to my last 100 consecutive mini posterior hips. This is my learning curve versus my standard approach. At that point, I had already been about six, seven years into practice. And we really were evaluating the training methodology, not that one approach is better than the other. We looked at demographic data, operative time, length of stay, blood loss, complication rate. I'm going to tell you that there's two things that I really took away from this. Complication rate was no different between the two. Okay. Operative time was a little bit shorter by seven minutes in the posterior approach group and the length of stay was 0.7 days shorter in the anterior group. No one cares. Blood loss was 10 cc's different, not a big deal. Key thing is that the complication rate was no different. The point was if you follow a dedicated platform and program to actually learn how to do this, you can do this if you have not been formally trained in an anterior approach. My current practice trend, I'm at about 70% doing anterior hips. And that's changed over the last few years, right? 30% up to 70%. And I think a lot of this comes down to continued learning, right? So we're now down on version, if you look at the bottom of the screen, version number 18 of that annotated document that we started back in 2016, 2017. Long-term continued learning, right? So these are uh, actually notes from Tyler Goldberg, who went to go back and see Frederick Lode in Paris to watch him learn how to do the bikini incision, smaller incision, no releases. And that's after having done 1,500 hips. Can you even be better off at where you are? Can you have a continued learning platform? Okay. I think the last couple of slides are you have to spend time on this, right? Especially if you are transitioning from posterior to anterior, which is a very, very disorienting like position. If you are not doing a fellowship, you're not taking time off. I don't think what is, what is not adequate is watching an experienced surgeon perform a few surgeries and say, great, I've done thousands of hips. I can do this. Or doing one cadaver session before going live and say, yep, we're going to take care of patients on Monday because I did a cadaver course on Saturday. Okay. I look at this as someone who has learned how to do the beach chair shoulder position. And now you've been asked to do the same shoulder procedure through a lateral decubitus position. It is disorienting. It is 90 degrees off axis of how you've been trained. So in summary, design a disciplined approach, respect the time required for preparation, create this annotated document. This is a way I learn, but I think most people do learn this way. Have a team-based approach, get your team involved in what they need to do and plan for continued education. Okay. I don't think a new procedure is anything that you should just say, I've done thousands of this approach from a different procedure or done this procedure from a different approach. This is not a spectator sport. I think you need to get in the game and actually do some real work and have a good plan on how you're going to get there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Neil. Uh, that was a, a fantastic summary of how uh, you need to switch from a uh, posterior to a DAA. Uh, I still haven't figured out uh, figured out why you should switch in the first place because the complication rate after a hip replacement is less than one percent, and uh, I'm not sure uh, all the surgeons who switch or you know uh, start DAA are as meticulous as you. So, any word of uh, advice for the uh, younger surgeons and uh, 
uh, anything from your side which convinces me that you should switch to a DAA in the first place. It is another method of doing a hip replacement. Yeah. So, Krishna Kiran, that's a very good uh, question because I think people sometimes switch for the wrong reason, especially in the U.S. Now, I think in India, there, you know, Dr. Malotra, you and I have spoken about this over the last several years. There's a lot of interest. <coughs> but not the same constraints. We have fellows who will not get actually invited to come interview at a program or a practice because they don't do the anterior approach. I agree with you. I think if you do a total hip properly, whether it's front, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. If you do the hip from the front side or back, as long as you do it properly, it doesn't matter. Patients will do well. I think the biggest thing that I've seen is that patients come back in the office at two weeks and say, I took no pain medication. I'm not on the walker. I'm not on the cane. I don't have to do physical therapy. And I don't think it has anything to do with anything about our surgical technique or how good of a surgeon you are. It has everything to do with saving the big muscle, which is the TFL in the front. Because in the posterior approach, you're splitting the G-Max. You're not cutting it, but you're still splitting it. And I think that causes some pain and dysfunction. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Neil, just to let you know, I don't know whether you are aware, last weekend, myself and Krishna Kiran had a debate in IAA Con where I spoke for uh, the direct interior and he spoke for posterior approach. And uh, I personally think that you have to, uh, you know, really uh, see the incremental benefit and be convinced that it is worth training for a new approach because for us, if the patient doesn't need the uh, the dislocation precautions, if the patient is pain free, if the patient can do everything which he wants with a lower dislocation risk, I think for me it's a big even big enough incentive. Yeah, no, I, listen, I, Dr. Malotra, in the United States, we have a massive problem with opioids and medications that people are getting hooked on. I have seen more patients in the last four years that have not taken any narcotics after a total hip replacement. I think my posterior approaches are doing very well. I'm not unhappy with it, but they're not where my anterior approaches are. Yeah, I think uh, it makes uh, a reasonable point, uh, Neil. Uh, my only concern was that this uh, study from Ontario on a, a population-based uh, study showed that the complications with DA was twice as high as posterior approach. And uh, also the... DA was nine times more likely to be marketed as a better procedure as compared to what is the complications or risks associated with it. So that concerns me because, you know, uh, uh, somebody does, does it like you for a trading, you know, for the benefit of the patient, that's fine. But if you're marketing it as something superior for a week or 10 days of better narcotic use, I don't think that is the way uh, it should be I done. I think you're yeah. right. KK, you're 100% right. Uh, and again, I think our study was based off of if you're going to do this, do this properly. It's yeah, not based that. off of marketing. Have a yeah. plan, have an educational program planned out, have some continued learning after that. You're right. I think if you do this, ah, this is a spectator sport. Let me market this. I'm a hip surgeon. It'll be fine. You're going to hurt some people. Yeah. And that's why our, our main point of that paper was that our complication rate was not any different Anterior posterior. Yeah. Not that one approach is better. Book on anterior approach. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now we'll uh, move on to the next talk: myths and facts about DAA surgery. Dr. Rubin. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I've recorded the talk and sent it in just in case there was any problem. I hope that you have it and you can play it here, and I'll be on for discussion. This is a session on myths and facts about direct anterior approach in 2021. I'm Dr. Lee Rubin from Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Thank you for the great honor of this invitation uh, and the members of the organizing committee. I really am so deeply honored you've invited me to join you. I wish I could join in person, of course. Greetings from here at my university, Yale uh, in New Haven, Connecticut. 
To all of you at the conference, hope you are well and healthy and recovering after COVID. My disclosures are shown. I'm pleased to have written a textbook on anterior approach along with my co-authors uh, and editors. The second edition of this textbook will be forthcoming in 2022, and I'm very excited to talk about that. There are a great many myths that continue to surround the direct anterior approach. And here we see Perseus with the head of the Medusa. And I think this is just a great image. And I think what we have to do is use facts and reality and experience and expertise to address those myths and slay them uh, and move on so that we can all learn the anterior approach. But I've heard them all. It's a new approach. Oh, you have higher rates of wound healing problems, high femoral fracture rates. You can't cement through the anterior approach. The LFCN injury is common. Oh, it can't be used for complex cases or revisions or infections or partial lips. All of these are incorrect. Let's just tackle a few of them. Myth, it's a, few, it's a new technique. Well, Dr. Keggy, who is my mentor here at Yale, developed this technique for total hip arthroplasty. It had been used previously uh, throughout history for exposure of the hip, childhood infections of the hip, partial hips, et cetera. But he presented this in 1977 and published his initial results in 1980 with many subsequent publications. And thus at our university and certainly in the world, there's 45 years of continuous use of this technique. It's published, it's in the literature, it's very well established with excellent outcomes. It is not a new technique. We know it utilizes the internervous plane between the femoral nerve and superior gluteal nerve, and that's the advantage of the technique. That concept is not new, uh, but when you adopt the technique, know that you have 45 years of history behind it. How about this myth? Uh, anterior approach has a high infection rate. Well, we looked at our series uh, recently published in 2019 on a paper looking at incisional negative pressure dressings versus uh, aqua cell type dressings for primary total hips, and we looked at 275 patients. And essentially, in that group, we had two deep joint infections, which was a rate of 0.72% uh, in that population, taking care of all different comers and, and all different levels of uh, patient BMI and everything else. Um, I don't think there's an excessive rate of infection, uh, and our infection rate in general is quite low. Myth. Lateral femoral cutaneous nerve palsies are common after total hip arthroplasty through the anterior approach. We know that the LFCN is a concern for surgeons and patients. Uh, the main trunk of this typically pierces the fascia lata, medial to the ASIS, and anterior hip literature is quite variable in terms of the risk of injury. The main trunk, 62 to 27% of time is medial to the ASIS, and only 11% of the time is lateral to it. And there are some branches to watch out for. But when you look at studies that track patients and survey them at 12 and 26 months, the incidence of nerve injury decreases dramatically down to 11% at 26 months, and the improvement of dysesthesia is 96% with quality of life. In a single surgeon series in this study, the numbness that patients experienced was 37% at two years and 11% in six years, and there's no change in functional outcomes at all. Uh, so it's quite minimal. In contrast to total knee arthroplasty, the incidence of lateral numbness of, uh, next to the knee is 84 to 88%, and that's persistent. Here's my marking. I marked the skin on the right hip distal and lateral to the ASIS, and I've tried to show the curvilinear branches here, the trunk and branches of where I anticipate the LFCM to be. So a lateral skin incision can really help. How about a myth? You cannot manage complex native hips through the anterior approach. Well, I'll show a case. Here's a patient, 59 year old with Down syndrome, right hip pain, he walks with a shoe lift to baseline. We use an anterior approach to expose his hip and create a femoral neck osteotomy. Here's his femoral head removed with osteophyte that you can see. Pre-op and post-op at one year, this patient had improvements of his femoral rotation, improvement of his walking capacity, complete elimination of his pain, and preservation of all the remaining muscles around his hip. We've published our results on hip resection arthroplasty previously in JBGS reviews in 2014 with outstanding results for management of chronic hip infections as well as pediatric disease, and that reference is available for you here. How about a myth? You cannot perform revision if the, if, if the primary hip was done through a different approach. Here's a great case. This patient was treated for a left hip replacement by one of my partners, anterolateral hip replacement, uh, 20 years prior, had the right hip done. And during the recovery, during therapy, worked his cup loops and had an intraprosthetic dislocation. He couldn't bear weight, no sign of infection, no trauma. Uh, but he presented to my office like this, incapacitated, a very well-fixed stem with a bullet tip, very difficult to remove that osteolog stem. So we did an anterior approach, converted him to a revision acetabulum, as you can see here. 
patient walked out of the hospital completely cured. No problem going from a posterior lateral approach to an anterior approach for that revision. It works well for cup revisions. How about a myth? You cannot do complex primary hips through the anterior approach. Well, here's a case to show you otherwise. 60-year-old male who had a slip epiphysis as a child, it retained nose pins. And these were not only retained, but completely incarcerated in the lateral cortex, as you can see. This is not an easy case. Lots of papers showing you can section the femoral head and then remove the pins. You can tap them out, for example, but that's not gonna work here. We have to go and use a two incision approach. In the right side, you can see we did an anterior approach to the hip first, exposed the hip and capsule. Then we did a lateral approach. Here's the zoomed in view. And you can see some of the pin heads were visible and some were not. We used a small bird to identify them. We removed them and then placed an autograph from the femoral head after the total hip. And this is what the cup and stem looked like. You could argue a longer stem would have been beneficial, but he had outstanding bones, so a collared stem was chosen. How about a myth? You cannot do hemiarthroplasty with the anterior approach. Well, I have a separate video to show you on that, and here's a nice photo of me doing the hemiarthroplasty. But here are two summary papers showing surgical approaches. Uh, the anterior approach has a much lower risk of dislocations in the posterior approach. And in this paper, a meta-analysis, the authors wrote that there is no evident advantage of the posterior approach, and its routine use for fracture-related hemiarthroplasty should be questioned. Another paper, another meta-analysis that was just published in 2020, showed one-fifth the risk of dislocation. Odds ratio is 0.19, and no change in risk for any of the other complications with the anterior approach. So anterior approach is actually much safer for hemiarthroplasty, in my opinion. Myth, you cannot do complex revisions through the anterior approach. Okay, here's a patient who is 97 years old at presentation to me. She had a hip replacement to my partner 27 years ago with a cemented stem and cup. No records available. She couldn't walk because it was totally loose and quite painful for her. So we planned out the revision. We thought maybe we could change the polyethylene uh, and keep the cup, but it came completely out. So here's a video showing the approach and what it looked like interoperably. So we start with the ASIS and create an extensile approach, lifted the skin flap, dissected the TFL, as you can see here, exposed the hip joint through the anterior working window anteriorly, and then lifted the vastus lateralis up as you can see here, from posterior to anterior to preserve the femoral nerve innervation. And then we're able to cerclage wire the femur, that was the bulge of her hip, and put our wires in. And as you can see, once that was done, this is her revision construct. Did extremely well. She did have an IND for serous drainage from her Lovenox use, but she was ambulatory at 12 months with no further symptoms, no further infection. Myth, you can't use total hip to manage periprosthetic fractures. Well, here's the intraoperative femur fracture, one of the rare two cases in five years that I've had. This patient works as an electrician, had an elective, unremarkable left hip, but unfortunately during stem insertion, we had a crack in the femur. So we removed the stem, placed the surplage wire above the lesser trochanter, reinserted a collar stem, and reduced his hip, as you can see here. He did quite well. At post-op, he had no pain, full weight bearing, and was back to work. So the error is not in having a small fissure in the femur. The error is if you fail to recognize it. So your exposure is critical. You don't want to find this after the surgery. Post-op periprosthetic femur fracture, a different case, 62-year-old lady, elective hip. This is what I did. The collar, perhaps not as well supported, but she did well for the first two weeks. She went home the next day. She showed up after falling down the stairs, unfortunately. And this is what she came in with. You can see the staple are still in place. So for those of you who go different approaches, well, this lady has a fresh incision with staples. So what we had to do is expose the hip, remove the femoral stem through the anterior working window, elevate the vastus laterally through the extensile approach, put our cerclage wires to reduce the hip, place a long monoblock Wagner style stem, and this is her film at four months. The fracture is completely healed. She walked away without any further complications. And lastly, the last case, a myth, you can't manage an infection through the anterior approach and you can't perform a proximal femur replacement through the anterior approach. Well, just not true. This is a 90-year-old femur who came into my practice just a few months ago with a massive thigh abscess related to a rib infection on the left side. And you can see in first stage, we had to drain her thigh and remove all the implants. And here's our extensile exposure. I have direct access, wonderful view of the cup. She had a PCA cup, and just with a little bit of movement, we were able to remove that cup as you see here. 
Thankfully, that came out well. We did an osteotomy anteriorly to remove her femoral stem, placed an antibiotic spacer as shown here, and we just came back a few months ago and performed the second stage through the same incision with the cup and a proximal femur replacement in to remove all that proximal bone. And this is what it looked like. Same exposure, just taking the tensor distal and lateral, splitting it, elevating the vastus from posterior to anterior. And you can see there's the proximal femur replacement in place. And we added some antibiotic cement with a single circlage wire around the stem to keep her from getting infected. She had no pain after this operation, and walked out of the hospital successfully. So in summary, I think the old adage, the proverb that says, the person who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the person who is doing it. And I think with the direct anterior approach, we have proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that all surgeries can be accomplished through the anterior approach. And in many studies that I have shown you here, complication rates in the short term are demonstrably lower for total hip regarding dislocation of partial and total hip replacement. Thank you for your attention. I wish you well on your own learning curve for the anterior approach, and I'll be available for questions shortly. Thank you. Uh, that was a fantastic uh, talk. I think you should continue with your uh, two more talks, and then we can take some questions later on. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Let's play the next video. Is it recorded? Greetings from Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. I'm Dr. Lee Rubin, and I'm excited to present on behalf of our team regarding anatomic navigation for acetabular component positioning and direct anterior approach total hip arthroplasty. Our AOS disclosures are presented here. Our industry disclosures are that no industry or commercial funding of any kind was provided to any author within this series for composition of this video. The video demonstrates techniques from my standard practice using standard OR equipment and implants. Companies involved in the video were unaware of the production of the video and have not contributed in any way regarding oversight for the educational material presented herein. Teaching objectives, we will aim to review the literature on the anatomy of the transverse acetabular ligament in the context of total hip arthroplasty. We'll demonstrate exposure of the transverse ligament in the direct anterior approach to the hip. We'll demonstrate how to utilize the ligament to position the cup, both for antiversion and abduction. We will review our rehabilitation protocol and review our radiographic outcomes utilizing this positioning technique for total hip arthroplasty. The anatomy of the TAL has been well established and goes back to the days of Henry Gray's anatomy in 1918. More recently, it's been elucidated by Dr. Davidovich and colleagues looking at the labrum and transverse ligament. It's a continuous structure in the medial wall of the acetabulum that bridges the anterior and posterior cotyledon and bridges the cotyloid fossa of the hip. In general, the ligament's function is not well understood. It may serve as a reliable acetabular landmark, but that was not always established in the literature. One study looking at MRI arthrograms of 25 patients with labral tears demonstrated an abduction 
range from 38 to 50 degrees and acetabular antiversion ranging from 5 to 36 degrees. Images from the study in 2008 demonstrated clear visualization of both the labrum laterally and the transverse acetabular ligament medially. An image on the right shows the reamer present within the joint. Archbold and his co-authors in 2006 described 1,000 total hip arthroplasties performed by a single surgeon at that time. The TAL was used for cup placement and it was identified in 99% of the cases they studied with a dislocation rate in their series of 0.6%. They showed that if the component was too high or too deep relative to the rim, it was notable. And if the component was antiverted or retroverted relative to the acetabular ligament, we could identify this by visual identification during the procedure and that served as an accurate guidance for the position related to antiversion. Later in 2016, a different group looked at 16 total hips from nine cadavers and validated the cup position for abduction with computer navigation when using a posterior approach. With the cup flush to the TAL as shown in the left image or within five millimeters proximal to the TAL medially shown in the center image, cup positioning was reliably achieved within the target safe zone. The far right image shows the cup five millimeters too far over the TAL towards the joint surface, which meant that there was hyperabduction of the cup and the lateral rim was too vertical and contained underneath the lateral wall of the acetabulum. And this was found to exceed the target limits in their study. Moreover, we're all familiar with the safe zone concept. And while this has been very much debated in the last few years about the utility of this as a single landmark, it's certainly helpful to establish a target zone for cup positioning. Abduction angles range from 30 to 50 degrees and antiversion angles range from five to 25 degrees, setting a target zone of abduction of 40 degrees plus or minus 10 and antiversion with 15 degrees plus or minus 10. There are many alternatives for accurate cup placements, including robotic-assisted total hip arthroplasty. In a similar series, 100% of robotic-assisted cups were placed in the safe zone, and 80% of expert surgeon cups were placed in the safe zone in one series in 2014. Certainly, there are some pitfalls from robotic-assisted total hip regarding cost and learning curve. Our hypothesis in this project was that the transverse acetabular ligament could be identified in the vast majority of total hip arthroplasty procedures and will serve as a reliable landmark for anatomic navigation. Second, the use of the TAL during direct anterior approach total hip arthroplasty will accurately guide both abduction and antiversion angle positioning of the acetabular component without additional need for fluoroscopic or navigation technologies. To help demonstrate the utility of the concept of anatomic navigation, we'll present the following case. This is a 55-year-old male who presented with bilateral hip osteoarthritis and was planned for staged bilateral direct anterior approach, total hip arthroplasty. As you can see, the right hip has already been completed by me previously, and the patient is now coming in as a pre-op visit for the left total hip arthroplasty and has all the characteristic findings of osteoarthritis of the hip in preparation for surgery. During the surgical exposure, as will be demonstrated shortly in our video, the view of the left, the left acetabulum obtained during this technique is pristine to demonstrate both the anterior and posterior wall of the acetabulum, but also the labrum and the transverse acetabular ligament denoted here with the yellow arrow. As we ream, we ensure that the reamer is medialized to the ligament and the ligament is thus preserved during the preparation of the acetabulum to retain this as a landmark. Lastly, with cup placement, we can utilize the same ligament to help position both for abduction and antiversion according to the methods previously described from the literature. The postoperative result is demonstrated here with beautiful symmetry between the left and the right side. The calculation of the abduction angle was 42.1 degrees by conventional methods. And the cross table lateral view is shown here. Due to the fact that there's significant variability in pelvic tilt, we elect to use the AP pelvis view in our subsequent calculations during our the research phase of this presentation. For the video presentation, we'll show pearls to take home from this teaching presentation, including identification of the TAL during the exposure, evolution of our retractor utilization techniques to gain optimal medial acetabular exposure, 
as well as use of the reamer and trial implants to assess cup position in real-time fashion during the procedure. Here we see the patient positioned in a supine manner for left total hip arthroplasty. The direct anterior approach. The landmarks have been marked on the IO band, including the ASIS and the crest. We start our incision distal and lateral to this and make a longitudinal exposure. Once we've retracted laterally to move the tensor out of the way, we approach the vessels of the lateral circumflex by taking down the superficial veil of fascia to expose and identify these vessels. And once they're cauterized, we gain medial exposure with an additional cobra retractor. We add a third cobra retractor over the anterior pelvic wall to expose the capsule from the anterior pelvic brim down to its distal insertion, which is just proximal to the vastus intermedius. Here, we're demonstrating an anterior capsulectomy with use of an inverted T-shaped capsulotomy to begin, and then hemicapsulectomy to remove the two limbs of medial and lateral capsule. Next, we move our cobra retractors inside the joint and add a cotton lap sponge behind the femoral neck for security while creating our osteotomy. I've added a curved medial retractor blade to move the psoas off the femoral neck to protect it during the subcapital osteotomy. Here I'm using a snap to demonstrate the shoulder to help gain access to the shoulder for our landmark of making a basy cervical osteotomy cut at 45 degrees. The anterior impinging osteophyte is demonstrated, the saw cuts are marked and prepared. Generally, we begin with a subcapital cut followed by our basy cervical cut of 45 degrees, leaving a large napkin ring of bone to be removed. This allows access to the femoral head and for removal of the femoral head. Next, the hip is externally rotated and we expose the pubofemoral ligament on the medial calcar, which is carefully removed, proximal to the lesser trochanter. Next, we identify the medial capsule and take this in a parallel manner to the iliopsoas tendon so as not to damage it. We add a double-footed retractor behind the joint and continue our exposure. We place a cobra retractor medially and we place one retractor behind the posterior cotyloid and one behind the anterior cotyloid. And as a result, we're able to immediately visualize the transverse acetabular ligament. Next, we take some osteophyte and labrum from the anterior and lateral rim and continue on to remove the labrum and the posterior rim along with any residual capsule. We resect the pulvinar from the cotyloid fossa to expose it comprehensively. And in cases of a muscular patient or an obese patient, we'll add an additional medial sharp cobra retractor here to gain the exposure that you're now seeing from the surgeon's perspective. We have access to the anterior and posterior rim, access to the cotyloid fossa and the medial wall. And here we're demonstrating preservation and identification of the transverse acetabular ligament. As we transition to demonstrate this in a bony model, we begin with the lateral retractor. And our second retractor is of the posterior cotyledon. The next retractor is placed over the anterior cotyledon and the anterior brim of the pelvis. And if needed, sometimes we add this retractor here medially around the obturator foramen, deep to the TAL to protect and preserve it. A double-footed retractor can sometimes be helpful inferiorly to move the femoral shaft out of the way once the femoral neck cut is completed. Our older configuration used fewer retractors. This involved a posterior lateral retractor, an anterior brim retractor, and that was the extent of the exposure needed initially. The addition of these extra medial retractors around the posterior and anterior cotyledons allows us to get retraction and demonstrate the TAL throughout the reaming and preparation process. At every stage, we insert the reamer and move the medial side of the reamer inside the TAL to preserve it. You can see here, this is demonstrating initially two lateral as shown here, and then we move the reamer into a more neutral anatomic position medial to the TAL, which is the correct position. In doing so, the lateral acetabular rim becomes exposed and the reamer falls just below it, indicating a proper 
abduction view. In a similar manner, we can move in version anteriorly and posteriorly so that the reamer aligns itself with the transverse ligament to recreate the antiversion angle. For each reamer step, we utilize this technique to preserve the ligament and maintain our neutral anatomic position as we prepare the case. Here it's demonstrated as a 45 degree angle. We ream in situ, minimizing our motion to prepare this as accurately as possible. With the bleeding bone exposed, we use a trial component. In a similarly manner, we move the medial aspect of the trial component just medial to the TAL, which is touched here. We're seated against the medial wall of the pelvis. We've maintained the anterior, lateral, and posterior walls of the acetabulum as additional landmarks. And from a bird's eye view, a 45 degree angle is achieved. The real cup goes in in the similar manner. We move the medial cup just medial to the transverse ligament. And again, observe the bird's eye view to achieve a 45 degree cup position. We match the anterior and posterior walls and again, reassess the position of the cup relative to the transverse ligament to ensure anatomic navigation has been completed. With the cup appropriately seated, we wash and dry the interior aspect and place our polyethylene liner We can see in the lateral rim, we try to preserve perhaps one to two millimeters of lateral cup, which indicates that we have tucked the medial cup, just medial to the TAL, as demonstrated earlier in the video, to achieve positioning within the safe zone. Once the polyethylene is seated, we take one final look at all of our anatomic landmarks, including the acetabular rims, as well as the TAL, and test the cup in situ. Next, we externally rotate and do a very limited posterior lateral release of this hip in the 11 o'clock position and begin our broaching. A trochanteric broach retractor is used, a medial calcar retractor, and here a lateral retractor is added to enhance visualization of the calcar. Once this is completed, we take the hip through a full dynamic range of motion examination on the table. You will note that no traction table apparatus is utilized here. A self-retaining device is utilized throughout the case to maintain the exposure. We take the hip through a motion, including shuck and distraction, to assess the biomechanical and kinematic balance of the musculature around the hip joint. Once the final components are placed, we utilize dilute beta ion lavage and close the hip in layers with a watertight running layer on the TAL, the tensor fascia, excuse me, and then use staples and an aqua cell dressing, which is an occlusive silver antibacterial dressing. With completion of the video demonstrating this technique, we'd like to demonstrate the utility of the technique further with a pilot case series to study our case outcomes. In this series, we looked at six week post op standing AP pelvis images and exported these images from our institutional PAC system to the Polyware software program. Cupped abduction and antiversion angles were calculated in a standardized manner using the software. Inclusion criteria included the most recent 35 cases of direct anterior approach total hip with a single surgeon series. We used the TAL for anatomic guidance in all cases and the same vendor equipment and implants for all cases. We wanted a minimum six week follow-up to get a quality AP pelvis standing x-ray. Exclusion criteria for the series included three cases without follow-up without an image or where the software program would not accurately calculate a usable angle. There was one case excluded, which had a non-standard implant and 31 cases were then included for analysis. We found no complications such as dislocations, readmissions or reoperations observed in this cohort. The population was 31 primary elective total hips performed in 2019 with an average age of 65 years, 60% 60 of the population was female. The average abduction angle was averaged to 48.1 degrees with a range of 38 to 62 degrees. There were three outliers representing 9.6% of the study population. 
The antiversion angle was all within the target safe zone with an average of 12.9 degrees in a range from six to 22 degrees. Our research certainly had a small series and we will look at a larger case series matched with case outcomes for a subsequent project, as well as utilize a more dynamic software package for angular calculation to ease the method of calculation. Our post-operative protocols at Yale at this time include a DVT prophylaxis protocol that was adopted in May 2016, which is a high risk versus low risk algorithm. Post-operative protocols also included wound care standardized to include staples with aquacell dressing as an inclusive method for two weeks. Follow-up visits are at two weeks where wound check with the physician assistant and then six weeks with the physician for a standing pelvis and a cross stable lateral film. Physical therapy, we encourage patients to be out of bed within four hours of arrival to the orthopedic floor to expedite their post-op day zero mobilization. We encourage almost all patients for home discharge at this time and provide resources, including home therapy and transition to outpatient therapy when possible. At the six week mark, we transition to home exercise regimen and we've grown in our use of the Vera Home Telerehabilitation Therapy Program. We published our anterior hip replacement protocol and we've moved away from precautions in general after hip replacement surgery, but certainly after anterior hip surgery we encourage patients to do certain things after the surgery, such as weight bear is tolerated, walk normally, including a step through gait. We allow patients to bend their hip in order to dress themselves and complete activities of daily living. And we allow sitting on a seat, whether elevated or not, and getting in and out of cars as normally as possible. We do suggest movements to avoid include extensive extension of the surgical legs, such as lunging forcefully. We don't want patients hyperextending their hip and we encourage them to avoid the plant and pivot so they're not twisting on a hip with the foot planted on the ground. We limit straight leg raise and hip hike exercises for the first six weeks to minimize psoas tendinopathy. Patients are allowed to sleep in any comfortable position, including on their side, and may use a regular bed pillow between the knees for comfort as needed. We've included showering instructions, driving instructions, and activity instructions for sexual intercourse, as a reference for standard activities for our patients. Pearls and pitfalls using this technique regarding the transverse acetabular ligament include identification of the transverse ligament during direct anterior approach total hip exposure. This takes practice and additional retractors, but it helps gain valuable medial exposure. Second, we've evolved our retractor utilization techniques with some extra retractors to help gain optimal medial exposure, which has helped our direct view and further emphasizes the role of the direct anterior approach and comprehensive visualization of the acetabulum. Third, we use the reamer and trial tools to assess cup position in real time during the procedure, as well as preserve the TAL for reference. And as I always tell my residents during the surgery, we like to achieve exposure before proceeding with instrumentation. Pitfalls of this technique included the inherent risk of neurovascular structures, which is inherent with deep retractor placement around the acetabulum during direct anterior approach total hip arthroplasty. Second, there's risk to iatrogenic damage to the transverse ligament during exposure or cup preparation, which can limit the utility of the landmark if it is destroyed. Third, the TAL can occasionally be difficult to identify, and we found that this is particularly true in cases of hypertrophic osteoarthritis, where redundant osteophyte grows around the medial acetabulum and becomes harder to identify this ligament. In conclusion, anatomic navigation for acetabular component positioning in the direct anterior approach total arthroplasty technique is an accurate method. Pilot series data presented here in this video shows an average abduction position of 48.1 degrees and an average antiversion angle of 12.9 degrees. The technique is easily reproducible, it is cost effective, and is accurate. It can be reproduced during any hip replacement procedure to aid with cup positioning. Our references from this video are presented here. We thank you for your attention and encourage you to reach out to us to connect. We wish you well. Thank you very much.
Greetings, this is Dr. Lee Rubin presenting on behalf of our group from here at Yale Orthopedics on the direct anterior approach for hip hemiarthroplasty. Our AOS disclosures are displayed here. No industry or commercial funding of any kind was provided to any author related to the composition of this video. Our teaching objectives today will be to review the literature of hemiarthroplasty and surgical approach. We'll discuss pearls and pitfalls of the anterior approach hemiarthroplasty technique. We'll cite a case example and present that in video form and review a series that we're reviewing from our clinical outcomes here at Yale Orthopedics. The direct anterior approach for hip hemiarthroplasty has deep roots here at Yale. And there certainly has been an explosion of the anterior hip literature in the last five years. At this time, there's more and more courses and resources, and certainly has become an accepted standard at many teaching programs. With more surgeons and more authors performing the technique, there's more data, better decision-making, and hopefully, ultimately, we achieve better patient outcomes. The AOS did release a clinical practice guideline related to management hip fractures in the elderly in 2014, and many of these talking points were related to hip hemiarthroplasty for fracture. So for displaced femoral neck fractures, there was strong evidence to support arthroplasty for patients with unstable femoral neck fractures with a strong recommendation. With regards to unipolar versus bipolar, there's moderate evidence to support outcomes of unipolar and bipolar being similar. For hemi versus total hip arthroplasty, there's moderate evidence supporting a benefit to total hip arthroplasty in properly selected patients with unstable femoral neck fractures. And cemented femoral stems were supported by moderate evidence at that time. Interestingly, there was a note on the surgical approach that moderate evidence supported a higher dislocation rate with a posterior approach in the treatment of displaced femoral neck fractures with hip arthroplasty. And our conclusion ultimately will be that further research and publication are needed on outcomes of the direct anterior approach for this subgroup. And hopefully that will influence the guideline and decision making for surgeons worldwide. With regards to the mortality risk in the approach, an anterior operative approach consistently has been associated with a lower rate of mortality at two months than was a posterior approach. And that was a review in 2000, excuse me, 1994, meta-analysis, 106 reports. The dislocation risk for a total hip is up to 18% and certainly is higher with a posterior approach with dislocation rates for hemi approximately 5%. With regards to the anterior approach outcomes, a number of recent studies have shown that the dislocation rate is higher with the posterior hip, and only 1.45% in the two studies presented here when we add the two patient groups with one out of 69 patients, which is very favorable for this population. For 109 hemis with 54 by the posterior approach and 55 by the anterior approach, the dislocation rate was 7.4% with the posterior lateral approach and 1.8% with the anterior approach in a second study published in 2016. Does surgeon fellowship training influence outcomes? The answer is most likely yes. And surgeons at arthroplasty fellowship training had significantly shorter operative duration and utilized the anterior approach more frequently. And the general orthopedics Orthopedists had a significantly increased total surgical complication risk. Interestingly, the Journal of Arthroplasty had this study on surgical approaches and hemiarthroplasty outcomes, a meta-analysis published in 2018, which concluded that there were no evident advantage of the posterior approach and its routine use for fracture-related hemiarthroplasty should be questioned. So with that in mind, we'd like to present the surgical techniques, including pearls and pitfalls. For an anterior approach hemiarthroplasty, the surgeon must have sufficient anterior primary hip experience and know how to release the, the proximal femur expertly. The surgeon really should be prepared for extensile approach for the proximal femur and the diaphysis if needed, if there's any extension of fracture lines distally, especially related to placement of cerclage wires above or below the lesser trochanter, and certainly should know how to use proper femoral stem cementation technique and utilize that through the anterior approach because a cemented stem is always something that we should consider for these patients. We must establish the correct diagnosis and ensure that it's a displaced femoral neck fracture. 
Uh, X-rays and traction views can be helpful. CT or MRI sometimes can be helpful, but certainly we also must consider these are fragility fractures and the real diagnosis is osteoporosis. They're at high risk for a second fall and they're at high risk for stem loosening, so cemented stems should always be considered. The technique involves a number of steps. First, we expose the hip capsule. I utilize an inverted T capsulotomy to elevate the limbs of the capsule. I tag these and repair them at the end to help improve stability. We expose the intertrochanteric line distally just above the vastus intermedius, and we release the medial and lateral capsule to facilitate exposure of the proximal femur. I try to preserve the acetabular labrum, so I release my capsule from distal to proximal. This helps preserve the suction seal of the hemiarthroplasty in the socket. Here is a model showing cobra replace, uh, retractors placed inside the joint after the capsular flaps have been elevated. And then we make a clean basal cervical osteotomy in the usual location so that we can remove the fractured neck as well as the head and measure the head accordingly. I do inspect the calcar for prophylactic cerclage wire if we need one uh, to ensure there's no fracture lines progressing past our osteotomy. At this time, if you do find them, it's wise to place a cerclage wire. Here's a video demonstrating removal of the femoral neck and head in a model. And then we perform the 270 degree release to help facilitate exposure. We leave the posterior capsule attached, but perform a release looking at the neck such that we encompass the lateral shoulder, the anterior hip, and the medial calcar to release in yellow the areas of the capsule to help facilitate exposure of the femur. And I use an identical exposure for head and liner exchanges. The starting point for canal access is not directly in the center, but more of a posterior and lateral starting point to get into the anterior bow of the femur when we begin with our brooches. We trial the femoral ball immediately after sizing and exposure to create suction seal in the acetabulum and again, preserving the labrum to help re reduce the dislocation risk. We then extend, externally rotate, adduct the femur to help facilitate femoral exposure. And these maneuvers are demonstrated here. Beware of the red dragon behind the hip joint. The medial femoral circumflex artery has a branch just behind the posterior capsule that can bleed profusely if you're not careful. Please do not use scissors behind the capsule to do your release. Have your Excalibur or your Bovi electric artery ready uh, to capture this vessel if needed. A representation of that vessel is shown here. We instrument the femur and we identify the canal using a rasp and then brooches. We do note that there's increased risk for perforation in osteoporotic bone, so please be careful, especially with longer or cemented brooches. If you are cementing, it's helpful to undersize the brooch by one size to avoid niatrogenic fracture. And a little wiggle is okay, so as long as you don't break the femur. And we, of course, will cement to make up that gap with the final implant. We cement the femur placing a canal restrictor and a flexible inserter can be very helpful for the anterior approach. I use a cement gun with two packages of cement, typically with one gram of gentamicin per 40 gram bag times two. And we try to maintain neutral to slight 10 degree antiversion of the stem during cementation. Once the cement is hardened and all excess cement is removed, we trial the head and neck and perform a final reduction of our construct. A case example is demonstrated here. 85-year-old male had a history of a PE and IVC filter, had a ground level fall after tripping on a rug, ambulates with a rolling walker and takes care of himself independently at home, indicated for a right hip hemiarthroplasty. Here's the x-ray showing the AP and lateral views. So in this case, a cemented stem with general anesthesia were utilized. Preoperative antibiotic were appropriately given. A 51 millimeter bipolar head was selected and cement with two grams gentamicin was utilized. Here's the six week post op radiograph. Patient did very well. At one year, the x rays are unchanged. And this is a standing x ray showing adequate restoration of leg lengths. Incision healed well and he had minimal pain, ambulated with Walker right back to his home baseline. Lateral view at one year. Post-operative regimen includes an occlusive antibacterial dressing such as Aquacel or Mepilex. We get the patients out of bed and ambulatory immediately with the weight bearing is tolerated. We have no range of motion restrictions, no use of any abductor pillow or braces. We do use Lovenox times five weeks, but certainly could consider low-risk anticoagulation if the patient is totally ambulatory. 
Fall prevention is essential if these patients are higher risk for a second fall. And we do evaluate their nutritional uh, supplementation needs with a vitamin D check uh, with lab studies. We consider calcium or protein studies as needed. And now we'll demonstrate the video technique demonstrating anterior hip hemiarthroplasty via the direct anterior approach. In this case, the patient is supine. We're performing a right hip hemiarthroplasty. Here we're demonstrating the landmarks of the ASIS iliac crest. The head is to the left, the foot is to the right. We're demonstrating the true direct anterior interval with the dotted line, and we've gone distal and lateral to create the proximal incision. We feel the tip of the greater trochanter and mark this horizontally, which demonstrates the CR or the center of rotation of the hip. And then we make our incision from there, centering on the rotation of the hip through skin and identifying the tensor fascia. Here we're identifying the interval and working over the lateral portion of the capsule with our first retractor, which is a curved cobra retractor. Here we're using a self-retaining system that helps facilitate retention of these retractors. Next, we've cauterized the vessels and we're feeling the gap medially between the capsule and the rectus. And then we elevate the rectus with the curved hook blade. Next, we're identifying the reflected tendon of the indirect head of the rectus here demonstrated, as well as the exposure of the capsule distally. We'll transect the reflected head of the rectus here, and that will allow further translation of the rectus muscle belly towards the medial side. Here, we're elevating the reflected and true head of the rectus to further expose the capsule anteriorly and medially. And then we'll identify the pelvic brim and place our final retractor over the pelvic brim to identify our proximal exposure. We further retract the rectus with this curved retractor blade medially and use the Richardson blade laterally. Cobra is placed in the lateral of medial capsule. We've identified the capsular margin distally, just proximal to the vastus and create our inverted T capsulotomy, working from proximal to distal and elevating the limbs of the capsule here, we'll place a tag stitch on the lateral limb. In a similar fashion, we'll place a tag stitch on the medial limb of the capsule and then elevate those away. Once this is completed, we'll secure the stitches and move our retractors into the capsular margins. So here we're just inside the capsule over the labrum of the lateral joint. And here we're going over the medial femoral neck. I use that curved blade to further elevate the anterior capsule and rectus. So now we're seeing the surgeon's eye view. The head is at the top of the screen, the foot is distal, and we're making our basic cervical osteotomy. Once that's complete, we remove the, the broken neck as well as the head and use a caliper to measure this. We'll again get our retractor over the lateral labrum and achieve full rotation. We're going back from the lateral view here to see the transverse acetabular ligament, the cotyloid fossa, and we're trialing the various bipolar head constructs. Once we've selected our size, we're going to expose the femur. So acetabular retractors are removed, and here we're using a trochanteric elevator over the greater trochanter in the posterolateral hip to achieve initial position on the trochanter and beginner elevation. We then utilize a bone hook inside the femoral canal to create a superior and lateral force to move the femur towards us away from the acetabulum. And here's an overlay showing the six o'clock and 12 o'clock positions with the greater and lesser trochanter identified. The inner trochanteric line is demonstrated here, which anteriorly is the origin of the vastus intermedius. Here's the top-down view, again, with the head proximally. The trochanteric elevator is approximately 1230 in position with the 12 o'clock blue dot being shown here. Our troch elevator is just in front of the piriformis tendon, and we're identifying the one o'clock capsule release. We're going to use a rasp to enter the canal from proximal to distal and from posterior to anterior, then a series of brooches to perform our initial canal instrumentation. We keep our version neutral based in the native calcar position and achieve appropriate lateralization to achieve neutral valgus position. Throughout this process, we maintain a view of the calcar and here we're marking a neutral version position for our ultimate stem placement.
We're doing a trial reduction by elevating the limbs of the capsule with our sutures. And we can see the hemiarthroplasty ball goes in with a slow maneuver to reduce it. And this is the surgeon's eye view now of the hip taken through a dynamic range of motion. Here's the reduction. I'm going to check the leg lengths with the hip in neutral. We don't want to have adduction or abduction of the hip. We want to achieve neutral position to ensure the legs are correctly positioned. And then with the leg draped free as shown here, we can perform a full dynamic range of motion. We we're not satisfied with the position of the stem brooch in terms of ultimate fixation. So we selected a stem that has cemented component. And here we're preparing our canal restrictor, two centimeters distal to the tip and centralizer of the stem. We tap that in. I usually do a dry fit of the hemiarthroplasty stem to ensure that the stem will sit properly. I remove this afterwards and dry it off. We ensure that we are paying very close attention to the version of that stem, and we have the leg position such that we can maintain that version. We dry the canal accordingly after further irrigation, and then we use a typical retrograde cementation technique, cementing from distal to proximal, evacuating any excess blood, and making sure that we have no cement in the acetabulum with a towel placed that will remove after the initial stem is placed into the canal. Initial pressurization can occur manually, but certainly we use the pressurization setting on the cement gun at this point. Once that's complete, we place our stem with the femur appropriately positioned so that we can insert this and achieve a neutral position. We use a stem inserter just to drive the stem and maintain valgus by maintaining a lateralized force. We remove all excess cement. And you can see that we remove the sponge that was placed in the acetabulum to ensure no excess cement was retained in the acetabulum. Here we're paying meticulous attention to the stem position, which should be neutral to 10 degrees of antiversion, avoiding any chance for retroversion during this approach. And we are patient to allow the cement to fully dry without moving the stem and maintaining axial load with the pressure on the manual impactor. We take our head pusher, elevate the limbs of the capsule again, bring the hip and leg back to neutral and apply a force that is pushing the hip hemi head back into the joint. A slow, gradual force is all that's needed. And here we can see we've achieved neutral leg length position, appropriate biomechanical stability of the hip. And we take it again through a full range of motion on the surgeon's eye view to ensure that throughout the range, it's appropriately situated and stable. Our final construct is then impacted onto the stem and a final reduction is performed. Once that is performed, we ensure that we have both limbs of capsule out of the joint and we tie these together using the retention sutures. And then we add additional horizontal vicral stitches times three. We irrigate with dilute betaine lavage, which is allowed to soak for three minutes and then irrigate with further saline. We repair the tensor fascia with interrupted zero vicral sutures to reduce the tension. Then we use a running locking repair stitch from proximal to distal for watertight closure and close the soft tissues appropriately. Case two is a left total hip. This is again showing us the view of the hip with the head proximal and the foot distal in this image. This is showing us the exposure of the femur. And in this case, we're gonna identify the six and 12 o'clock position shown here. And then we'll perform a release in the 11 o'clock position for the left hip with gradual traction applied both with the hook and the trochanteric elevator. As we do that, that one centimeter release allows us enough exposure for this maneuver to elevate the hip into the field. We again, verify the neutral point at six and 12 o'clock. We verify the protection of the external rotators as seen on the left side of this image and our appropriate view has been achieved to allow us to facilitate broaching and instrumentation. Throughout the procedure, the surgeon must retain view of the calcar and proximal femoral neck. And this is showing you the anatomy surrounding this area, as well as the medial femoral artery posteriorly and the piriformis posterior laterally. All of these structures are retained during the exposure through the anterior approach. This schematic diagram by Dr. Molho is demonstrating a view of the right hip and left hip of our patient demonstrated here in the video. On the right hip, we perform release as demonstrated by the red lines, which ends proximally at the level of the bone, uh, just distal to the piriformis. We don't need to continue beyond approximately one to 1 1.5 centimeters of length. 
In a similar fashion, the left hip has a release done in the exact same manner at the 11 o'clock position. And again, it ends at the edge of the posterior femoral bone, just distal to the piriformis tendon. Our data is demonstrated in the following slides. We performed a retrospective review with an IRB approval here at Yale in 2020. Our goal was to compare outcomes of various approaches in patients having thermal neck fractures treated with hemiarthroplasty. Our patient population was 249 cases in 248 patients. Hemiarthroplasty cases were only included for acute femoral neck fracture, and we excluded hemis for malunion, nonunion, AVN, hardware removal, and metastatic disease. Surgeons had a variety of fellowship training backgrounds, including trauma, adult reconstruction, oncology, spine, and sports medicine, covering our hip fracture service. We looked at these charts over a 42-month period. All post-operative radiographs were reviewed for possible dislocations. Complications were determined through chart review of our electronic medical record, and blood loss was calculated through a, a calculation demonstrated in the reference section. We divided the groups into three groups based on approach. Anterior approach group had 40 patients, anterolateral had 47, and the posterolateral group had 162 patients. Overall, there was no difference in the body mass index, the ASA classification, gender, or age of the patients. The operative time was somewhat similar for anterior and posterolateral. Anterolateral cases seemed to have a longer operative time, which was statistically significant. Length of stay on average was significantly shorter for the anterior hip patients at 4.26 days in the hospital compared to eight days for anterolateral and 5.8 days for posterior hips. The calculated blood loss was lower for the anterior approach at 974 milliliters, but this was not statistically significant compared to the other two approaches. The complication profiles here are stratified by approach. Intraoperative fracture rate was highest with the anterolateral approach. 90-day readmission rate was, in fact, lower for the anterior approach, but not statistically significant. And wound complications were no different through any of the approaches. Instability episodes were essentially not significant from any of the approaches. But more dislocations numerically were seen in the posterior approach. Overall, the anterior hip patients undergoing hemiarthroplasty, our institution, have a lower length of stay, fewer dislocations observed, which was not significant. But importantly, there was no increased rate of femur fracture or wound complications, which are things that have been attributed to the anterior approach over time. These were not found in our series. So in, in the end, as we make our conclusions, minimally invasive surgery does matter. When there's less muscular disruption, there's an improved opportunity for early recovery. We have no post-operative precautions for patients having anterior hip hemiarthroplasty and no range of motion restrictions. The evidence is very clear in this regard, and it shows that there's a reduced dislocation risk with the direct anterior approach, as well as a reduced 60-day mortality risk with the direct anterior approach. Our study lends to this further by showing a lower length of stay and may have further implications as we review this data further. Our references for this presentation are shown here. We thank you for your time in reviewing this video. We hope that's helpful to you and your practice, and ultimately we lend to the improvement of care for patients in this vulnerable hip fracture population. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, that was in, indeed enlightening. So uh, if you can stay on for another 10 minutes, we can take the questions after the next talk. Uh, of course, of course. Direct anterior approach recipes for success, Dr. Heiko. Good morning and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I just uh, think I will summarize some of the points I heard in the previous talks. Um, so the recipes uh, for success, uh, to be a um, successful DAA surgeon. And I think that is the most important um, slide. There is not a single recipe. I think it's a um, puzzle of, of different uh, pieces that we have to bring together um, to be finally successful uh, in DAA. And um, I think uh, most in our generation has to move from one um, approach to DAA, so it is definitely a, a point um, of transition and um, it is not so easy as uh, you have experience and also success with your previous approach. But um, I, I made that uh, transition two years back 
And I can tell you, it, it is really a big difference compared to my uh, previous anterolateral approach. And so I remember all the different um, points I had to um, think about uh, when it comes to the transition from one approach to the next. So here is the list. Patient selection definitely is important. So um, there are easy hips and there are difficult hips, and I will give you some tips and, and tricks on, on that, how to start. Implant selections, there are uh, implants that makes your life a, a lot easier in DAA uh, compared to others. So um, if possible, uh, it is also worth to think about that. Uh, OR setup. Um, uh, you have heard about um, DA with or without the table, so there are specific things um, to consider. And then the surgical technique definitely is important, but uh, therefore you, you made a, a great step yesterday uh, with the workshop and, and all this uh, practical training. I think that is very, very helpful and uh, also important. And then um, it will change also, I think, a bit, uh, the pain management and the post-op rehabilitation because uh, the uh, patients are so early to mobilize um, that, that you really can change your protocol there. So to start with, um, pre-op, I think, um, patient selection. The easy hip to start with are the, the dysplastic uh, patients of course, not uh, the uh, luxations without any acetabulum, but uh, the slightly dysplastic patients that have a, a good offset uh, and a long distance between your um, between your femoral neck cut and uh, the acetabulum. So you, in the beginning, you need a bit of distance there uh, to place your retractors uh, easily and have a good visualization. Good bone quality is important. Um, so if you um, think of uh, the complications of DA, and you heard it also in the talk before, um, so fracture is a topic, especially on the femoral side. So uh, starting with uh, very uh, old and osteoporotic patients is, is not, uh, I think, the best way to start. Um, if, if there is an ankylosis, for example, of course, not, not a very good case to start with. And in the beginning, I would not pick the fattest patients, but to be honest with that approach, it is even a bit easier um, to treat the heavy patients compared um, to other approaches. And overall, female patients are a bit more lax than, than male patients and mobilization of your femur is um, uh, I think the most difficult part and um, therefore the, the young uh, male patients with a uh, lot of muscles, they are a lot harder to mobilize. So if it's possible, take that list and uh, you definitely will find um, some very good patients to start with. Hips not to start with um, are these um, protrusion cases the ankylosis, post-traumatic cases uh, with um, yeah, anatomic uh, situations that are uh, difficult to treat. And as I mentioned, also the patients with um, osteoporosis. Technically demanding is uh, the huge belly. You can uh, tape that a bit out of the way but still it is technically demanding. So that, that can be a limitation for, for the approach. My failures so far are, are two fractures um, uh, on the greater trochanter. So um, the older female patient with more osteoporotic bone. So um, this is what I learned. So um, over the time, my mobilization with those patients uh, also had changed, but in the beginning, I think um, those are not the best to, to select. Next important point is implant selection. And um, on the cup side, there, there is uh, nothing to select, but uh, when it comes to the stem, um, you have different options. And um, you, you see with, with that uh, 
uh, type of uh, stem, you can follow the, the femur anatomy a little easier than with a very straight stem where you have to come from far posterior. So that is um, definitely something that makes your life uh, a lot easier. And if the stem is shorter, then uh, also it is a lot easier. So those are my stem options. The shorter ones on the left side, uh, the actus and trilog are very similar. Um, the one is colored and the other one is not. Um, so, and but still the workhorse is the Korai stem. Um, so I don't change the indications for using stems uh, just because I have a, a different approach now. Um, but um, I think there are also some, some male patients with good bone if they are 65. And um, so that is now my, my cutting edge in the male patient. It, it has been 60. Um, so, but uh, if they have good bone quality, it has um, raised to 65. And um, especially also in the male patients with good muscles, I think that uh, the, the shorter stems gives you a, a lot more um, flexibility during surgery. The Korai is still for the old age, 65. And <clears throat> when, it, when they are older than 75, then as the cemented version. Now we are in the OR and uh, here also there are recipes for success. So you have two options to do the surgery. Here you see the one with the table, but uh, yesterday and also today uh, you have seen it is also possible with a standard table. You just need a mobile leg where you can hyperextend it. So um, any setup that allows you hyperextension, external rotation and adduction of the leg uh, in a standardized way, I think is, uh, is okay to use. <clears throat> From the technical side, and that is very nice uh, with that supine position, you can use the fluoroscope and, and we regularly use it for um, checking um, that cup and stem is uh, well positioned. And we additionally have uh, the CAS system there to um, control the uh, inclination and aversion of the cup. So for that side, we don't really need the fluoroscope. And on the stem side, uh, we uh, control leg lengths and offset. But we, um, with the fluoroscope, we can control the various values position of, of the stem. So I think fluoroscope, definitely something that you should have in the OR to control um, at uh, what, what you have done at the different steps. When it comes to the surgical technique, you heard uh, already um, some tips um, during the videos um, previously. So th there is a chance to, to um, damage the nerve. So stay a bit on the lateral side, but it's quite uh, easy to, to visualize. So um, the... Um, the fascia lata is, is, is the red structure. And uh, if you come more to the medial side, it gets white. So that, don't, don't go there, stay more to the lateral side. And then um, normally there is no problem with the nerve. Um, preparation side, then next is then um, the mobilization of the muscles that is uh, important. And you have seen also nicely in the video before uh, that uh, you can visualize the capsule uh, completely and you should do that. Uh, you need a, a good um, overview um, to be safe with your um, capsular incisions and also later on then for your osteotomy. So take your time there. That is, I think, um, an important part of the surgery. And then you can, as you have seen, um, preserve the capsule and later on suture it and uh, Maybe in the trauma cases also it is um, quite helpful. Uh, I resect the, the capsule in my um, uh, arthritic patients and haven't had any issues with instability um, with, with that approach. After the preparation um, of the capsule, then you do the osteotomy. And um, here, here for it is very important to place the retractors 
in the correct uh, position to have a good overview. And uh, then the head extraction once in a while is quite difficult. Um, so if um, there is a lot of uh, capsule left, for example, um, or the ligament is there, um, then you need a bit of patience and mobilization. So here you see the position of the retractors for the capsule. So the one that is a, a, a no, that's a, it's a left left hip. Here is a superior. Here is medial lateral, and that's uh, uh, in the foot direction distal. So you prepare your capsule, and then you make your T uh, incision, and um, then you resect it or you retract it. And here. Again, you see the osteotomy. You can palpate um, the angle here, and that's a very good orientation. Um, uh, you should also respect, so don't cut further distal, but also don't cut uh, further proximal. Uh, otherwise, uh, you make your life a lot harder. And you see your, your cup, and th that is really um, uh, a very good view on, on the cup with the DAA. So you can position again your retractors. That one superiorly is still the same. And then you have um, one here at, at the caudal part um, where the ligament is and here um, on the uh, posterior aspect of the acetabulum. You remove the labrum and the osteophytes and then you ream according to your planning. Cup positioning is not different than in, in other approaches. Uh, but um, I think it is a, a lot easier, especially for the inclination to achieve. For the antiversion, you have the, um, the, um, the uh, entire weight from the, from the leg underneath uh, your um, posterior retractor. So that one is pushing you up. So therefore, curved um, um, reamers and uh, also impactors uh, are an option. Otherwise, if you have straight ones, then you really have to push downwards um, to the floor to maintain the correct antiversion. And um, then I think you should control it either by fluoroscopy or with a cast like we do. And then stem preparation, very important sequential positioning of the leg meticulous uh, removal of the capsule, posterior medial, and then also in the superior part. And uh, that hook here, you have seen it also before. I think every, everyone uh, that is doing DAA has a hook like that. With that one, you mobilize also uh, the entire femur to the distal and lateral part. Uh, that helps you also to uh, remove all the capsule uh, around here. And then you finally position your leg. That again is stepwise, not one maneuver and everything is under a lot of tension. And uh, after that, you can prepare the stem quite easily. Um, in the beginning, you always have a tendency um, to re not completely at that poster aspect. So uh, it, it will go a bit into a barrier. So therefore also, I think it is important to have your fluoroscope there. Uh, and then you can correct that. Avoid the malrotation, that's another um, aspect. So there is always a tendency that your handle moves more in, into an external rotation. So you have to, to work against that and uh, also push your hand a bit to the medial direction. And then again, control the position um, before you bring in the final one. And repositioning is, is very easy, you have seen that. Uh, important there, uh, stability testing in all the different positions. And that is definitely a limitation uh, of the uh, table. We can just test until 70, maybe 80 degrees of flexion, not, not further. Um, but so far, I haven't had a, a single um, luxation with DAA. Uh, but um, I think without the table, that part is, uh, is better. Impingement testing also very important, leg lengths um, with the fluoroscope clinically and uh, with the help of uh, 
more modern tools uh, is also, um, I think, very important. Here you see what, what we have the information on the leg length side and on the offset side here. Um, so we are sure that we have not changed it um, dramatically. So RS is very important. End of the uh, surgery, um, it's um, pain management. So we do the local infiltration uh, anesthesia um, on the lateral side and then turn extremic acid in, in the joint and uh, in some patients also IV. Post-op uh, mobilization starts same day and, and it's really possible uh, even with older patients. You um, start with the exercises uh, for muscle strengthening also a lot earlier. And there are no limitations now for range of motion. Um, no catheters. Um, spinal anesthesia is, um, is uh, preferred. And um, as I said, three to six hours after surgery, you can start full weight bearing is allowed and uh, no limitations. So take home message, um, DA is, uh, is really a successful um, approach and uh, your patients will love it. Um, but you have to think about different aspects when you move to that uh, approach. Patient selection, implant selection, surgical technique, the OR setup and pain management, as well as the post op rehabilitation is important. Pick the right patients for the start and then increase your indication for DAA step by step. Preserve the protrusion, severe osteoporosis and cemented hips um, for the later cases. Implant selection can make the surgical approach a bit easier. However, you have to respect the limitations of each stem. The surgical technique needs training and therefore I think you had have had uh, a great opportunity yesterday and um, the uh, learning curve is not really long uh, but 20 to 30 cases um, I think um, is a realistic number. Uh, local infiltration anesthesia and tranexamic acid can reduce pain and bleeding and help you to early mobilize your patients. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Dr. Gretchen for a very uh, uh, lucid talk. Uh, Dr. Lee, you there? Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, we are running short of time, but I have a quick question for you. Uh, you know, people often ask, what is the best case to start direct interior? And I've been telling them that the fracture neck feet is indeed a good, uh, good reason. I've got two questions for you. One, that often these patients have comorbidities and osteoporosis. Does that worry you? And second, if do you really have to repair the capsule if you're doing hemiarthroplasty for fracture neck femur? Yeah, these are very important questions to consider. And in the US, we've always thought of what Neil mentioned. You have the patient with the long valgus neck for the primary hip. You have a lot of room to work in that patient. If you're a thin female, especially, you have more flexibility. That's a good case to start. But with the fractured neck of femur, uh, this is how uh, colleagues of ours in Costa Rica got started with their anterior hip practice. They used the neck of femur fractures because they were not contracted hips. They were chronically neglected arthritis cases. These hips were very supple. Um, and I think if you're going to choose those, if you have many of those displaced neck fractures, you can choose ones that have better bone density. I think that would be safer. But in all of these cases, you should be prepared to cement and you should practice the exposure so that you can ensure that you can cement the stem uh, for the neck of femur cases. In terms of capsule management, uh, for primary hip, there was just a randomized trial released by Christoph Corten in Belgium, and he showed for primary hip that there was no difference in capsule retention versus capsulectomy in primary hip. I, I do, however, so I don't usually save it for primary hip. However, for hemiarthroplasty, as I showed in my video, I, I choose to save the capsule in those cases because the risk is higher at baseline for dislocation in the hemiarthroplasty, regardless of your approach. And I think that we're already putting a large ball in and they still have a very high dislocation rate. So anything you can do, preserving the labrum is one step, preserving the capsule is a second step. And for me, putting it anteriorly to, to preserve the muscles. Um, those are my three steps to, to help reduce the instability risk with the hemiarthroplasty. Thank you. Uh, uh, final question uh, of this session to both of you. Uh, and Neil, if he's there, 
uh, what are your thoughts on uh, simultaneous bilateral using direct anterior approach great option so i do it and um as, as they are um, so much easier to mobilize um, also it, it increases the the numbers of patients that are uh, willing to have uh, a bilateral in, in one setting so i have seen an increase um, of bilateral hips in my practice over the last uh, one and a half years yes i do use it but i use it sparingly the patients have to be younger healthier have no cardiac condition at all um, very good coping skills. Um, I, I think they have to be the right patient. There's a heavy uh, dose of patient selection. You have to be very careful. But when they do, I have done it, and they do beautifully. I mean, it can be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Neil, Neil uh, is Neil around? or Okay. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. It has really been a pleasure. And I can't thank the... Um, the faculty enough, particularly American faculty for staying up uh, so late. And uh, I really appreciate that. I'm going to say that to our chief guest during the inauguration, how well you have really uh, contributed to the conference. Thank you so much. And you have a nice evening ahead. Uh, the next so edition is the best clinical case presentation competition. And I would like to invite the judges, Professor P.P. Kotwal, Professor Samir Agarwal, and Dr. Tahir Ansari. Uh, Dr. Abe is also in, uh, joining the jury for the uh, this best clinical case presentation. So we'll be starting with the best clinical case presentation now. The rules for the participants uh, are as follows. Uh, you will get three minutes of time for your case presentation. And the next two minutes will be for moderator questions. Uh, all the audience questions will be taken in the end. At two and a half minutes, you'll, uh, we'll give you the first buzzer for the last 30 minutes at 30 minutes at three minutes there will be a continuous buzzer so uh, please try to keep your uh, presentation within those three minutes as we are already running a little late uh, i would like to invite the first presenter uh, dr amit Srivastav, to the stage for his presentation below Second, second, second. Take a So, uh, good morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Good morning, all the delegates and the respected faculties. Here I am going to present a case on a, there's a 60 years old lady. She presented to us with bilateral knee pain. She had a past history of proximal tibia fracture for which plating was done around 20 years back. She is a known case of seropositive rheumatoid arthritis with osteoporosis. And this is her clinical feature. We are focusing mainly on the left knee joint. There is mark varus on the left knee with the fixed flexion deformity. There is a surgical scar mark over the anterolateral aspect of the knee and the proximal tibia, which is healed by primary intention. And there are no telltale sign of infection. The surgical site was quiescent before surgery. So this was the pre-operative radiograph. Uh, left knee, we are focusing here. It's in, it's in varus. There's an implant in C2. And there is a deformity. So the challenges here are, this is a thin built patient with minimal subcutaneous fat, already a surgical scar mark and poor bone quality with the previous implant. So what to do in this case? There are certain options like surgery can be done in two stages. First, remove the implant, wait for some time, four to six weeks. When it heals, then go for a second uh, definitive surgery. Or in, can we go for a single stage implant removal and a long tibial insert because the plate is there? 
or is there any other option so this is what we did the proximal two screws were removed percutaneously the plate uh, remained there and we did a primary knee replacement the patient uh, the knee was stable post operatively and patient had a good knee range of motion this is a recent 3 month follow up of the patient uh sorry for the change in the orientation here and this is a patient standing with a stable knee painless after 3 months post surgery so what are the take home message here uh we can select uh, certain cases in which two stay surgeries can be avoided but all the armamentarium should be available in our ot whenever we are taking such cases intraoperative c arm should be available and extensive dissection for removal of plate and simultaneous tkr with single approach if possible can be avoided in such cases thank you so there was a presence of plate whether it has affected your tibial cut uh, no sir it did not affect my tibial cut actually there was a, a proximal in proximal tibia there was uh, i could see there was more than uh, 10 mm of bone was left on the lateral side so that is why it, uh, it did not affect my resection as it uh, does having a plate versus having an intramedullary stem change your management post op rehab protocol for your patient uh, sir i could not get does having a plate vis a vis having a stem uh, change your uh, post op rehabilitation for your patient no sir it did not did you do the work to rule out any uh, indolent infection yes sir all pre operative uh, tests were done they uh, also uh, uh, c reactive protein esr and complete blood count was run it came out to be normal that is why we proceeded with this patient thank you thank you uh next i would like to hand up to arubha sarkar to the podium uh a uh, very good morning good morning to all the respected uh, panel and all the audience present here i'll be presenting a case of a total hip arthroplasty with subtrochanteric femoral shortening osteotomy for post infective hip disc hip dysplasia so we had a 54 years old male patient with a history of septic arthritis in infancy and the patient uh, presented with us with a history of recent onset pain in the right hip and the back region but the patient had been had a history of limp since childhood and the hip limp was painless on uh, examination we found it to be having a assisted antalgic gait with tenderness of the right hip anterior point with gross restriction of movement of the right hip with a true shortening of 4 inches and a positive trendelenburg sign uh in the imaging uh we found that uh, in the right hip there was absence of femoral head and neck and a flattened severely underdeveloped high rising acetabulum with a superior migration of the greater trochanter and uh, uh, since we are talking about a post uh, infective sequelae we confirmed the findings to be comparable with a uh, post infective choi type 4 classification uh so what we did was that uh, we approached the hip of the patient using a modified hardinge approach with the patient operated in a lateral position uh transverse subtrochanteric shortening femoral osteotomy was performed the trochanteric was brought down by about 2 inches a distal fitting solution stem was used after preparing the femoral canal and uh, the proximal femoral portion was uh, fixed to the stem with a wire cartilage cables For acetabular reconstruction, we located the transverse acetabular ligament, and the true acetabulum was reconstructed by sequential rimming up to a depth of 43, and a cemented cup of size 40 was used. 
we wanted to use an cemented cup with screws uh, but uh, there was only a cemented cup available at that size you know armament to him unfortunately there's a bone defect in the superior lateral margin of the acetabulum which was reconstructed using iliac press bone grafts the photos on uh, post operatively the non weight bearing ambulation was started two days post op and we had a plan of full weight bearing ambulation and allowing it up to 12 weeks with a shoe raise but unfortunately the patient was lost to us in follow up and we couldn't actually really follow so the key take home messages was that the total hepatoplasty is often required with patients for uh, symptomatic arthritis secondary to dysplasia Usually, there is difficulty in identifying and preparing the true acetabulum. The difficulty in achieving stable fixation of the acetabular component, in restoring the center of hip rotation in cases with thigh dislocation, uh, leg may be lengthened up to about four centimeter, reduced during the and uh, so T for uh, THA uh, subtrochanteric femoral osteotomy is a viable option and can be extremely useful in addressing the limb length discrepancy. Thank you. Nice presentation. Okay. Uh, in dysplastic, it uh, sometimes is very difficult to find the tear. Yes, if you are unable to, how you decide your version? Mm. So we then uh, go with the uh, normal. Uh, we can uh, the here ones we can see the. Uh, Apex on the, the length of the axis or along the femur, then the uh, epicondylar line at the lower end, and we can from that we can have an idea that how we can place the. Sorry, sir. Oh, okay. So if you have to do the same case again and plan it again. Would you use the same same type of a cup and the same stem? Would you want to do something differently? Uh, so I preferably use a uh, cementless uh, stem or uh, cementless cup and a cementless stem. We have used a cementless stem, but we have used a cemented acetabulum. I would use a cemented cementless acetabulum. Uh, what was the age of the patient? So age of the patient was around fifty-five, fifty-eight. Okay. So you could have planned for a cementless cup also. For going ahead with this, yes, sir. Did you have difficulty in uh, pulling the uh, trochanter down because for the long-standing case? Uh, yes, sir. So some amount of muscle release was required, and while pulling down the, the, the but yes, there was some difficulty in pulling down the. Yes, yes. Uh, what muscle releases have you tried before doing the shorting? So since we were approaching with uh, the initially, since we had already approached it with a modified hard hinge approach, so when we had to release the uh, abductors as we went to the abductors release as well, and then uh, higher up on the uh, the we were planning, but uh, the preformis release and the other releases, but we but the, that was not that much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Doctor. Uh, the next, I would like to know Doctor Sibasis Panigrahi for uh, his presentation. Good morning, everybody. Today, I will present a uh, case of bilateral fused hip and knee in a 19 year old boy with uh, uh, juvenile inflammatory arthropathy. So, this patient, uh, 19 year old with bilateral fused hip with 70 degree of abduction and complete external rotation with 110 degree of flexion. He was bedridden for six last six years and he was staying outside his home because he cannot be uh, taken inside and outside the small rooms in his home. So this is the X-ray. Here we can see there is complete bony and calvusis of bilateral hip in external rotation and abduction. Uh, the knees were uh, also fused in 110 degrees of flexion. Uh, he has also ankylosis of ankle and wrist joint. Uh, so 
uh, here we were planning to do uh, first the hip but because uh, we do posterior approach and since uh, here the posterior structures will be straight so we need to delete it so uh, first we did the uh, through anterior approach we did the neck osteotomy and we did uh, through smith peterson and we did the primary uh, rotating hinge uh, arthroplasty of the uh, right knee then in another uh, since the knee was in contraction after releasing the inter uh, after releasing through arthrotomy and the posterior capsule the posterior skins were skin were also released and soft tissue uh, skin grafting was done in the next sitting we did the left side uh, neck osteotomy through smith peterson but unfortunately uh, since we didn't use the cm we cut the gt also so uh, after in the same sitting we did the left rotating hinge knee and uh, in another sitting we did uh, thr of the right side and also thr uh, of the left side since the gt was cut so we fixed the greater tegmenter with tbw and we did uh, modular uh, uh, dual mobility bi bilateral hip so this was the post of uh, uh, the patient was able to sit but he had flexion deformity of hip and uh, knee uh this was 3 months follow up uh, we can see that uh, there was union in the gt there was some heterotopic ossification of the left side and uh, uh, this is the follow up of pkr after 4 months since this was done pre covid this person could not be follow up and uh, we had a telephonic conversation and we, we are next planning to fuse the ankle and wrist in the uh, functional position Uh, now take home message is it is difficult to plan whether we should go for the hip or knee first but generally we go for the hip and then the knee but since the position was awkward and we could not position the patient in lateral position so we plan to do neck osteotomy and then do the knee and then the hip since this patient are um, bedridden so this is a very rewarding surgery and the person can be can emulate uh, independently to carry day to day activities thank you sir. so you have done a start me from the anterior approach whether you are able to do the thr also from the anterior approach or you uh, sir generally uh, we don't do anterior approach hip in this patient uh, after doing the osteotomy we could have gone for anterior approach hip but since the knee was flexed in 110 degree flexion so we could uh, we would have faced difficulty in maneuvering the leg and positioning we could not extend the hip so we we have gone for tkr first thkr we have done by anterior approach no sir posterior approach uh, could you have tried to, uh, doing thr in one sitting only uh, rather than doing osteotomy doing tkr sir this patient has ha had hemoglobin 6 so uh, two operation in a single sitting was not possible but we could have uh, gone for uh, but since the other hip was fused so we could not have gone for uh, thr of uh, same sit of same side in the same sitting what was the duration of between this case surgery sir this uh, this surgeries were carried out in 6 weeks of duration because the patient uh, general condition was not good for um uh, so we had planned staged operation thank you thank you sir <coughs> thank you dr shashish uh, next dr ahun kumar n for his case presentation uh good morning to all This is a case of 14 year old male patient with a 9 month old neglected acetabular fracture with posterior dislocation following a dashboard injury he had an acl and bcl injury as well and the ct and uh, judet views have shown significant posterior wall comminution with the dislocation and we have went through primary total hip replacement through uh, kocher langenberg approach the head has been resected and the sequential reaming of the acetabulum has been done and the defect uh, posterior wall defect has been analyzed and using cement as a uh, 3d imprint uh, the posterior wall size has been assessed and the head has been harvested as a graft and it has been temporarily fixed with the cr two cross k wires and it has been finally fixed with a uh, lax screw since the to compress the or augment the uh, graft we have used a buttress plate 
to fix the posterior uh, to reconstruct the posterior wall using the graft and finally we went to fix the uh, stabulum with the uh, highly porous multi hole cup uh, dentalum cup and the stabular components has been placed and the poly has been inserted the post op x ray has uh, shows that a uh, well positioned stabulum with uh, with the multiple locking screws in the cup and it has been placed uh, well adequately as suggested by marmor et al in all four uh, five out of five corridors uh, four corridors has been chosen and uh, a pubic screws has been inserted uh, to prevent the kickstander uh, to facilitate kickstander effect and uh, to prevent abduction uh, of the cup in the follow up and the screws used to fix the graft has been uh, aligned in parallel to the uh, hip axis like if hip, hips resultant force we should not place the screw horizontal uh, line and the acl and pcl has been reconstructed in the follow up period uh, in the one year follow up we can notice that there is no graft resolution and the uh, host bone integration with the tantalum cup is adequate and uh, we have fixed the uh, in additional we have fixed we have fixed the quadrilateral plate with the uh, tantalum cup as well in the follow up the clinical uh, results have been satisfactory so our uh, take home message is that highly porous multi hole cup provides an options for variable multiple site fixation and um, in future we can use a, like a navigation technology uh, to exactly purchase those uh, different corridors and uh, outcome is rewarding with uncemented hip and large femoral head and uh, three concepts that we need to remember or we need to achieve in those kind of cases is stable posterior wall fixation as we are very lucky enough in this case we can able to fix the posterior wall with an plate but in cases like significant posterior wall comminution or with a, a pelvic discontinuity it is unable to, to go for fixation so in those cases we may need a cage or uh, like a bursnader or a octopus kind of cages or we can go for a cage cup construct as well uh, to make this uh, joint stable so acute tha in complex hip injuries or tha in neglected posterior wall fracture dislocation is a challenging one hence it mandates proper planning and execution to achieve satisfactory long term long term outcome thank you all when you started weight bearing in this case sir in the uh, third post operative period day you, you are not afraid that there will maybe resolution of the graft you have put sir actually uh, you are 100% sure that this graft will work yes in the intraoperative period we are pretty sure that the graft has been positioned well and it has been augmented with the uh, buttress plate uh, in the posterior side so it is uh, very uh, we are very very pretty sure that the, there will not be any graft uh, miss Model alignment or placement. You said that you had put in a pubic screw there. Yes, sir. Can you just point out on your slide which one are you calling the pubic screw? Sir, uh, sorry, can you please? Can you point out on your presentation which screw are you calling the pubic screw? Ah, yes, sir, sure. <laughs> Screen presentation on the visit. The first one. Um, sir, uh, I can show it here. So in the cup, so in the cup, we have we used a uh, anterior gluteal and sciatic uh, screws, and in the pubic screws, this this screw is very crucial because in all cases we will use this uh, upper screws, but the lower screws iliac. Sorry, pubic or ischial screw is very important to prevent the lateral, uh, let, uh, sorry, abduction of the cup, and uh, it provides a kickstander effect as well. The screw you are pointing as pubic screw is the ischial, the screw to the ischial to velocity. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to
Klaus Kapoor for his presentation next. ये प्रेजेंटेशन चेंज हो गई है प्रेजेंटेशन दूसरी दी थी मैंने विवेक वो प्रेजेंटेशन दूसरी वो चेक करो मेरे नाम से मैं बोला आप एक बार जाकर कंफर्म कर लीजिए गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन डॉक्टर कार्तिक की प्रेजेंटेशन कर दीजिए प्लीज स्टार्ट ओके सो माय केस इज ऑन द डीए टीएच एंड द कॉम्प्लेक्स एंकालोस ही so is 29 male known case of sickle cell anemia complain of the both hip restricted movement and the severely affected daily activity present with the bilateral ankylosing hip with a fixed flexion deformity operated with both side dathr so this was a pre op clinical photos with the fixed deformities and severe lordotic spine and this was the pre op x rays suggest of the severely ankylosing hips patient was operated with the supine position da approach simple table first on the right side three or four days after left side so this way the intraoperative picture uh, it was hard to find uh, uh, hip center and the actual native acetabulum in the ankylosing hip so it took help of the cm locate the hip do double osteotomy napkin wing osteotomy and then prepare the acetabulum under the cm and this was the uh, cup positioning poly and the with uh, ceramicon poly and the, the correction of the hip after the da is a totally uh, flexion deformity was corrected uh, after 3 or 4 days patient was operated with the left side also and the same uh, napkin ring cut and this was the stability of the component uh, through da approach and this was the immediate post op x ray and this was the correction of the deformity of the uh, Fifteen to two weeks uh, suture removal, and this was the six weeks follow up. The correction of the posture and patient patient was very happy, and this was the sorry. Uh, this was the uh, moments video. Uh, patient was not able to move single leg because of the fixed deformity. Sorry. And this was the at the six weeks moment video. Now patient is able to move independently both lower limbs. And this was the six weeks follow up X ray with the walking pattern video, preoperative, and the six weeks video. thank you the main condition there was spinal pelvic deformity in this case yes sir so how was planning done for placement of cup what was it you have planned and second thing is how you when you are limb like this you have to take care of that so, uh, so uh, i didn't put the original poly uh, first i did with the trial i i kept the dual mobility ready but i don't want this patient was young so i check with the whole range of motion after putting the trials and i found the satisfactory stability uh, and then i put the original with the proper uh, direction of the lip so the stability was checked first i correct to the right side uh, with the uh, and the match the limb length uh, left side uh, limb length match to the right side 
So patient was the flex deformation. There was no issue of the LLD. First, I correct the right side. Uh, then I uh, mesh the left lower limb limb length to the right side. No, no, sir. No flexion deformity at the knee joint. So, do you help me in this to correct the all flexion deformity? If I have operated for the posterior approach, I had to re release the anterior approach as well to correct the deformity. So, posterior structure safe. How was the LND after the good operation? You see the stage and gate of the patient. Whether there was any LND limb length discrepancy? Uh, as patient had flexion deformity, there was no LLD, but post operate there was there were no LLD. Both lower limb were the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you, Dr. Bhatti, for the presentation. Dr. Mahas Kapoor for the next case. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am presenting a case of cup augmentation in cemented THR. This is a follow-up case of cemented total hip replacement, left hip done for bilateral secondary osteoarthritis hip in 48-year-old gentleman with no comorbidities in 2006. Patient was uneventful for five years when he suddenly met with an accident in the form of fall from bus. His hip got posteriorly dislocated, which was reduced under GI in OT. After that, there were five similar incidences. This was the X-ray in which the hip got dislocated and it was reduced under GA and after that it re-dislocated. So the issues would be component malpositioning, soft tissue laxity and polyvere. And uh, on going inside, we have seen that there is no posterior constraint and cup was well fixed with no, uh, normal inclination and uh, uh, version. So there was a posterior wear also of the poly. So we had planned to cut this uh, posterior part of the poly and augment it posteriorly by using a new cup uh, rim of the already uh, size we have taken for the posterior augmentation and we augmented it uh, the approach used was posterior and posterior part of vestibular rim augmented after fabrication of new cup of size 55 mm so first we fixed, uh, held it with the k wires and then we fixed it with four cortical screws so intraoperatively there was uh, no laxity and this is the immediate post-op x-ray and uh, this is a six-year follow-up with no further dislocation. There is a general in which the uh, general of uh, bone and joint surgery, there is a, in 2007, the use of posterior lip augmentation device for a revision of recurrent dislocation after primary cemented channel lip. Uh, this was research published. So discussion is in that study, they use posterior lip augmentation device by DEPU due to cost constraint and non-availability of device. We can easily make it by using other estabular component. Also, this device was compatible with only Charlie estabular component, but by our technique, we can add constraint to any primary total lip replacement with well fixed cup, but having push, uh, posterior dislocations. So this was the interoperative video. So by saw, we are just uh, smoothing the margins and cutting the estabular. Thank you. So there was only wear on the rim of the posterior side. Yes, sir. And there was uh, the hip was dislocating. So nowadays we have a posterior lip, a posterior lip of the uh, cup, but that was primary uh, total hips. So this, it was Why not, you not planned for it. So because the patient was young, forty-eight year old, and the cup was well fixed, and there was a, a, a less bone stroke, and the cementing was very well done. So we uh, thought of doing this and interoperatively also it was good. So what is, uh, what will be impingement by this supplement, posterior supplement? Board? Yes, sir. It, there, there, can be, be, there can be, uh, there can be, also. there can be, sir. there can be impingement by this, but we have checked it interoperatively and there was no. On hindsight, why do you think that your hip is now dislocated five times? Uh, you but, said your hip had dislocated five times after the first fall. Yes, sir. So one question is, uh, when did the patient have the first fall? And in hindsight, what do you think is the cause for the hip uh, going into a recurrent? So the patient had first fall after five years of a primary operation. And uh, that was accident. And it was a heavy energy trauma, high energy trauma. 
so that might have lead to the uh, wear of the you can cause the cause of the recurrent dislocation uh, five times repeated dislocation after the first episode so it, uh, this is the wear and there was no posterior support of the cup estabular cup because of recurrent dislocation that got wear and uh, Would changing to a dual mobility cup helped? Um, yes, sir. In that case, it will help. But uh, for that, we have to revise it. So that's what we are widening in that case because the patient is young, and it has been only five years since the operation has been done. So that will be. And also, if do we do the revision, that has high dislocation rate. So in that study, they have published in only one point one six percent dislocation. But in revision, they say that there is a seven to forty uh, percent dislocation rate. So we we wanted to avoid that, but we have all the armamentarium. If that was not fixed, then we we should have to. Thank, Thank you, sir. And now we have a live surgery session, uh, which will be Oxford partial knee replacement. I would like to invite Dr. Bhuvan Shekhar and Dr. Krishna Kiran to the. Stage for moderating the session. We will have the above forty case presentation after the live surgery, and the results will be declared in the inauguration ceremony at twelve o'clock. Good morning. Good morning, Zafir. Yes, yes, sir. we are able to hear you. Uh, this is a This is a 50-year-old lady uh, who's got the uh, anterior medial osteoarthritis of both knees. She is most symptomatic on the left side. We have things are uh, 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 available for your solution, uh, and uh, we are going to do a partial knee replacement. We have for you here. So. Uh, we are ready for the incision. We have already given the antibiotic and tracheostomic acid. Can we start? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. So, give a medial parapetal incision. Take a deep. So, we start with the arthrotomy and it's positive. So we'll, the first step will be we will assess and confirm that it is suitable for the partial knee replacement. Um, I've seen a lot of people even extend the indication in either very young or very old patients. Um, so I think my concern would only be, as you know, the status of the uh, ACL and the uh, and the status of the lateral compartment. So we have done the assess me here now. Um, comment. So the first step is to insert the joint. Extend. So I can I can see the ligaments are closing. So the ACL can be so we can see the ligaments are closing. This is already a very good sign that the ACL is intact. As you can see, it is intact. What will you do if you uh, find that it's not suitable for a uni? I I'll see that you're doing it in a leg hanging position. Yes, so we just put it back on the table. The options are two. Either to do this in the table only, which can be done, but uh, you know it's always uh, recommended by. Yes, that it is. Uh, what several advantages of doing it with a leg hanging down? So, uh, but uh, I would just put it back on the table. Remove the side support and good. And it does. It happens sometimes. So it's not that every time that you plan UKR it will be. So lateral compartment is very pristine, ACL is good. So we'll go ahead with the with the uh, UKR. I just need to extend the arthrotomy a little. Nice, sir. What is the advantage of doing it like hanging? So one is that you know it remains distracted. Uh, it's easy to uh, you know uh, flex it beyond 90 degrees and. Uh, you know this surgery is actually done in 95 degrees. They sometimes they even go to say that if the knee cannot be flexed 95 degrees, you should not be doing a UKR. Uh, but then uh, the other thing is that you know the giving the compression from below. Uh, it actually generally 
uh, very comfortable. But like I said, it's really a matter of personal choice. You can do it on an ordinary table, which will take care of the situation. Today, we have four days off. 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 And uh, we have a good angle of the fire. See that? Yeah. Can you see that? Can you focus on the light itself? This is the angle. So we'll start by taking out the angle. So my experience is if you follow the school steps in surgery, you know you will never miss out anything. If you remove angle that any any times you sometimes may forget. Like uh, show me the ostrich chisel. The second step is to do the notch plasty because there are always ostrichites here. You can see. And what happens is, over a period of time, you don't want the osteophytes to keep on impinging on the ACL and cause a late rupture. So every time we are going in, we do a notch plasty to make sure that the uh, ACL is left without any stress. So we are done here. I'll just uh, so uh, this part is done. We have done actually. The, one can also inspect the petal at this point of time. We usually do it when we have cemented because there is some time at our hands. But it can be done, so you can inspect the petal femoral joint. That's not going to make a difference to the decision of surgery. You can see the ACL, and you can uh, remove the anvil and do a notch plasty, and then just make some room for the uh, the MCL retractor, the curly whirly, to be slipped inside. So uh, that's what we are going to do now. We have not noticed in some of our patients that there is a central uh, wear on the tibia, on the lateral condyle. Yes, which you cannot see on the uh, thing, and it it will not be apparent on valgus. Yes, yes, but but I you I totally agree with you. But what I can tell you is that if you do the <coughs> proper valgus varus valgus view, you can actually see diminution of the lateral joint space in these cases. Right. So that's what you should look for. The other thing is if the ulcer is somewhere where it is covered by the meniscus, I won't really bother if I'm convinced about this. So it's a very small lady. It possibly would have had an extra small. But since you know that the company has discontinued extra small because of poor results, we'll go for a small. So this so, is uh, how do you determine the size of the? So that is the uh, the uh, uh, this is the spoon which is used yeah. for this. This is a small. So what happens is it goes all around the condyle, and it is now uh, flush with the posterior condyle, and you should be able to just rock it a little bit. And I believe the distance between the this flange and the condyle should be two millimeters. Right. It's a little more there, but then I'm not going to worry. When we started doing, they they used to be templates. So uh, so that uh, those templates are uh, uh, were used for sizing, and you never uh, these uh, templating spoons were not available. Now actually, and then that came a time when they said that it can be according to the height of the patient. But then we published. That the height and the size do not correlate always very well. So this is the time to mark the vertical curb, and that has to be the plane of flexion extension. So what I do is pass along the osteotome along the condyle. So see, my tracker or my mobile bearing should track along the margin of the femoral condyle. So if I slide it along, it will always be in the correct plane, marking pen. So. Uh, it's not working. So we mark the direction of the vertical cut. Now we are ready. So we put that spoon small. If it is a little lax, we can put size two and size three also. And also sometimes you'll see that this tibia is slanting. And in those cases, I put size two or size size three spoon because otherwise you end up cutting too much of tibia. So you have to be very conservative in your tibial resection, and you cut tibia only once. If the space is not enough, she miss me. If the space is not enough, you take out take out a couple of millimeters from the posterior condyle of the femur, but you never never recut it to be again. There is a question from the audience. Yeah, uh, Dr. Kare wants to know why you are using the home end retractor there. That is just to retract everything away. You can use a self retaining. The home end is resting on the uh, medial uh, lateral border of the medial condyle, and it is just distracting. He is feeling it might damage it's the a, cruciates. No, it does. It's nowhere near the cruciates. It's actually just retracting the extensor mechanism between here and there. And then medial side is the PCL, and the insertion is actually way behind. Yeah. Right. So we are not worried about this. Give me a pen. 
So, um, as you all know that uh, there is a marking on the tibial jig, and uh, I can show you that just now. And uh, right, so I'll show you when I disengage it. So this looks like a good cut. Hold, hold it here. There's a shim here. Now we are ready to cut the tibia. So this is again to confirm the plane. Never lift up your handle like this because you will breach the posterior cortex. Keep your handle down. So you are using a Zimma blade? Or? Sorry? The blade you are using is a Zimma blade or what blade is? No, that's a reciprocating saw. We just uh, used... Uh, so there is a set of three blades provided by the company. So uh, there is uh, a reciprocating saw blade, an ordinary saw blade and the brush tip. So we'll now make the transverse cut. This MCL protector is there already. The uh, so do you have a, a curly valley? Sorry. The curly valley retractor. Yes, curly valley is inside. This okay. Is so that's very important to protect the MCL. Yeah, that's to protect the MCL. So I just mentioned it as MCL protector. So, uh, this one comes out now in puller. Hold it. Show me. So, there is a CE written below. Our sister has put it just on C. It should have been on E. So, this is the place up to which this, uh, this has to slide to give the correct uh, tibial slope. So, uh, and this is our cut. We take a towel clip. We take a towel clip, we extend the knee a little bit and make some room for it and we are able to take it out. Sometimes there is a little bit of bone there, I am not worried about it. Now look at this cut. The, uh, it's totally anterior medial osteoarthritis. Posterior cartilage is absolutely intact. It's got a functional ACL as a good case for partially. Now, I have cut tibia. I need 7 millimeter space here for the tibial component with the install. So I need to confirm whether my space is adequate or not. And whenever I assess the space, there have to be no retractors, no tension on the soft tissue. So I want to see whether I have created sufficient space for this or not. That's 7 millimeter. It should go in with two fingers. It's beautiful. So we are quite good with the tibial cut. We don't have to do anything. So we'll go to femur. So we'll open the canal first. So it is a little more medial than normal the maybe along the lateral border of the medial condyle at the junction of petlofemoral and tibiofemoral joint so uh, there is a question from uh, brigadier agarwal that yes. if the space were less than seven millimeter what will you do now so i'll just go there show her i'll just go there i told you we don't take out the more tibia this is the ideal thickness of the tibia and show me the tibial cut again see this is, uh, this is a reasonably good cut of tibia, but you never recut tibia. So I would have taken out a couple of millimeter of bone from here, from the posterior femoral condyle, till I could introduce a 7 millimeter. Yeah, thing. so you are anteriorizing the femoral component. I will anteriorize the uh, femoral component, but I will not cut tibia again. Uh, it messes uh, up the whole thing to the tibia size becomes smaller, three tibia becomes weaker. So those are not, that's something which is to be avoided completely. Yes. Uh, I also see that. You have not removed the femoral osteophyte before you. At this point of time, you are very close to that. You just asked this question a few seconds earlier. So, but you can do it. What no, no, but uh, my question was that if you make your tibial cut without removing the uh, osteophyte, since the jig is in flexion, you do, do you think it's not going to influence or? Uh, or no, the jig didn't see the thing is I have measured I have measured the tibial cut between this and this and the. The, uh, the MCL is not being tented so much in, in 90 degrees. So I think we just need to do this. And these are all anterior. So I think, don't think they influence. It's just a question of having a workflow. We can remove it in the first phase. That's not a problem. Yeah. But, uh, normally we do it when we are actually centralizing the jig on this. That's how we have got used to. I think uh, what happens is, if you follow the same workflow, your team is always comfortable. If you keep on changing your steps again and again, so if I change now, my entire team will have to change. Not that it's a wrong thing to change. Just put a retractor. This is usually at this time that we concentrate on the female. Right. Chisel. 
let's say matter of habit may not be the best thing no no i was of the impression that it will have some influence on the correctability of the deformity no, this is all very uh, this is all very uh, 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 sort of uh, provisional at this point of time right so because we are going to create our flexion space extension space and we'll going to adjust everything so there is a notified here usually with good for rabbit ear which goes behind and can create problems so that has to be removed and that's the one probably if the flexion gap is tight as less than seven as we discussed we can go back and address the osteophytes probably yes. sorry if it is tight then then you can remove osteophytes and recheck the spaces yeah. that also can be done of course that can also be done and of course uh, the uh, the tibia uh, we don't touch again and i tell you you make a correct tibial cut your 80% surgery is done because then you build everything it's like that in all you care you do a tibial cut then everything is according to that yes so if you have made a good tibial cut the only time you will get stranded is if your blade sky is it is not enough uh, slope in the tibia you are not cut enough tibia and you don't know what to do so uh, this is a summary of it in place and uh, this is an important step to now centralize this disc on the distal femur so if we if the audience younger younger surgeons have noticed he has put in an intramedullary jig he has put in the tibia uh, the femoral guide and marked the center of the femoral condyle and unitize these two together so he is setting up multiple parameters in one go the flexion extension the external internal rotation of the femoral component and various valgus all three are set in one go so we still remember the classical instrumentation where you had to match the jig with seven parameters yes, you know yes. centralize and uh, so this is pretty good have the femoral jig now so this automatically links the jig uh, assembly with the intramedullary rod and then that is able to align it in correct position so this has right. been a beautiful right. instrumentation once you do that you don't see this is the uh, posterior cut now Because you don't touch the the uh, distal femur, you just mill it. Uh -huh. So since it's a uh, spherical component, it's not a cylindrical, cylindrical component. Unlike other things, they're trying to create this sphere out of the distal femur. So you do a zero position where you don't take any bone from the distal femur, and then ma match the flexion to the extension gap. So that's the step uh, sequence for Oxford. So this milling is to make room. So this has made the distal femur equivalent to the thickness of the component. Right now we have to adjust the space. Right? Yeah. So now we'll show you how we size the tibial component. So we take the tibial cut. This is the tibial cut, and you take the opposite side tibia. So this is left side. So right side. Can see that right medial. So we take the opposite side tibial base plate. and match it and this is looking good so this is a size c which is a reasonable size tibia so if you use a very small tibial component or an undersized tibial component or something which is underhanging you run the risk of the uh, the component shrinking so now give me that uh, p left medial give me the give me the p all right okay Left. All right. Okay. And give me. 
give me the T. We take out the rod. Anything which which uh, tensions the soft tissue will actually not allow you the correct assessment of the soft tissue tension and the strain. So this is size three. This is going as size three. I know that it's a little tight, but it will become all right because I haven't removed the posterior horn. So this is the size three. I will learn for a size three. Extend to twenty degrees. Can I have size one? Yeah, pillar gauge. This is called a pillar gauge. So, so it's uh, it's not going in. So the difference between the flexion space and extension space is three, because the flex. Can you make a little bit there? T DJ, so extractor DJ. So we we have a flexion space which is three millimeter. We have an extension space which is zero. So we have to take out. Three more millimeters from the distal femur, so that the extension space becomes equal. So that principle is same as total knee, <clears throat> but for the tibial cut will influence flexion and extension space is both. The posterior cut will only affect the flexion space, and the distal bone will only affect the extension space. Have you had any situation where the uh, patient had a little bit of hyperextension, and the zero on the femur would be lax as compared to the flexion gap? And what would you do in that situation? So uh, um, one thing is how much of hyperextension? T uh, though, start with. So uh, there is hyper. How much of hyperextension? So there are some people who do uh, UKR in hyperextension. We don't do it if the hyperextension is more than eleven or twelve degrees because uh, it is likely to impinge. But I think a lot of people they say that if you take out less of distal femur. Just like you do in a total knee, this will raise the joint line. Yeah. But uh, uh, they think that it can take care of the hyperextension. We have been doing navigated UKR. So at any time, if we found that the hyperextension was more than 10 degrees, we abandoned and did the total knee. Yeah. Okay. Makes so sense. So we are not great proponents of doing uh, UKR in hyperextension. So bone is very sclerotic. I think pre-op assessment of hyperextension is very important. Yes, uh, contraindication. It is, but that was a great advantage. The days when we were doing the the uh, navigated UPR, it was a big luxury. Can I have a towel clip, please, and a wash? This towel clip is not holding, please. Give me another towel clip. Darwaza ban karo. Nice. So this is a time to get rid of the medial meniscus. Again, you can do it at any point of time. At this point of time, tibial cut is out, the uh, femoral cut is out. I can see everything very well, so I don't struggle. But again, you may start. You you saw that I had a little bit of problem because of the remaining. Uh, meniscus about the stain, but I think I can manage with that because right now I'll have a full confirmation about the stain. So we have removed the meniscus. We'll just give it a quick wash. Give me this. So we will just now before actually checking the. Flexion extension space. We at this point of time use the anti impingement guide. So we'll put the anti impingement guide. You see, every time I am doing something in flexion, my assistant takes the leg into 95 degree flexion, which is the best position for the surgery. So this is anti impingement. This will take out the ridge of bone anteriorly, so that the meniscus when it comes here. Doesn't impingement get dislocated? Either the bone is too good, or I think the instrument has really worn out. Chisel. So we have this very special chisel to go through the jib, and it goes in. 
and we try to remove any of the posterior osteophytes which may be present. There. Although I have never successfully removed anything very well with this, we use our own crab chisel or a ferret. But this is a design which something which company recommends. So, so uh, can you give me curates? Are there not many osteophytes there? And I uh, just curate it once and then. Light under the car. Give me wash once again. There was a small piece, no time. Yeah. Yeah. Wash and uh, kidney day. Mop and put it. Put it. So we'll take a good look inside. We are nearly ready. So. There is some amount of capsule there. Um, I think there's a small piece of bone here. Give me an osteotome, please. Sharp osteotome. Ah. You saw that uh, laterally, that cut was a little incomplete. So there's a very small couple of millimeter of bone left there. Nibla? Here it comes. Uh, it was attached to the soft tissue. So this was a piece of bone which was missing from the cut. That's out now. There is some amount of capsule. So we are quite good here actually. So, so we'll now uh, see our fit of our tibial components. So should this show me the tibia? E. Show me the tibial cut again. So you see, whenever we cut tibia, you should always include the part of the spike with that. You know, you can see the tibial spike, and see from here you'll appreciate what I'm saying. So that makes sure that you are sufficiently lateralized. You can even go through some of the fibers of the ACL, but you should have a component which is widest possible. So if you have a good fit anterior posteriorly, but medial laterally the component is overhanging, you can go a little more laterally and even through some of the fibers of the ACL. But this is the ideal cut. The cut must go through the tibial spine for her to have sufficient uh, uh, thickness, T. And now what we'll do is, we have aligned the tibia here. Okay. We put it, put a pin in place and we are going to wait. We are going to see the coverage. We see anteriorly it is fitting well. Posteriorly, I have made sure with this that we are uh, flush with the posterior cortex. Now give us the double-ended periosteum. Zoom in some light. So there's a little bit of an osteophyte here which is structured. There is a very good coverage here. Maybe half a millimeter of overhang, maybe. But otherwise, it looks very good. I'm sufficiently lateral here, like I said, so I'm not going to fiddle with this. So we are good to go. We have seen the coverage. It's not underhanging. It's a little hard, a fraction of a millimeter overhanging maybe. Give me the red. Okay. So this comes out. I was going to put the tibial trial now. So give me the uh, T and the tibial trial. Suction Same again. Like Push it. Same so we have to balance the knee. We have to we have balanced the knee. We have to see how well we have done that. So we'll just drop this uh, tibial trial in. T. Microscope and over a period of time, when you get experience, you've done enough. If I put this, I know my space is sufficient because if I have my space is not for three, it will not go in. So, over the years, we develop all these soft subconscious. Uh, so, it was a little tighter when I put the three than I would like, but then I knew that once I remove the posterior horn uh, of the minister, everything will fall in place and 
some of these things uh, like osteopersonal also make a difference it was roughly to see that whether you need to do anything for the bone or not right so give me a spoon so we'll take a size three feeler gauge again this goes in pretty easily so this is a good space for three and this is getting extended right so this is good so now we will put in a meniscus give me a meniscus this is a meniscus 95 degree again and this goes in right it goes in you see it is coming in front can you see that yeah so it is just about coming here so we'll remove a little bit of bone from here which we often do we we'll take a look at the petla at this point of time can you show the petla can you show this so there are grade three grade the uh, three changes in the petla on the medial condyle and grade one on the lateral condyle so this is okay we just don't bother about it because the uh, so you see as we flex the the mobile bearing goes back as we extend it comes forward so the acl is functional and the kinematics has been restored so all that we need to do now is to take out this uh, little bit of bone from front which impinges cement so we are ready to cement etc uh, there is a question uh, yes. uh, any tips to avoid breaching the posterior cortex of the tibia yeah that's a terrible thing to do so i told you one thing is when you make the vertical cut don't lift up your handle to make sure that your uh, tibial component is flush posteriorly and the groove which you are making does not go through always it is a good idea to take a look that it's not breached and if it is breached suppose what i'll do is i'll take that the same uh, actually I've forgotten the name of this instrument we call it khujli for offer that <laughs> so we have been sure so its nickname is khujli it is used for scratching so i would have just used this to extend this or even remake the slot and we put a little bone graft here and push it back and we impact it so okay. that the uh, there is some bone behind the keel so that is very important so uh, we are all done here i'll just take the guard wala drill so there is a drill with the guard yeah we are going to do that so we are going to make multiple holes it's a very sclerotic bone have you seen all the instruments uh, are actually older than me <laughs> <laughs> have you seen patients with uh, osteochondritis of the femoral condyle progress after your uh, partial knee and uh, condyle itself now again uh, becomes osteochondritic and then the femoral component fails 3 years or 4 years down the line sorry i missed that you said something about uh, what happens to so you done it partial knee for a osteochondritis desiccans of the yeah. distal femur yeah have you seen situations where the osteochondral lesion keeps progressing distally into the femur and early yeah. femoral component failure yeah i have not seen we have done about 14 of these and i have not seen but we are a little liberal with the with the little liberal with the this is you need cut valve little liberal with the distal femoral uh, milling when we are doing that we try not to leave any unhealthy bone but in, interesting thing is that a lot of people who have reported talks like lesions in the tibia also i review the paper for dbgs before where they had actually uh, done uh, upr for osteochondral lesion uh, the strong kind of lesion on the tibial side also yeah. so uh, we have been fortunate i say but uh, you know whenever we are doing it for strong we uh, of course everybody does an mri so i think that mri is a very useful guide of the disease at that point you must make sure that not the edematous part because that is reversible but you should take out most of the necrotic part that is very important uh, step and if you are not comfortable on the table just change over to total knee because it uh, it's not fair to the patient to try something if you are not yourself sure about uh, the outcome right so there is one more question from dr khare on uh... What yeah. is amount of laxity you will accept with that uh, meniscus? I'll show you that now. I should have shown you that my fault. That's a very good point. So one thing is the laxity is also affected by the difficulty or the ease with which you can put in the spacer or the meniscus. That's first thing. The second thing is 
अभी मुझे देना सर सिबियल बेस प्लेट सिबियल बेस प्लेट so do you routinely do mri for your knees or no if it is strong we are talking about the spontaneous osteonecrosis so if a okay. patient comes to me with severe pain of relatively recent onset you know recent onset just a few months or less than a year and uh, the joint space looks fine we get an mri done and in that if you find that there is spontaneous osteonecrosis then you and it's not possible to treat it conservatively then we would prefer to do a partial because these are the joints which are absolutely pristine otherwise yeah. they are beautiful joints even you know you don't feel like doing anything inside uh, inside there so how long you do conservative treatments so that will depend on the extent that we will give alendronate and give uh, conservative treatment as long as it gives start giving some significant relief to the patient after some time give me the osteotome so one thing which is straight so one thing which is done is you know we ask about laxity you can put the self to me so one good thing you must always look at is that there is you should be able to insert or tum patle nahi kisal do bahut thoda so you should be able to put an insert between the between the uh, between the uh, sorry you should be able to put an osteotome between the insert and the wall see that Yeah. So that is sufficient laxity because then this will not impinge. If they, it should have that much of uh, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, leeway to let a small osteotome go in between the vertical wall and the and the uh, insert, then we know that we are not impinging and it's not too tight. And this instrument is used for removing. So we are actually good for cementing now. So next. So we are checking the component. We can show that it on the X-ray. There is no hurry to open the component. We are using a small size femoral component and C size left medial component. So give me the T. Wait a second. So how do you know the anterior edge of your femoral component is okay? Uh, the sorry, what did you say? The anterior edge of the femoral component. How do you know it's in the correct position? So that is something which is a little. Which is this? Which is very easy in fixed bearing. In a fixed bearing, the, when you make a distal cut, you should always have a couple of millimeter of raw calcellus bone exposed beyond the anterior margin. Here, you know, because it's spherical, and as long as the component does not impinge, the insert does not impinge on coming forward, it doesn't matter. If you saw, we are anyway using a little oversized uh, femoral component here because the company says you should not put. Extra small. She's a very small lady. So a little bit of uh, uh, oversized component, maybe bigger on the verge of being little oversized. But uh, you know, we we now have been doing this since 2008. So our first and most of the patients done early were those who were known to somebody to have 100% follow up. So we have patients 13 year follow up who. You know, have been overweight, been everything. I think this has worked very well with different, with the old instrumentation, new instrumentation. You know, with sizing by template, sizing by spoon on the table, and uh, I think this eventually works for most patients. There are studies which show that the various angles of femoral component doesn't matter, various angles of tibial component doesn't matter, the rotation of the femoral component doesn't matter. Over and under hand doesn't matter. So that way, you know, unless you do something to cause impingement or mess up the component positioning, it's a rather forgiving joint. Yep. It's a very forgiving type of uh, replacement. Unless so, a lot of people never used to do UKR because they were worried about the edge loading because they thought if you malposition the component, the edge loading will occur and that there will be catastrophic failure of the UKR. Those issues are not there because of the, like you said, spherical component. So there is uh, no danger of edge loading or catastrophic failure. And you know there have been 20 year results, 25 year results. So of course many of them are by the designer surgeons. But then we are also heading where we have a sizable population of more than 10 year follow up patients. And uh, now actually. Uh, Uh, we would absolutely 
go for upr in anybody who is less than 50 or more than 70 and over 70 we leave and stretch the indication because you know that uh, the risk of complication that icu admission and all is much lower with the with the upr so any elderly person anybody with the heart disease comorbidity our first attempt will be somehow if we can get away with the partial knee that will be our first choice what about bmi do you have any cut off yeah so that's a very good question now that's a big problem i am grateful that you brought it up uh, raja i have about 10 patients waiting for surgery whose bmi is between 34 and 36 So I asked my team, "What do you suggest?" They said, "We will do it. We will do it for anybody who is around 35. Then somebody comes along who is 35.5. They say, 'What do we do now?' They said, 'We will do it.' So, but uh, what I can tell you is, I have seen a lot of high BMI Indian patients, you know, in the, in the range of 35 and 4, and we have found that the uh, incidence of Alteration on the uh, on the lateral side and the femoral cartilage is more frequent than other than uh, non-obese patients. So just be a little careful. So we look at the joint very very carefully in morbidly obese because most of the morbidly obese patients once they start going about 35 BMI, we have seen that they and we we think that it looks perfectly suitable for uh, UPR and then we realize that uh, like. Then we realize that they are not, and we have to revert to total. Um, one of them is uh, a very senior faculty member who retired from institute. Uh, we operated earlier this week, and uh, we had to abandon. What do you tell your patient uh, who asks? So first, will will it last? We we do all the counseling beforehand. It's no, no. Uh, about the UKR, uh, like in practice, we seem to find. Uh, that patients are very reluctant to go for a partial knee replacement so actually if a patient is hesitant i will not go i to to uh, counsel him the only patient i particularly the patient is between 60 and 70 the only patient i counsel and you should be very careful careful about putting very little uh, uh, cement on this some people say that in tibia you should put only on component and in femur you should put only on the bone but anyway the only patients i counsel is those who are very very young and i tell them that you will need another surgery so better this than to have a revision of a total knee and the other patients i convince is those who are old where there is no no difficulty in convincing is old about 70 or with comorbidity where we tell them that your your risk to life is much less with upr those are the only two groups that's why uh, it has gone a little down in my practice uh, it is come to about 10% now it used to be about 20 because i have been convinced the patient now because if they are between 60 and 70 i know my total knee will last acl good i know my pkr will last this patient good uh, so i am not really concerned about uh, convincing the patient to get a upr done but i will convince a 45 year or 50 year old like this patient I would be very reluctant to do a total knee. She is only 50, and she has a AMO. I mean, I think if you don't do uh, UPR in this, what kind of patient will you do it in? Watch. And so, we are really convinced about the safety in the elderly population. So that is one population where its use will never go away. So, what is the longevity you promise these younger patients? Sorry, what is? What is the longevity of the implant you promise them? So we have revised two two UPRs in all these years, and uh, in both of them it was because of the uh, because of the uh, tibial failure. We had one patient who had intraoperative fracture, right when everything was done and cementing was done, and when it was being hammered, there was a crack here, so we had to put in a plate. But uh, we are actually quite happy otherwise. Give me the Uh, there is there is a question. Uh, suppose uh, suppose to find the ACL was uh, a little bit dodgy. Yes. Would you convert it into a fixed bearing UKR or TKR? If, I, if my indication is the safety of the patient and the advanced age, 
as in do you care with a little less float in the tibial component if it is uh, a young lady between or anybody between 60 and 70 i will not do i'll just abandon it and take it right so if so if what are your reasons for doing it and i tell you the pkr is now a very successful operation but it doesn't take away the potential risk so whenever in a high risk patient i have a choice between ukr and pkr i just not even think i'll just do a ukr so that is very clear so that my reason uh, for that are because you know in a i still believe that in a 60 to 70 age group it doesn't really matter much i can give a good knee which will last the patient a good time So, uh, so, sir, Doctor uh, Deepak is here, so he is given you another minute to put the insert. So I cannot put the insert before uh, before the cement is set. I can do that. <laughs> That's not a problem. But we are done here. We have put a spacer here, and uh, what I can do is just put the insert. So what I do is I put the cell minister, right? And uh, then we we'll allow it to set, so that you know that the surgery is done. And we just want to exchange it with the real insert, right? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, that's a wonderful demonstration of the Oxford Unity. So, uh, one last question from uh, Dr. Abai. Yeah. He said, in an octogenarian, would you extend the indication uh, with uh, more virus and? Definitely. You know? Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Definitely, but then you know when we were doing navigated UPR, it taught us a lot of things. It taught us, it made us look at the uh, look at the residual virus because of the tibial bowing. So if we if the tibial bowing was more than five degrees, you know, yeah, then we would not do it because you see the thing is how much of residual virus you want to leave, and if it is an extra articular deformity and uh, you do a uh, UPR. And you are left with overall less than more, more than uh, more than five degree virus because of wind. And we all know that the patient when he stands up, it gets accentuated with weight bearing. Yeah. So I will not do uh, in those cases. So it made us uh, pick up pick up the potential troublemakers, those with hyperextension, those with more than five degree wind. So we keep away from them, and we used to convert them to totally on the table. And fortunately, we use, we have the same system for uh, navigation, so we just go out and navigate the UKR with autopilot to total knee replacement with autopilot. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sajri. Uh, we will now start with the next session, which is a clinical case presentation about forty years age. I would like to invite the jury members, uh, Dr. V K Gautam. Dr. Raju Vaishya and uh, Professor Anil Mitali for first presenter will be uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Saurabh Sharma. I start. Sir. Yeah, Good morning, sir. Uh, I'll be presenting case of a revision THR Danada Center. My patient was a 67-year-old lady who underwent a cemented total hip replacement for a secondary osteoarthritis of her hip in the year 1989 at one of her army hospitals. Uh, however, she did well for a few years, 15-20 years, and later in life she became totally limited in her mobility, so much so that she was wheelchair ambulant when she came to us, and she was a home ambulator with the help of support. Clinically, she had a valid surgical scar, no sinus, no local sign of inflammation. The distal neurovascular status was intact. On examination, her limb was in a fixed flexion deformity of 40 degrees on the left side. It was fixed in a neutral abduction adduction and a 10 degree external rotation. There was no further movement possible at the hip. 
her uh, in the, in, uh, infection parameters were normal esr crp cbc was within normal limit pre we tried aspirating a hip but we couldn't get anything it was dry this is x ray presentation you can see a grade 3 protrusion with the uh, heterotrophic ossification both in the medial and the lateral aspect there is no obvious sign of loosening of the stem uh there is a pre op ct scan i'm sorry for the poor quality of pictures uh there is a intact medial wall of the estabulum however it is grade three protrusion but the you can see a clear uh, speck of bone uh, medial to the cup there is a heterotrophic mass on the anterior and the posterior aspect which is seen so given this case scenario there were two surgical uh expected issues which would come crop up during our uh, approach one and foremost was a surgical approach how to go ahead and expose this hip and dislocate this hip so we had uh, decided that we will go ahead uh, after uh, the skin incision and exposing the lateral side we will go ahead with the eto after exposing the proximal femur the eto extend was decided till the tip of the stem because we were sure that we would not be able to take out this dislocate this hip, hip in a conventional way we would have to take out the stem first then only we can take out the stem the hip mass was excised as needed for exposure then uh, the issue about the cup whether to go ahead and uh, adventure about removing the cup but up after placing the needle all the soft tissue it was found that the cup was well incarcerated and was left in situ and uh, the estabulum was reconstructed using a tantalum augments uh, uncemented combi cup was used and a cemented uh, a polyliner was cemented into this combi cup the stem was revised using a modular resin stem uh, this was the post op and also we used uh, stimulant beads along with the antibiotic for local antibiotic delivery inside device because infection can never be ruled out in such cases is a two month follow up uh i'll just come to the key learning points which we had a uh, good planning and good exposure is the paramount to have a success in these kind of cases we need good inventory support and thorough of use of fluoroscopy should have been done to minimize the combi cup a little more and don't venture if not required unless you, uh, which can land you in trouble uh, never forget prosthetic joint infection thank you thank you for your take the decision of not removing the cup preoperatively what was your gut feeling sir, or was it a decision which was taken at the time of surgery sir we were uh, almost 50% sure that we won't have to remove the cup because it was too far medially gone and the uh, prospective cup placement would not be hampered by uh, letting the cup stay in situ did you have any backup plan suppose you had to remove the cup and may have created a bigger gutter sir you would have continued with the same plan no sir then we would have used the bigger uh, tin uh, cup uh, to make the uh, stable so you don't have uh, allograft as yet as, as of now we don't have sir that is uh, yeah. i had kept one of the key learning issues sir Sir, sir. Thank you. Uh, it was an unconventional way of doing the revision. Do have you come across with such a procedure described in the literature? Uh, in the form of sir, leaving the leaving the cup and putting another cup on the top of it. And what was your follow-up? So follow-up is very short, sir. It has been just three months post surgery, sir. Um, the uh, the any implant which is not hampering a placement can be left in place sir this that's the literature that any such case has ever been done i just wanted to know uh, uh, no sir uh, it should, should be natural process that should you don't have the provision of allograft with you yes if you had to remove the cup how do you, how would you have managed them if you had to remove the cup then the plan was to use a bigger tm uh, cup so that would have been the that was our secondary plan and how about the medial defect sir have? medial defect we need not worry the cup tm would be supported by the superior and inferior and the anterior and the posterior wall so medial we would have left it like that well, the ct scan was really short the other was okay yes sir the anterior column posterior column and the superiorly there was a little defect which was filled with the tantalum augments there so, Yes, sir. This was the initial cups. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then you are ninety eighty nine, sir. Thank you, sir.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Saurabh. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Anup Khare for the next uh, case presentation. Thank you, organizers, for giving me this opportunity. My present uh, presentation is on selection of implant surgical technique in 16 months old, unrelated absolute fracture, neck and the shaft of the femur in a young adult. The primary surgeon managed this case by putting an interlocking nail for the shaft of the femur and a mesa nail screw fixation technique for the fracture neck of the femur and did grafting also in between with this all field. Could be because of improper selection of implant and of very oblique and unstable nature of the fracture, which resulted in shortening, sorry, shortening more than three inches, severe pain in the knee on the slight movement, and he was bedridden for last 16 months, this young man. My surgical implanting was total knee replacement with a stabilization of the fracture, shaft fever, and bone grafting. Infection was ruled out. CT scan hip showed degeneration and destruction of the femoral head. Considering the age of the patient, long stem THR was not considered, and I planned surgery in two stages. The first stage, implant removed, fractures shaft exposed in ends nibbled well, fractures stabilized by retrograde tenable nail, and macro motion observed at the fracture site, as you can see in this video. We can observe the micro motion, the fracture site. So decided to put. Yeah. It's not working. It's not. It's not going ahead. Anyone? Yes. इसके पीछे इसके पीछे है ये वाला नहीं है ये वाली प्रेजेंटेशन नहीं है इसके पीछे जो फोल्डर है उसमें दिस वन ये वाली है यस या आई एम जस्ट गोइंग हेड And then uh, decided to put the 4.5 DCP plate as a derotation plate using unicortical screws and put the bone graft excised from the uh, patient's head and put the semen spacer also in this case because you just believe me, putting the semen, uh, semen spacer, I had to work very hard because all the abductors are very much contracted. We just to maintain the limb length and the abductor uh, lower tension. Second stage after 12 weeks, infection ruled out. Unit at the fetish tumor satisfactory. CT scan has been done to find out the available proximal membrane space for the process stem. And you can appreciate it, it was about 16, uh, 263 millimeters. So, seeing the, considering the available length in the proximal femoral canal and comfortable gap to pull in the stress riser, trilog short stem was used. You can appreciate this is a six six follow of the patient. Good consolidation of the fracture, cup and the stem is excellent. And this is one year follow up for the same patient. You can appreciate there is no thinking of the stem at all. And the fracture is consolidated. He has gone back to his colleagues as an engineering student, doing his job well. My observation is improper stabilization of the fracture caused such a drastic complication in the simple solution. Doesn't lose the knee, neck femur fracture. Probably because of short x ray and then use the medicine technique. My solution is always have x ray pelvis when you get a case of fetish shock for the female. Thank you very much. Dr. Khare, do you think you could have done this surgery in a single stage also? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, why I didn't do it in a single stage? Because I have to do a proper how much my canal is left, what type of stem I have to use it, and you have to prevent the stress riser also. 
So I decided doing the two thing. The second question point is that he was bedridden for the last 16 months. I don't want to take any, any chance of infection, etc. Because it would have been long surgery. A proper planning was very important for the success of this surgery as I got in this case. Uh, good presentation, Dr. Karit. Thank you. You said uh, you considered two-stage procedure yeah. because of the age of the patient. No, no, not age of the patient. I didn't plan for the long stem THR because of the age of the patient. Well, why not? Uncemented THR. Because long if you if you need revision of the some time, what you will do? If you have long stem in the primary stage, you want to revise it after a certain age, what you will do? It will be troublesome. Uh, what did you do to prevent this lecture subsequently now? Yeah. Continue for How old is he now? He is now 33 years old. What are the chances that he will develop a stress fracture at the next stage? Uh, luckily, you following your plan, we actually have yeah, a plan. Yeah, yeah. Just one. Uh, luckily, till today, today uh, means uh, I saw him yesterday only. It is more than one year now because I did in July 20. July 21 is a one year, no more than one year. He is doing quite well. I got an x ray done. See the good. Cortex shadow in the X-ray. If this happened, then we'll see. Ah, yeah. Everything has a problem. Yeah, yeah I agree with this you. One. Yeah, we can't be sure. Could have been done. That would have its own problem. Yeah. This kind of problem. Yeah, of course, I agree with you. One has to weigh the pros and cons ultimately. But yeah. if you put it is, it's fine. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gray. We have the inauguration starting in the general time in the next 10 minutes. Uh, that is just below this uh, conference hall. So all of us should move from the next 5 to 7 minutes. We have two more presentations left. Both the presentations are online virtually because both the presenters could not come. So we'll start with Dr. Amrit Gray. Uh, can you connect the Zoom link? Uh, thank you, sir, for allowing me the virtual presentation. Am I audible, sir? Uh, respected jury and uh, uh, Dr. Malotra for allowing me this. Uh, my case is a fracture of the uh, pathological fracture of the shaft of the femur. The, this angle bait was done around uh, 40 years ago in this lady, 65 years old female, uh, 110 kg. She is diabetic, sedentary, hypertensive. She also has subsequent hip arthritis in the same hip joint. She had a pathological fracture uh, below the plate. So the problem with us was, was the, to do this as a single stage or a two stage. Uh, this lady agreed to only a single stage surgery and not for a revision hip surgery and followed by total hip replacement, which had been an easier part. She's very osteoporotic. The angle blade plate is on the posterior part. Severe osteoporosis. We had the problem the implant removal can cause shattering of this piece of bone prevention of fracture propagation, so use prophylactic, prophylactic cabling. And the problem with uh, was femoral nailing. So we uh, did a pre-operative planning in which we pla attempted the astabulum, the place where we had to do the proximal reaming and the distal, we need two cortical diameters around to uh, go distal to have a good fit of the stem. We also templated the diameter that we would be requiring. The problem was with the reaming part of the uh, surgery because the both the fracture fragments were a separate uh, entity this after the uh, removal of the implant and the neck cut this fragment was uh, basically uh, floating in between and uh, reaming and doing a floating and trying a trial reduction was very difficult so we did revised a way in which we tied a 4.5 m lcp fixed it with two wires one was inside as a prophylactic one was on the top and these uh, was done to do the case. The canal was reamed and the solution stem was put. This was a prophylactic cable which was put to prevent the shattering of the proximal fragment. And this was the screw hose left after the reaming. This was a prophylactic cable which was done to prevent the fracture from propagating downstairs. It has a good fit and uh, the balance was fine. And the plate and the uh, prophylactic and the uh, temporary cables were removed after the surgery. And uh, this is the pre -op post op video after three months. She's able to ambulate, it's a slight limb, but without any support. 
the problem with this patient is after the surgery she never turned up for any x ray and she refused to get any x ray even go to the hospital for getting a check up so i have a follow up uh, videos at 10 years and she is doing fine at uh, now she is uh, lost weight and is able to ambulate easily the limp is still continuing uh, with the lady sir take home messages uh, one stage surgery in fracture patient is difficult because of mo the moving bone fragments we have to preferably do a two stage surgery so that we can fix the bone in one and do the surgery for total hip replacement in the other i have tried it with vestibular fracture femoral fractures and would always advise a two stage surgery until unless the patient is bent upon one surgery uh, we will need some kind of provisional fixation whether in the form of a lcp uh, with cables or some kind to stabilize the fracture so we can easily put our vestibular and femoral components in place prophylactic cabling should be done because these uh, patients are very osteoporotic and we can have uh, propagation of fractures and fracture stability should also be a point in total hip osteoplasty so it as uh, allow them early weight bearing sir thank you for your attention sir thank you uh, i think in this case your plan was to do a distal uh, fixation stem yes so, sir uh, various available options uh, where did you decide to choose solution stem i just want to know did you have the other options or you had the this one only as the option no sir we had all options because there was no previous implant solution is a good stem with a good fit it is a uh, uh, well, i think in the lateral view in the lateral view i found the distal canal was very very wide Yes, sir. Uh, osteoporotic. So sometimes there is a difficulty there. The diameter stems also available now. So this yes, was okay sir. in the templating. You found that this was. Uh, so we templated it. Where is the micro motion? Where is the micro motion taking place? Yes, sir. But uh, I did not wanted to use a cemented stem because cement. It's not uh, cement. I am talking amongst the non-cemented distal fixations. A uh, Wagner would have been there, and uh, distal locking stem would also have been good options. but uh, i was comfortable yeah. with the solution stem sir so you i used to been stem. doing this stem that is why you did it yes i have done wagner also but i am more comfortable with this stem sir did you ever feel the need of putting some bone graft or a stud graft because bone was osteoporotic and there were stressizers because of the screw holes sir i decided i i had an allograft with me available but because the stem fixation was good there was i put the reaming bone graft uh, in the fracture i i had put the, the uh, bone graft which i got from the reaming from the distal canal uh, at the fracture site the, uh, it was matching well so i did not need any further graft sir uh, am i audible sir Thank you. Sir, we are the last student for the for the day today. Uh, Dr. Kalai Van and Kaniyan will be again joining this uh, virtually. Uh, after this, we will all of us will have to proceed for the inauguration ceremony, which is happening downstairs. So. Good morning, everyone. So, are you able to see my screen? Am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. Please start. Sir. Yeah, my present. Yes. Sir. So January 2016, a 32-year-old lady presented with pathological factor of proximal femur. The biopsy confirmed brain cell tumor. The proximal femur was resected and reconstructed with a distal fitting uncemented femoral stem of uh, Indian made Indus stem 200 into 16 with a bipolar. Investigations ruled out distant metastasis and finally the uh, pathology report confirmed the same. In August 2019, three years following the primary surgery, the lady presented with severe groin pain, not able to bear weight, uh, daily uh, activities. X-ray revealed bipolar head dissociation, erosion of the osteoblast socket, and loosening of the femoral fossae. The blood parameters ruled out infection. She was planned for reconstruction surgery using a further or longer distal fitting stem and the osteoblast reconstruction. In September 2019, they attempted a revision with a further more longer stem. There was a complete metallosis intraoperatively all around with no signs of infection and an unstable stem. The maximum stem available with that particular design was 16 into 250. They found it inadequate and hence a decision of cementing was made. Due to the lack of anatomical landmarks and coordination, the surgeon placed in an abnormal version and was not able to ready. The wound was cloned and planned to come back after three days with adequate preoperative planning. A biopsy was sent out to rule out the recurrent GCT and microbiology sample to rule out the infection. 
So the present thing it said the challenges to me was the extraction of the long stem of around like 250 into 16, preservation of the femoral bone as much as possible as a lady is only 35 year old and conversion into total hip replacement. We I wanted to have an idea of how, how was the bone loss in the osteopathic component, whether we should have any additional jumbo cup concept or no argument. There, and reduce the risk of PGA for periprosophy joint infection and getting fixation with the available femoral stem as it is done in a rural setup. And also, we should think of once this fails, we will land up in a total femur replacement. With the surgeon, I was able to get that there was no osteoplast bone loss. Femur was in retrocession as seen in the x ray. Extensive of continuity was maintained. There was no sense of infection. And the bone quality was a decent enough. So uh, we know the both classification of zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four. And uh, now the challenges are the re revision of the zone. 3A and the 3B, where we are going to deal with uh, removing the long, already done long uh, distal fitting stems, either cemented or uncemented, uh, to into uh, uh, another reconstruction. So these are the examples where we do the ETO and extended ETO. And uh, in this, uh, we also have experience with the reef. So for this particular case, I had the backup of reef as well as the long available Wagner stem as well as the solution stem. And uh, we wanted to have the medial continuity impact and uh, we plan for a lateral opening. Uh, so minimal bone loss and uh, with the episiotomy was planned for conditions where ETO is inappropriate and epi episiotomy is like inadequate. The patient left lateral position, routine posterior approach via all scar, take flap raise and abduct a continuity with a small GT was preserved. Extensive metallosis, but there was no frankness, old, all metal was for removal. The recent femoral stem was well fit with the good cement metal all around. Taking in consideration of our engage and the long femoral process, cement metal, the idea of ETO is not uh, is not Practically possible here. Initially, an episiotomy was done with an oscillating serve, but it didn't interrupt the radio compressive force of the bone along with the cement metal and the same. But the lateral episiotomy did not reduce the type. But hence, a wedge episiotomy of about 5, five mm to less than 1 centimeter was done in the lateral aspect, increasing the exposure. And whatever with the available implants in the rural setup, we were able to remove the cement metal all around and preserve the host bone. The exposure was allowed to MMK where a little bit flexible oxygen were available. The previous uncemented stem of 250 into 16 was uh, removed. The wound was washed with the HRI PJ cocktail of hydrogen peroxide, betadine, vancomycin, uh, even though we can, there is chances of some PJ, along a uh, long 305 into 18 mm, which is the uh, available one of Wagner revision, was placed with adequate axial and rotational stability. The long stem, wider than expected, was passed, anterior femoral bowing, augmenting the axial fit, and the Wagner fin still free in getting much needed rotational stability. The osteoblast occurred, uh, there was no much loss, and uh, her uh, native size was around like 44, but a 48 uh, cup was placed in the concept with Dumbo cup concept, and a posterior lip was used with a 32 head, so it uh, with a good function. The width of the bone was kept back in the lateral border and uh, filled and uh, fixed with the 5 bone wires. Intraoperative histopathology sampling did not show any evidence of dental electrons and the uh, input. Abductor continuity was a decent good, and we had a backup of mesh. And uh, the tendon mark procedure of augmenting the GMAX to the medius was done. Three year protocol, the patient was kept in a non wearing for a period of around three months and also started on calcium supplements. And then the complete loading was started at the end of fourth month. But a uh, bedside exercise was made sure and the quadriceps power was maintained. The patient is in regular follow up. <laughs> follow -up. So these are some of the tips and tricks. And these are the lessons. And this is the take home message. <laughs> See, I understand. Yes, I understand that uh, this uh, was done for a GCT which was resected a uh, few years back. Okay. Yes, sir. And the proximal part of the cemented bipolar was totally unsupported. Yes, sir. So I find it a little difficult to understand why was it so difficult? The whole stem was out. The second was uh, that the dislocation took place three years after the primary surgery. Yes, what was the cause of that dislocation? I think I read somewhere in your this thing that it was because of retroversion of the stem. So that yes, means sir. the stem must have rotated in and it would have been already been loose. So why did you have to resort to such a surgery no, which could no. have put the whole femur at a risk? No, sir. This, this is, is what the, I feel. The, uh, this is the x-ray which was done in the th after three years, which showed, as you said, the stem was quite quite loose. But the following surgeon. They removed the stem and refixed it with a good cement metal all around. The X-ray is not showing the cement. Now it is not an uncemented in the stem. It is an uncemented in the stem with a good cement metal, which you have placed almost close to the distal femur. 
The challenge was like to remove the cement mantle without disturbing the bone. And already the, uh, this is the particular bone loss is there. And this amount of uh, stem is inside. And uh, furthermore, cement mantle was inside. So only you were left with the, literally the fondants were like uh, free from any implant, whether either implant or the cement. And uh, since the bone was very thin and it was very good cementation they did, so it was uh, difficult to find the uh, a pathway between the cement and the both bone and to remove the cement. So the challenge was here to cement all the cement metal right from the middle third of the femur to the distal one third of the femur. So uh, I would request all of you to please proceed for the presentation uh, of the conference, which is happening right downstairs in the zone that will be The sessions after the inauguration will uh, happen in the auditorium itself, and the results for both the case presentations will also be declared during the inauguration. Please proceed. And the lunch will be served after the inauguration. दूसरे कार्ड में थोड़ी सी हुई है पहला कार्ड है हाँ इसी में कर दे कॉपी बैग भिजवा दी मेरा वाला यार नीचे बैग भिजवा दी नीचे रख दे रहे कहीं पर हाँ हाँ वो अभी ला रहा है निकाल के वो बहुत अरे खुला तो नहीं निकाल दे यार उसमें निकाल के ला रहा है बात कर रहा है वही है ये किस चीज की है ये किस चीज की है ये तो जूम की लिए ना ये तो सिर्फ बांध रखी थी ना जूम के साथ ये तो जूम के लिए है ना ये साथ में दोनों बांध रखी है कल कल यही तो हुई थी यार ये थी थी यार और फूट गए ये देखो ना बांध रखी है तुमने ईपी केबल के साथ ये तो ये नहीं नहीं ये वाला नहीं ये वाला कल दी तो निकल गया अंदर ये वाला पूछ रहा है वो नहीं आ रहा है तेरे जूम वाला ये तो सटीक करने डायरेक्ट दे दिया फिर उसके वाले वो देगा ना फिर पता नहीं भाई अरे टाइप सी पड़ी होगी क्या बने आप देना 
ఇంకా నాకు తప్పు నా తాబు ఓటర్ నాకు టైప్ సి కేవలేనా దేకి త్రిపుడ డోమని అరే ఓంకుతు దే ఓంకుతు ఓంకుతు చేయ యా ఇక్కడొచ్చిన ఓగింది అరే ఏస్ కా మోస్మెన్ టైప్ సి కేవలే కరా కరా పతే ఇక్కడ ఇక్కడ తోయ జోతి అవి
national and international level. His, he is currently the executive director of the Inclined Trust International and also serves as the chairman of the COVID-19 working group of the National Advisory Group of Immunization. In this capacity, he has been instrumental in helping India achieve the incredible feat of being the first country to record 100 crore vaccinations. I request our organizing secretary, Professor Vivek Trikha, to escort our guest of honor to the dais and felicitate him with a small gift as a token of our appreciation. We are elated to have in our midst our patron and the director of AIMS, New Delhi, Professor Randeep Guleria. As a torchbearer of academics and research in medical science, we never have to look beyond him for inspiration. Thank you, sir, for your constant support and guidance throughout the conception and organization of this mega event. I request Dr. Bhavuk Garg to escort Professor Guleria to the dais and felicitate him with a small gift as a token of our appreciation. On behalf of the organizing team and the Department of Orthopedics, I now request our co-organizing secretaries, Dr. Vikrant Manas and Dr. Deepak Gautam, to felicitate our organizing chairperson, Professor Rajesh Malhotra, and organizing secretary, Professor Vivek Trekha, with a small gift as a token of our appreciation. We commence this convention of learning and exchange of wisdom by revering the goddess of learning with a Saraswati Vanna. Saraswati Namostu De Amba Shri Saraswati Namostu De Maradeva De Shri Vati Gauri Vati Guru Guha Vinu Devi Devate Shri Saraswati Namostu De Vasana Traya Vivarchita Varamuni Vandita Murti Vasana Traya Vivarchita Varamuni Vandita Murti Vasavatya Kila Nirachara Varavitarana Bahu Kirti Thara Hasiyudha Mugam Buruve At Pudha Charanam Buruve Hasiyudha Mugam Buruve At Pudha Charanam Buruve Sansara Vidya Pade Sagala Mandra Akshara Guhe Sansara Vidya Pade Sagala Mandra Akshara Guhe Shri Saraswati Namostu De Amba Shri Saraswati Namostu De Varadhe Vate Shri Pati Gauri Pati Guru Guha Vinu Devi Diyu Pate Shri Saraswati Namostu De Hey. 
we thank the team from nursing college aims for this beautiful rendition of the prayer i now invite our organizing chairman professor rajesh malhotra to de deliver the welcome address and provide an insight into what is on offer over the next day and a half at this conference ceo niti ayog shri amitabh kanchi my senior mentor guide and teacher Dr. N. K. Arora, our patron, Professor Randeep Guleria, Director of Aims, my uh, organizing secretary, Professor Vivek Trikha, my entire org organizing team, Professor Bhan, who's been my teacher and mentor, and who was the one who first conceived of this idea of uh, current concepts in arthroplasty more than two decades ago. Other senior teachers, faculty members, uh, Professor Andre Ferreira from France. um all the uh, delegates ladies and gentlemen i welcome you all and it's a matter of great proud privilege for us to have such leaders among us so we thought of you know presenting the entire faculty with a book which is essentially motivational and i must add here that we look forward to some motivational uh, words from the uh, eminent leaders we have on the dais today um we'll just showcase what we are going to do this because we know that acquiring knowledge is not enough studying is not enough because to acquire wisdom you have to observe and it is in this spirit that we organize this uh, event with multiple different activities including the live surgeries and uh, and the discussions and uh, didactic lectures i'm grateful to our chief guest as well as guest of honor for having taken time out they are the busiest of the people in the country and i'm going to talk later something about our department and i must put it on record here that the kind of unflinching support which the department of orthopedics has got from professor randeep guleria is unparalleled whatever we have achieved today is thanks to his patronage and his guidance i think we all must give him a big hand so this is the event now we have 10 international faculty members and i profusely want to thank the american faculty who were up um, at uh, midnight past midnight this morning when they gave their lectures live and showed their real life surgeries we are, we have one uh, foreign faculty like i said who's uh, here to participate in person we have 30 national faculty members and we have one cadaver workshop the cadaver workshop this is very exclusive because it is for the first time in india that a cadaveric workshop on direct anterior approach has been held and not only that it was really heartening to see how well the delegates could practice on the cadavers and it didn't appear as if they were doing it for the first time and it was immensely popular and they were all extremely gratified and they were all thankful and this is actually one of the latest advances uh, which is becoming popular all over the world and uh, uh, we'll talk about a little bit more later but we had foreign faculty speak about direct anterior approach to the hip this morning we had a whole session and a cadaver course dedicated to it uh, we had for the first time an award winning session for the best case presentation and the prizes will be announced and uh, given out by the chief guest and then because we are trying to keep uh, track with the uh, technology um, and we always try to put the public money where it is used best we have um, a, a, a de debate session in the afternoon on who move my robot where all the international companies which are marketing robots are going to argue and convince why their robot is best and what features they have which are exclusive and better than others um once again i want to welcome dr andre ferreira and um, i would also want to tell you that because of this uh, covid thing we have set up various centers across the country where this is being uh, the feed is going live for people to art participate and uh, uh, with these words i want once again welcome you all thank you very much for being here and i would now like to invite all the dignitaries to lamp uh, uh, light the lamp
professor rajesh malhotra the head of the department of orthopedics will now share the achievements of our department good afternoon once again uh, it gives me great pleasure to just quickly take you through the journey which the department has traversed in so many years particularly because the makers of the department like dr bhan are already here we have been voted the best orthopedic department uh, in the country for more than a decade now continuously and last two years had uh, tried to paralyze us so did it really uh, manage to stop us well we continue to uh, have contribute to patient care through telemedicine we continue to do trauma and the cancer surgeries people who would have died if we had not operated in time so surgery was not stopped and then we were able to help a lot of patients through the um, the the uh, scheme by the uh, respectable prime minister of the pmj and i'll speak more about it and uh, these are the various surgeries uh, which patients could who those who could not afford in the midst of pandemic they could get free implant and they could get these surgeries and our work on bone tumors during pandemic was published uh, we manage manpower resources our director will vouch for it orthopedics very actively the residents and faculty participated in the care of uh, the covid uh, uh, patients in the trauma center but we also managed the res residents to take care of the other responsibility something the protocols of which were published in the international journal so these are our residents and teams who were there to participate in the covid care all the time we continue to take exams so it was innovative and in may 2020 we first time we conducted the ms exams we had to be very innovative and then when we took the exam we actually published it to serve as a guide for the rest of the country to uh, manage these exams so we had simulated exams without patients because we were in the uh, at the top of the pandemic we uh, took uh, seminars to webinars we uh, they kept on um, teaching people throughout this pandemic when they were stuck at home um, we continued the research work we had more than two dozen articles pub published during the pandemic and these are the um, the uh, uh, various uh, um, high quality articles which were published uh, in the journal some of them are very really high index journals so we were actually uh, not sitting idle we were actually in the front for the public education uh, trying to tell people all about from back ache to covid to vitamin d to uh, to how to take uh, care of the covid and keep themselves and others around them safe and then i must make uh, uh, a mention here ever since the prime minister um, uh, uh, pradhan mantri jan aayog uh, yojana was started the department has operated on more than 6000 patients uh, with the uh, who are the beneficiaries of the aishman bharat scheme and in the last year and a half during the pandemic alone we were able to do joint replacement on 427 patients uh, through this scheme so not only we kept on working but we kept on giving the benefit of the these schemes to the patients who were reporting uh, to us so uh, another few first ones in india we were the first ones to do the first uh, day care joint replacement uh, surgery in india which was a hip replacement patient he was very emotional when he was about to leave uh, we have operated through a bikini incision so that the women in india who are young and um, and don't want their scar to uh, disfigure them they actually can undergo a hip replacement through a bikini incision uh during the uh, covid pandemic we used this digital rehab so that the patient doesn't have to visit the hospital they had these trackers we could actually see on our monitor in the department how how uh, well the rehabilitation is going and what the movements they have achieved we have uh, the uh, the biggest and the most premier bone bank in india which has been running for more than uh, two decades and uh, we have done a lot of very innovative work uh in in india including replacement of all the four joints in one go in a patient who was bedridden for more than 10 years and since then we have done another seven of these the surgery on the shortest man in india for hip replacement the metal allergy is the aims is the only center where metal allergy for joint replacement is diagnosed and treated the facility is not available anywhere else in india and then the not only we have done this work with allografts and uh, bone banking in india we have been hand holding all the other institutions and guiding them all over the india to set up their bone banks the aims was also the first uh, center in the country to have 3d printed uh, implant which was actually uh, uh, manufactured and put in a patient who has severe deficiency and the patient is completed nearly 3 years and is doing well 
we have been working a lot with the engineers in the iit iit and we have been telling them to devise robots and the navigation and the all the other aids which we need for orthopedics this is a flexmo crutch which has won several international awards which has been developed as a collaboration between aims and iit delhi we have a 3d printing facility which actually makes the surgery very safe and very accurate so in a very severely deformed spine you can actually uh, uh, fabricate all the segments and then we also can make guides so that which can guide us to the correct place in the bone so on in the patient you just have to put those guides and just drill and it works very well we have the best gate uh, lab in the country and which has got 12 video cameras and we have done a lot of research which has been published in peer review journal uh, based on the findings in the gate lab we have the best world class operation theater again thanks to our director we had to struggle a lot uh, for uh, making room for these but they are uh, whoever visits them realizes that these are the best uh, operation theaters we have oam2 which is the latest version so we have been pampered so that we can give the best quality life to the uh, patients this is the eos imaging which is the only one available in india and there are only less than a dozen all over the world which can take x rays of the patient sitting in standing position front and side in less than 20 seconds and it can help us plan everything on the spinal deformities in the joints we have been routinely doing navigation to increase accuracy of our joint replacements and we have everything which is needs i must say that uh, of course we are still looking for the best robot for joint replacement but we have a robot for uh, spine surgery and we have been able to do the most uh, difficult and challenging cases of spine surgery using these robots um we have high end 3d cdc arm we have been participating in the endeavor by uh, our director to educate people with the help of public uh, health lectures as well as by cyclathons and marathons we have been trying to teach our nurses uh, in the geriatric nursing we have actually uh, started this uh, subsidiary of fragility fracture network which is global just to reduce the burden of the uh, these fractures in india and uh, these are based on four pillars taking care of the patient rehabilitation secondary fracture prevention as well as creation of the national uh, interdisciplinary alliance so we have been participant of all the global calls for action which have been uh, given out we have set up the sathi and sahara which is actually Uh, uh, save the hip initiative in order to prevent the uh, fractures uh, in the patients we have a smart bell smart sir which can teach the patients how to avoid fall and this is our website of uh, ffn india we have developed an app for spine patients in the india where they can actually upload their information in the, in the app or they can upload their x-rays and even if they are from remote corners of the country we can actually track them here and call them for the uh, follow up whenever it is required so i want to summarize by saying there are a few challenges trauma everybody knows but what people are not realizing is that we are becoming an aging society and 3/4 of the expense on the care of people above 75 years is on uh, on the uh, orthopedic problems so we have issues with they needing joint replacement getting fragility fractures so the fragile bones and osteoporosis is going to be a big problem the other two issues where we are facing challenges is the spine deformities in children and tumors which present to us very late and then we are not able to accommodate them as we would like to those are the challenges which we are facing we try to do our best but if uh, you know we could be helped in these things it would really be a great uh, help for us i thank you all for your attention uh thank you sir for wonderfully showcasing our achievements I now invite our patron and the director of AIMS, Professor Randeep Guleria, to grace this occasion by saying a few words. Thank you. Good afternoon. Shri Amitabh Khan ji, CEO, Niti Aayog, Government of India. Professor N K Arora, Executive Director, Inclin Trust, and Chairman of the COVID-19 Working Group of Intagi. Professor Rajesh Malhotra, Head of the Department and Chief of Trauma Center. Dr. Bahan, former Head Department of Orthopedics. Professor Vivek Rekha. Dr. Andre, who's come all the way physically, international and national. faculty delegates my faculty colleagues ladies and gentlemen first of all let me take this opportunity to really congratulate the department of orthopedics not only for 
holding this current concept on arthroplasty 2021 but for the excellent work that they've been doing you just had a glimpse of the type of work the department is doing and how they are looking at cutting edge technology to really provide the best care for the patients this is something which has really put the department not only at a national level at being the top but at an international level and as a part of that they continue with education in the form of this current concept of orthoplasty which is a conference which is i think very popular among orthopedicians and has been going on for many years uh, unfortunately last year because of the pandemic it was held in a virtual mode seeing the crowd today not only inside but the hall stalls outside makes you feel that you're all covid is almost over and we're almost coming back to a pre covid era uh, let's keep our fingers crossed and I hope we still continue to have some degree of uh, caution because things are still uncertain. Uh, the theme of this year's conference is also very, very important, precise, prompt and perfect. And I think that is something which is uh, ideal for an orthopedician in terms of being precise, prompt in terms of the treatment and perfect in terms of being able to provide care whether it's using robotic surgery or other techniques this conference is also unique because as was mentioned they had a cadaveric workshop yesterday and this is something which is unique very few institutes are able to do that and aims is one which does this regularly uh, and it has become very popular because it really gives you a hands-on experience as far as surgery is concerned and they this time the workshop was looking at a direct interior approach for hip replacement uh, and as was shown in the pictures, it's, a very, it's very, very popular. The conference also has multiple other sessions of live surgeries, recorded surgeries, didactic lectures, a lot of interactions and panel discussions. The debate that was mentioned on which robo is better as compared to the other. So I'm sure that the delegates are going to have a great time. The last 20 months have been very challenging for us. Uh, We've been through one of the biggest uh, pandemics uh, that we've seen and or we will ever see in our lifetime. And it has been a challenge for the Institute also. And as was mentioned, we really made sure that patient care, academic activities and research did not suffer. We tried our best and became innovative in patient care. Very aggressive teleconsultation, telemedicine was started. Uh, this was uh, very successful, not only in terms of providing care to COVID patients who were in home isolation, but even to our chronic patients who were scared to come to the hospital and could be advised on by using teleconsultations. As was done in the Department of Orthopedics, many departments actually started doing that and many of our faculty started doing this. We started a center, a contact center in our guest house which was run 24 seven by faculty and our residents and undergraduate students to provide care and support to not only physicians, but even the lay public. And uh, it was put in the guest house so that the faculty and residents could stay there if need be and take calls around the clock in providing any care that was required. A lot of other activities, activities were done. We had the center of excellence that we created in various states. Uh, our grand rounds, which were a great success as a national grand launch, we had international faculty for that also. The EICUs that we did, uh, I think that was also a great success, a lot of learning. Uh, we probably, I myself probably interacted in more than 500 hospitals across the country that were managing COVID patients. And we were able to really provide care to them in terms of treatment strategies, because this was a new infection and people really were not sure how to treat them. And we saw varied, varied types of treatment. One hospital, the only treatment they was give, giving was methylene blue as a form of treatment for COVID. So there was a lot of uh, treatment which was being given because people were not really clear as to what treatment is ideal for this new infection and, and all sorts of things were being tried. I must say that uh, as far as this Department of Orthopedics is concerned, they really also continued in all these activities, including research. Uh, more than 50 papers were published by the department and as an uh, institute we have published more than 750 papers during the last 18 months on COVID research. Many of it has been because of the fact that we started an intramural grant for research on COVID 
and we gave some seed money to our faculty to do research on COVID rather than waiting for extramural grants to come because that was going to take some time. Also, we have collaborations with IIT Delhi, THSTI, IGIB, and we use this opportunity to really develop research projects with these institutes. And again, we have more than 50 projects with IIT Delhi looking at new innovations and the Department of Orthopedics is also actively involved in that so that we can really start working and looking at how we can make our physicians, our scientists, entrepreneurs, how can they really interact with not only engineers, computer scientists, but industry to start new products and take it to a new level. And I must say that this is also being done by the Department for Orthopedics. So I'd like to really congratulate the department for the excellent work they're doing. Welcome all the delegates to this conference and really wish them the very best. I'm sure you'll have a very educative and interactive session. We haven't had a lot of social interactions for a long time, but this is the beginning, I think, of such activities. We see a lot of uh, audience, both physically, and I'm sure there will be virtual audience also. And I see a lot of crowd outside also. So all the best. And uh, uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for always guiding us and helping this institute and our department achieve new heights. I now invite our guest of honor, Professor N.K. Arora, to address this convention. Respected uh, Abhitab Kanchi. Randeep Guleria and Rajesh Malhotra, dear friends, the faculty and uh, the delegates. Uh, coming back to Ames is, uh, is always uh, not only a great pleasure, but it's an honor that coming back to, to my alma mater, I was, I joined here in 71, but it looks like yesterday and yesterday Last evening, I was interacting with some of the undergraduates and one feels so young as well as so nice that uh, things have shaped much, changed for better. A lot of things have happened. I must also share with you that uh, uh, I am associated with Ames Patna and Ames Deoghar. Patna is around 10 years old. Ames Deoghar is just two years old. And I realize that AIMS is a, is a philosophy and concept. It's not just buildings. I think the whole ecosystem which makes AIMS, AIMS, and that is what is being propagated that when we have these 22 AIMS, we should see them as an extension of this ecosystem across the country. And I was just mentioning to Amitabhji, that we should see that each aims takes care of at least one state around them and national aims this delhi is kind of an overarching role the whole concept is that we are in a new era this is a much more confident india and i think last 22 months have changed us forever I think India is one of the best example of how a tragedy can be converted in an opportunity and the whole environment can be made so self-confident. When I look at this workshop, which is being held for last two weeks, uh, two, two decades, I see it a primarily a step towards implementation science. I will divert a little bit. We did a implementation research in Palwal district, which is one of the least developed districts in the country, just outside Delhi. Palwal and Nu are very, their development indicators, particularly health indicators are the one of the lowest. And we took up the challenge how newborn 
care can be improved within the existing uh, setup, whatever the resources are there, be it manpower, be it infrastructure or drugs or supplies. Over last 15 years, since 2005, when National Rural Health Mission came and then National Health Mission, supplies are no more problem in public sector. Something else we found missing. We found that newborns and young infants below six months were not even touched by our primary health care doctors and ANMs and nurses who have underground series of trainings. Basically, that confidence to touch and see and do. The only thing we did, we didn't ask for any additional staff. The only thing we did was that the district pediatrician or even in private, whatever pediatricians were available, they were made to interact with the medical officer in PSC and CSC. And after writing, assessing three or four young infants and writing prescription, they become sick, so confident that in 12 months, neonatal mortality decreased by 20%. Now, I, I, I'm sure orthopedicians would know that, but in the under five mortality, 75% mortality is in the first one month of life. So this, what was done? Simple mentoring and passing on the skill and confidence. I see such workshop and meeting primarily now a mode of skill transfer. We have technology access is much simpler now. We, we can get with money. We can access whatever equipment is required. And when we have centers like AIMS, which as uh, Rajesh has shown us, the state of art equipment is there. They are practicing it. The whole, in addition to that, I was just asking, I understand there are 170 participants in that. So about 60% are residents and senior residents who are just beginning their career. So we'll say, okay, they are learning. But about 40% individuals, if I look at their collective experience on orthoplasty, you guys have at least a collective experience of 200 to 250,000 patients. Those are dhai lakh marizon ko aap logo ne ilaj kiya hua hai. Now that each individual patient gives a very unique kind of being a clinician myself, I do know each patient brings a new challenge and new experience. To me, it appears that the technology which has been brought in into the country now, which is state of art and with so much of experience, varied experience, I think collectively this whole can become a movement to develop new innovations. And in fact, I would dream that in next 10 years, India should become a global hub of arthroplasty because the kind of varied individuals, varied patients, varied challenges we can see. And we also know how to work within resource constraint environments. I think the best example is last 20 months within whatever constraints we had, we have been able to fulfill most of our objectives. So why can't we do it? And in fact, to me, it appears with the most expensive equipment, we can bring down the cost in a way that they become, they are used more efficiently. New innovations can be done in terms of both designing of new equipments with IITs and others, and also the techniques. So I would think that we have to innovate for perfection on one side, precision on the second side and promptness on the side. So I would say that, that the 
the group present here and as well as in coming years, the whole team should be working for innovation to ultimately bring absolute novel technology so that people should be looking up to us, to India, that orthoplasty seekhniya to Hindustan se jake seekhniya. However, with a caveat that we should allow our innovations for very thorough scientific scrutiny and clinical application. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for those, those, those inspiring words and providing a beautiful context to the work that we do. Next, we move on to the prize distribution ceremony. The best case presentation competition was organized separately for two age group categories, a below 40 age group and an above 40 age group. All the cases were wonderfully presented and we laud the efforts of all the presenters. I now invite our chief guest, uh, Shri Amitabh Kanji, to award the winners in both categories. The prize for best case presentation in below 40 age group category is awarded to Dr. Kartik Patel. The prize for best case presentation in above 40 age group category is awarded to Lieutenant Colonel uh, Saurabh Sharma. I now invite our esteemed chief guest, Shri Amitabh Khan, to deliver the inaugural address. Uh, Dr. N.K. Arora, Dr. Randeer Guleria, Director of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Mr. Rajesh Malhotra, uh, doc Dr. Rajesh Malhotra, who's spearheaded this initiative and uh, Dr. Bhan, who's been the head here earlier, also Dr. Trikha, uh, faculty members from both overseas and within India, distinguished delegates, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first say that I'm truly delighted to be here at this 26th edition of the current concept in arthroplasty. I didn't know that it was the 26th edition, uh, marking nearly four decades of arthroplasty at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And this is really remarkable because four decades have seen a very meteoric rise in the quality and the caseload handled by the arthroplasty subspeciality of the Department of Orthopedics. Uh, I was delighted to see this presentation because I was not aware of the very unique, innovative and the cutting edge work which is being done here using 3D uh, printing, robotics and uh, the partnership that has been forged with uh, IIT and so on. So it's been very, very educative for me. Uh, I am also very delighted that these four decades have seen All India Institute of Medical Sciences emerge as the referral centers for the neediest, the poorest of the poor, as well as some of the most complicated cases from all over the country and even from overseas. And this has been rated as the best orthopedic center in, the, in India year after year. So my congratulations to all of you, because this really demonstrates that All India Institute of Medical Sciences, which has led this war of against COVID, uh, 
has also excelled in a range of other areas and uh, orthopedics is one of them the thrust i'm delighted has been to take care of high of quality care for the poorest of the poor which is very critical because vast segment of our population actually go below the poverty line because of lack of good tertiary care and uh, the pmjy scheme was really designed for that and uh, the large number of ayushman bharat beneficiaries are operated by the department under the pmjy scheme and this gives us very great satisfaction when the scheme was conceptualized by the prime minister it was really to ensure and this is pmjy is the biggest health insurance scheme in the world uh, uh 500 million indians means more than the population of the united states of america europe and mexico put together it also is a totally uh, digital scheme it's paperless and cashless you can be living in bihar you can be moving to tamil nadu and uh, you can carry your uh, digitally it you can get the treatment done and therefore it is a path breaking scheme and uh, in a scheme like this the all india institute of medical sciences its orthopedic department has done some remarkable work uh i was all i'm also delighted that uh, the department has developed technology and infrastructure which can match the best centers in the world uh the fact that all these technologies benefit all the patients who come here without any additional cost to the patient is very very satisfying to me and uh, the department actually has a very eminent faculty and i'm really delighted that you've got uh, a lot of experts here who have worked extremely hard to bring the joint replacement at the center at par with the best centers in the world but more remarkable is that this is being done at a fraction of the cost uh so our future vision i think is uh that the department is collaborating with the indian institute of technology to design implants that can be manufactured locally and are suitable for indian citizens and that is really the key thing that we are able to innovate we are able to do cutting edge technology and we are able to work with technological institutes to be able to create products which are suited for the indian citizens every state of the art technology actually needs to be developed locally and that includes uh navigation machines for computer assisted joint replacement as well as indigenously developed robots that can be made locally used locally and developed locally to benefit our local population our joint replacement surgeons are therefore today from aims are joining hands with engineers to bring this dream a reality i'm also delighted that we've had very eminent international faculty members who have traveled from different parts of the world and a sizable number of uh, experts from america and surgeons have uh, participated in this uh, and i am very uh, i would very very appreciative of their commitment and their participation in this in a conference of this nature uh, there are i am also delighted that there are a number of life and real life demonstration surgeries during the conference giving everybody an unparalleled opportunity to interact in real time with the operating surgeons hone their skills and expand their understanding and knowledge base the department of orthopedics at all india institute of medical sciences uh has been the first department to hold common twice weekly seminars along with the orthopedics departments of other aims and uh, this has been a very very useful exercise the department's bone bank established by the department has also pioneered the science and art of bone banking in india and this is also remarkable the department has been helping institutions all over the country to establish bone banks and this is uh, i think a path breaking work 
Bone banking is invaluable not only in joint replacement, but in tumor surgeries, sports surgeries, as well as in trauma. So I think the department has really gone beyond its classical mandate of patient care, teaching and research to its much larger mission of bringing everyone together and helping other institutions to rise as well. And that is really what Dr. Arora was talking about. He was saying that actually All India Institute of Medical Scientists, uh, institutions, aims in different parts of India must actually start mentoring other institutions. And I think this is what the orthopedic department has done here. It is mentoring other institutions. The digital era has actually brought the whole world together. And actually, my belief is that only those institutions will be able to grow and prosper which are totally digital and which use digital technology. And India is very data rich. It will get more and more data intelligent. And therefore, we'll be using a lot of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the whole world uh, is just a center for exchange of ideas, knowledge and processes, which can help people anywhere in the world. So actually, the orthopedic department in India can use digital technologies to spread its knowledge all over India. And uh, therefore, we've seen the contribution of digital technology amply uh, dis demonstrated during the COVID period also. And AIMS has done this very, very successfully. And I've been very, very appreciative of Dr. Guleria because, and also Dr. Arora because they've been the real communicators during this COVID period, my wife and I have been watching different programs, number of programs during this COVID period just to educate ourselves. And Dr. Goleria's education has been some of the finest, you know, so people all over India have been educated by Dr. Goleria. And that has been very satisfying to me because uh, COVID people had to understand it was a new virus. People didn't know how to how to handle it. And therefore, uh, this kind of spread of education by a leading doctor and especially the head of All India Institute of Medical Sciences has made a huge difference in this country. You know, India is a country of 1.36 billion people and uh, many of them suffer from very significant knee and hip arthritis uh, issues. This is a population which has these challenges. And total knee arthroplasty and total hip arthroplasty are the most widely practiced surgical options for arthritis all over the world. And their application is also rising in India. Now, with this increasing rate of growing and expanding, you know, what we term as the geriatric uh, population and the rising pre prevalence of diseases with diabetic, obesity, uh, all this osteo process all this the demand for joint replacement surgery will keep rising further and further and therefore there is an urgent need to my mind a huge need and there is a vacuum for training surgeons uh, training surgeons from all over the country as well as monitoring the implant usage and the, this contribution will be very very important for the department of orthopedics and i'm really delighted uh, that dr Rajesh Malhotra has taken this initiative. I take this opportunity to congratulate the winners. I wish them many more accolades and recognition. And I would like the, uh, all the participants to use this opportunity to in, enhance their knowledge, skill and attitude, because this is what AIMS gives you this opportunity so that every patient they get in touch with goes home satisfied and grateful. I am really delighted. I'm extremely happy that I came here. Uh, actually, I was finding it very difficult. I had several meetings, but I finally decided to, when I saw the great work, this uh, great work which was being done here, uh, I decided that it's better to cancel everything else and come here and be a part of the unique work which is being done. And I'm, you know, after seeing the presentation, I'm truly satisfied that my afternoon has been well spent because I've gained a lot. I've 
feel greatly inspired by the work being done here and i think it's extremely motivational for me uh, that so much of unique work is being done by the orthopedic department of the all india institute of medical sciences i personally take this opportunity of congratulating dr rajesh malhotra and his entire team of young doctors who've taken this initiative and i wish this conference all success and i wish this department continues to grow and prosper in the days to come thank you so much thank you sir for gracing this occasion with your presence and motivating all of us in our endeavors to make quality healthcare accessible to all professor vivek trikha our organizing secretary will now deliver the vote of thanks respected dignitaries on the dais and of the dais professor bhan our teacher and all the ladies and gentlemen out here who are present here for this inauguration ceremony it's my proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks on the occasion of this first cca which we have done when the covid pandemic started it was really a challenge and sometimes we had a disbelief whether we will be able to do a physical one or not but it has been a very smooth journey for us till now we keep our fingers crossed for that but we hope and there are a lot of people who have been helping us for making this a very smooth journey and i would certainly like to thank all of them from my bottom of my heart but some of them i'll name here if i am not able to name some it's purely my forgetfulness first of all on the behalf of the organizing committee let me thank sincere thanks to our chief guest shri amitabh khan ji who spared his as he said he spared his valuable time from his busy schedule to grace this occasion and has been we are honored to look at and get his words of encouragement for this department and we certainly express our gratitude for the same our guest of honor and especially my teacher during my undergraduate in medical education professor nk arora sir who graciously ex accepted our invitation and his guidance regarding innovation in the latest technologies which we should all involve in our department as well as in our work we will certainly like to follow that sir our director professor guleria who has been always a source of inspiration and guidance and has always motivated us to follow the institute ethos and be the torch bearer for spreading knowledge all over the country as well as the world and that's what we are following and we thank him for gracing this occasion my organ our organizing chairman and my mentor professor malhotra sir that who has been an energetic teacher i should say and the torch bearer and who certainly gave us this belief that we will be able to conduct this physical conference if the conditions permit us and we will be able to showcase what we do best that is spreading the knowledge to all the people in the country the conference depends totally on the faculty and we are really thankful to the international faculty dr andre who has come physically out here and all the other international faculties from various parts of the world who have been contributing online our national faculty who have come from various parts of the country and our local faculties as well for getting and giving us their share of experience and share, exchanging the ideas out here our team has been a wonderful and i would start by saying that the two dynamic co organizers of us dr vikrant and dr deepak gautam they have been the co-organizing secretaries and literally they have done the, all the work out here and we just have to be sitting here and giving the vote of thanks for them i would certainly say that really they really deserve a round of applause from our side sir our department of orthopedics all the faculty colleagues all the residents the i would certainly like to name uh, dr nishank who was our compare and mc out here who has conducted this inaugural ceremony so wonderfully dr hemant dr samad sahil who has been working around the clock i would say and has helped us conduct this conference in a good manner professor dr rajeshwari and the anesthesia team who has given us the anesthesia contribution for the live surgeries the cadaveric workshop professor lalwani and his team they have all contributed the ot staff the secretarial staff of our orthopedics department who has contributed this and will be doing it for the tomorrow as well they are the main workforce 
who have helped us to get this conference done in a smooth manner. I would like to thank the College of Nursing personnel who gave this Saraswati Vandana for us. And now let me see about the audio visual, the audio visual as well as the setting of the stalls, the caterers who have helped us to get all these things done in a proper manner. The auditorial staff, the auditorium staff out here, the horticulture department, the sanitation, the security. In, in fact, it's been a teamwork from all the institute work and people and which has hauled us and I thank all of them from my heart. More, imp more importantly, the pharmaceutical companies, the medical devices and the implant companies who have helped us and contributed wholeheartedly supported us to contribute and conduct this conference. We are very grateful to you. Finally, I would say that all the people who have come here for the inaugural ceremony as well as for the scientific deliberations, you are the key because for everything which we have been doing out here is all for you and nobody else. And we feel that by exchanging our ideas, we will be gaining and doing the benefit to the patients, which is the most important thing which we all are here for. I would like to certainly thank all of us, all the people out here. And if I missed out, I'm so sorry for my forgetfulness. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Before we break for lunch, I request everyone in the hall to please stand up for the national anthem. I now invite all the dignitaries, faculty members, uh, delegates, and other staff members to join us for lunch on the first floor. Please note uh, that the academic sessions after lunch shall continue in this very auditorium at 2 p.m., where we have an interesting debate on surgical robot systems for arthroplasty. Thank you so much. Recording stopped.
called uh, my robot is the best and uh, recording in progress all the four presenters are uh, joining us virtually through zoom and also the clinical case present presenters all the participants can collect the certificates from the registration desk so we'll be starting the event now Uh, Dr. Surya Bhan is also invited to the stage as the moderator for this session. Yes. Hello, friends. I think we are here for the mother of all sessions, Tara. That's what Sadam was saying. Used to say, "Mother of all wars." So this session, as we know, we are going to discuss the future of orthopedic surgery. That is the robotic surgery. And uh, this particular uh, session is going to be open from the Wales by Kim Pendergast. Kim, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, for asking Hello. me to join the meeting can you hear me there i think you are muted can you unmute yourself please kim you are muted could you unmute yourself we can't hear you we can see you but we can't hear you i am unmuted okay got it got it fine we can okay, hear you, you now. Can hear me now yes we are on wonderful thank you so much everyone for asking me to join uh your meeting i uh certainly wish that i was able to travel there uh in person but maybe next time Today, I um, have been asked to speak to you about the uh, Velus robotic assisted solution. And it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to speak to you today about Velus. It's been certainly um, coming for a while and uh, we're all incredibly excited to have it, uh, have it in our hands over here in Australia. I'm the Senior Director of Joint Reconstruction based out of Sydney, Australia. I've worked in orthopaedics uh, industry for uh, a little over 20 years and um, I run the, um, both the, the Joint Reconstruction and uh, we're, we're obviously delighted to have uh, Bellis um, landing on our shores. I wanted to start today by showing you uh, a, a video of Velus in action because um, I'm sure that you'll find it incredibly exciting and hopefully it will give you a little bit of context about what I'm going to talk to uh, to follow. So here we are. Excuse me, Kim. Uh, you have 10 minutes to present the views on this particular computer, right? Then you will get yes. three minutes for the rebuttal later on. You can start now, please. Thank you. We have shown to be cumbersome, costly, and complicated solutions. But now, Diffuse Synthes is bringing you the next chapter in robotics. Simplicity with the Bellis Robotic Assistant Solution, providing you with valuable insights, versatile execution, and verified performance, designed to deliver efficiency and to optimize patient outcomes. Advanced technology that provides gap balance data to help visualize and predict resulting joint stability. Taking insights and personalization to the next level using data captured during natural joint assessment, pro adjust planning software, and AccuBalance stability graph to provide gap balancing data. A streamlined, integrated design to give surgeons the control they're used to while optimizing daily OR flow. Designed with you in mind, the Velus Robotic Assistive Solution features natural control technology, an instinctive user interface, and an integrated operating platform. The cutting edge solution includes adaptive tracking technology and procedural joint verification, and it works exclusively with the Attune Knee system. The Velus Robotic Assistive Solution is bringing simplicity to the table. A first of its kind table mounted solution. It's purposely designed with state of the art technology. It provides you with enhanced portability to easily integrate into the operating room and ASC environments. It's not just another robotic assistive solution, it's a solution designed to simplify the experience for you. 
So rather than approaching the design of Velis with the end goal in sight, it was really important to look at the challenges in joint reconstruction continuum of care. What are the unmet needs of critical stakeholders in the pursuit of patient satisfaction? Some would say patient uh, perfection. So the first stakeholder is first and foremost in everyone's mind, it's the patient. And knee replacement is widely recognised as being one of the most common and successful surgical procedures performed. However, with reports across the world that a staggering one in five patients are dissatisfied with their outcomes, there is opportunity to improve. So our first stakeholder to understand is the patient. What are the drivers of success? And what are the drivers of dissatisfaction? Anterior knee pain is reported by up to 50% of knee replacement patients, as you would all know. Implants uh, can overhang in about 40% of men and about 60% of women. And this implant overhang causes irritation of the MCL popliteal tendon uh, and is also a major determinant of knee pain. I think most in the room would agree that while stability can be attributed to implant design, Factors such as malpositioning, improper alignment and inadequate soft tissue stability are key factors in the dissatisfied patient. Therefore, improving accuracy, consistency and predictability may address these one in five patients. The second critical stakeholder we considered was you, the surgeon. One study found that 17% of orthopaedic faculty members show elevated levels of psychological stress. Another shows 28% of orthopaedic faculty members have experienced burnout at some stage in their career. Variation in surgical process and performance can lead to decreased efficiency and increased surgeon stress. Ultimately, this can lead to poorer patient outcomes. Surgeon experience can also impact outcomes with lower volume surgeons requiring an average of about 30 minutes extra to complete a total knee replacement, which uh, is also uh, twice as likely to get poorer outcomes. So can technology that increases consistency and predictability support improved outcomes in this surgeon cohort? The third critical stakeholder is your hospitals, our providers. With an increasing volume of patients to serve, it's important to be considering the design of technologies that uh, reduce resource utilisation compared to traditional knee arthroplasty. Can we support more accurate scheduling through predictable procedure times? Can we reduce the length of stay? Can we optimise the discharge destination and send patients home instead of nursing to nursing care? And ultimately, can we reduce readmissions? So today, I introduce to you a robotic assisted solution made for surgeons by surgeons. Velis has been designed to address the multiple stakeholder challenges that I've just discussed by reducing the economic burden and enabling increased volume, facilitating efficiency, predictability and standardisation whilst improving outcomes and patient satisfaction. A robotic solution designed to deliver value proportionate to the investment and outcomes. It's also to import, important to consider Velis as a suite of value drivers across the continuum of care. It's not just a robot. It's a suite of tools that deliver valuable insights, such as you can see down on the bottom left corner, a virtual reality learning system that maximises efficiency through the learning curve. It also includes patient monitoring tools both before and after, the intraoperative period. But these two here outlined in red are probably the ones that I want to draw your attention to the most. And these are our versatile ex -solution, execution solutions, uh, the Velis robotic assisted solution on the right and the Velis hip system, which has a one trial technology for efficient and accurate total hip arthroplasty. So it's natural for all of you to think, well, how is this different to any of the other robotic assisted solutions? And look, there's no doubt that robotic assisted knee arthroplasty is pretty popular. 
and they're expected to grow by about 27% by 2027. However, some of the solutions that you may be familiar with have limitations that Bellis has been designed to overcome. There's a benefit to being a little bit slower to market. Some of the existing solutions require complexity for the surgeon and the patient, such as processes associated with CT scan, file transfer, registration, milling, and limiting the surgeon's natural handling capabilities. I'm sure you're all used to having a saw in your hand when doing a knee replacement. Some robotic solutions report an additional 15 minutes of increased operating theatre time per procedure. This impacts both the economic burden of the procedure and potentially impacts patient outcomes. Some robotic solutions require additional personnel in the operating theatre. This causes the surgery to become really dependent on company reps being accessible for your surgeries, or they require additional hospital headcount to be trained in the use of these technologies. Therefore, they come at an additional cost upgrade. And finally, some of the systems have pretty large footprints, which can be cumbersome not only in the operating theatre, but it means they can be challenging to set up between cases, and they do require dedicated storage space when they're not in use. So imagine a robotic assisted solution that refreshes faster than the wings of a hummingbird in flight, faster than the human eye can process visual information. Velus processes data at 100 hertz per second, and it uses two data points to make its decisions to address, adjust the resection planes without the need for cutting blocks. The single page pro-adjust planning enables the surgeon to intraoperatively assess the patient's soft tissue. They can then personalize the alignment and predict joint stability without a CT scan. The surgeon is in full control of the saw and unlike cutting through blocks, the blade stability is maintained and the trajectory controlled regardless of the quality of the bone. Excuse me, Kim, can I interrupt here? You have one minute to conclude your presentation, please. Thank you. No problem. The Attune Knee System is uh, com combined with the Attune Knee System and the uh, Intuition Instrumentation, uh, the Easy to Maneuver Robotic Assisted Solution, uh, Velus Streamlines OR Integration and OR Workflow. So together, Velus Robotic Assisted Solution and the Attune Knee System have the potential to improve accuracy, reproducibility and consistency in knee arthroplasty. And you can see here the footprint of the Velus digital solution. In the middle, you can see the robot is mounted to the bed and you can see that this um, roaming uh, arm here can actually be removed from the operating theatre to decrease the footprint. At Depew Synthes, we're committed to improving the experience across the episode of care for patients, surgeons, and the hospitals we serve. That's why we've created Velus Digital Surgery, solutions that go beyond robotics. Velus Digital Surgery is a platform of connected technologies powered by data insights and designed to elevate the joint replacement experience while offering economic value, versatility, and verified performance. Thank you, everyone. I look forward to the uh, debate to follow. Thank you so much, Kim, for your... Thank you, Kim, for concluding your talk within a minute. And uh, yes, the next speaker is going to be Mr. Garen Tay. He'll be presenting his views on Marco robotic operating system. Garen, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, is there a way I can share my screen? I can't seem to. Yeah, you just have to share your. Uh... Is there a way to? There's a green button on your screen at the uh, bottom. Right. Uh, it should pop up. I. Yeah, we 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 have. I think we have you. Can you see my? Yeah. Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, congratulations to uh, Professor Maholtra and his organizing committee for again holding a wonderful uh, um, a wonderful current concepts in arthroplasty uh, this year amidst the pandemic. I think it was uh, probably about 10 years when I last uh, participated as a speaker in uh, CCA in Ames. 
Uh, and I really wish I was able uh, to be there, uh, to be with you all in person. But unfortunately, uh, we will have to have that for another day. Uh, this is my hospital. I'm a practicing orthopedic surgeon from the uh, Adult Reconstruction Service and the deputy head uh, of the orthopedic department of Singapore General Hospital, which celebrates its 200th anniversary this year. So I think in 2021, uh, with Valis coming on board, uh, you know, we are indeed very spoiled for choices. And today I will uh, try to give you a surgeon's perspective of, on why I think I will carry on my journey with the Mako uh, Striker robotic arm. So whenever we adopt new technology, and, and uh, fortunately or unfortunately for us, we are constantly being exposed to new and newer technology each day, we need to then have a checklist of what we want to look out for uh, in order to decide which uh, technology works best for us. And I think that apart from this laundry list that I put out here, I think the theme of today's uh, conference, which is the precise prompt and perfection, is probably something that I would include in this list. But beyond that, I think I'm always looking out for having a fantastic surgeon's experience. I think that if uh, it was miserable to use the robot, I would abandon it quickly. I think it needs to make the surgery easier and not more complicated. It has to prove itself to be very safe. It has to be versatile, where I don't have to adapt to the robot, but the robot adapts to me. And finally, I like to work with people, like-minded people who are, who are skilled and experienced and can help me move the case along smoothly. So what makes Mako special? And I think it comes in these three pillars. Number one, being enhanced preoperative planning with the use of a CT scan, which of course some people may feel uh, isn't such a plus point, but I'll come to that shortly. Uh, and from that enhanced preoperative planning, we make our preliminary planning. Subsequently, we influence that plan with dynamic joint balancing by capturing soft tissue information, and we modify the plan again. And finally, after we've got a great plan, we execute it perfectly. And so that plan twice and execute once becomes very attractive to me. The benefits of a preoperative CT to me is that we create this three-dimensional bone model. And yes, there are other ways of uh, capturing the anatomy of the knee, but with a CT, we get very precise skeletal anatomy. And from there, we can get optimal sizing. We can match the geometry of the condyles of the trochlea. We can position our implants based on very accurate bony landmarks, such as the epicondyles. And we can try to preserve bone and match the joint line. And because the CT is done ahead of time, most of this mental arithmetic is done preoperatively so that we can sail along during the surgery. In addition, the user interface has to be very friendly. And I really do not like screens that bombard me with data, graphics, and graphs for which I have to keep on thinking and scratching my head on how to make sense of it. So I think that the nice thing about this user interface is that it's deliberately dumbed it down to make it simple for orthopedic surgeons, but it still provides enough information to get the job done and to get the job done well. Additionally, its versatility is proven because it suits all surgical principles and philosophies. So whether you are coming from a me measured resection philosophy or a gap balancing philosophy, the MAKO can serve you in that purpose. Uh, nowadays, with new uh, philosophies on alignment, the MAKO can also uh, be your partner in achieving that alignment. And finally, you're not committed to making all the plans upfront so you can either do it pre-resection, where you capture soft tissue information before making any bony cuts whatsoever, or you can do it a bit more conventionally, like we did in the past with computer navigation, where we did a mid-resection balancing, cutting the tibia first, and then putting a tensioner in and capturing the rest of the data. One of the, one of the nice... Uh, one of the nice capabilities of the uh, Mako computer system is this anchor point system. Uh, so what happens is that as we capture information of the soft tissue with the virtual prosthesis in place, we can actually see the gaps. And for example, if we want to avoid releasing too much soft tissue and creating more soft tissue injury, then we can slowly adjust the prosthesis to balance out these gaps. And if, for example, we are happy with the medial gap, then we can fix the anchor point onto the medial side 
and then change the varus valgus alignment of the components so that the medial side stays put and the lateral side is only affected. And here you can see how that's being performed. We anchor it medially, and then we just tilt the implant so that only the lateral compartment gaps change. And so that becomes very useful because in, uh, con in contrast to other systems, uh, when you rotate the components, the entire component rotates over a central point in which one gap opens and then one gap closes. And then you have to make further adjustments uh, to get your gaps correct. The next big, uh, the mix, uh, big enabler for me is that we can now do bone preparation cutting block free. And cutting block is something very familiar to all arthroplasty surgeons. We're very uh, adept at using it, but sometimes it does create inaccuracies in our surgery. For example, in osteoporotic bone, when we have difficulty pinning that block on, and as we saw the bone, that block starts to move. So we may over resect or under resect bone. And on the femoral side, our, play, our cuts all don't line up and therefore we can't seat that femoral component properly. In addition, sometimes with uh, challenging anatomy such as lateral femoral hypoplasia, the uh, lateral condyle uh, is not resected during the distal cut and that makes uh, pinning the four-in-one cutting block much more difficult. But with the MAKO system, because each cut is made independently, we can actually resect the entire femur and have all cuts line up accurately. The next technology for the MAKO that I'd like to talk about, and I think that this is really a game changer, is the Accusop haptic boundaries. And it in imparts a safety uh, that has been unparalleled and unseen in previous technologies. So with this, because of the CT scan that is available preoperatively, the computer is able to draw a haptic boundary around the bone so that the saw blade is unable to go beyond that bone and hence protect soft tissue around it. So in this case, you can see that there is a, a U-shaped uh, boundary that is protecting the PCL, and this boundary protects the MCL. And with that, with minimal retraction, we can cut uh, and remove the tibial surface without damaging the soft tissue. Additionally, because we cannot pass, we can't uh, point past the back and injure any structures behind it, we can make all six bony cuts consecutively in knee flexion without any tibial dislocation. And this really speeds up the surgery. So here again, it goes to show the soft tissue protection of the MAKO. Because of the haptic boundary, the uh, MAKO leaves a bone island around the PCL. And this is very useful for CR surgeons because in conventional instrumentation, the PCL injury is often under-recognized and underappreciated, and happens more often than we think. And here is a clinical photo of the PCL well-preserved with a bony island, a rim around it that has protect its attachment. Again, very seldom, but occasionally you may want to do a recut. And instead of pinning another block back or bringing the burr in again to reburr the entire surface, all we have to do is punch in new numbers into the computer, bring the robotic arm, and we can execute a second cut much more easily with the robotic arm. And again, we are afforded all the soft tissue protections such as the PCL, and that with something like increasing the posterior tibial slope, we can reduce the need for soft tissue releases such as PCL recession. Uh, one uh, other strong point about the MAKO is that it comes, uh, um, it can be uh, completed with multiple applications such as a partial knee, total hip, and total knee application. And all you have to do is uh, load up the correct program and change the uh, effector uh, mechanism at the end of the robotic arm. So for a partial knee, we use a burr. For a total hip, we use a reamer. And for the total knee, we use a saw. So of course, there are always space concerns and nobody wants uh, you know, uh, nobody wants to be told that, that that robot is fat. Okay, and yes, indeed, the Mako robot is pretty hefty. It's about 400 kilograms. It's a bit leaner, I guess, than, than previous generation robots, but it still takes up a fairly large footprint. But practically speaking, I think it's really mitigated by the fact that the robot only comes into the sterile field for a few minutes uh, for each case. And if you're really depth at doing the surgery, uh, registration and all the bony resection can be done in under 10 minutes and sometimes closer to five, and you can push the robot out. Additionally, because of the soft tissue protection and the fact that the robotic arm is power assisted, uh, it can be a one-man operation. And finally, I think it behooves me to... I have to conclude your talk, please. Right. So I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, um, 
we have the support of maker product specialists who are well trained and experienced, and they support the case from preoperative to postoperatively. And like what they say, every uh, great man has a woman behind him, and every great maker surgeon has a great team of uh, maker product specialists behind them. Finally, I think uh, the, the surgeon's experience has also been very positive. It's been a short, pleasurable learning curve, and we're still learning and tweaking. It provides expeditious surgery, and we're still getting faster. And this plan twice and execute once provides predictable outcomes each time. And the numbers don't lie. Over 1,000 systems have been installed in 29 countries with over 500 million cases uh, performed. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Darren. Interesting, you should say that behind every successful man, there is a woman. You had four of them. Oh, I have five, actually. Five. Oh, yeah. So uh, we come to the halfway point. I'm uh, Ashok Rajgopal, uh, two great talks. And may I request uh, both the speakers who have already concluded their talks to actually arm up because at the end of it, it's going to be a free for all. Uh, so all the embarrassing questions you wanted to ask of your competitors, but were afraid to do so. There's going to be no regulatory backlash on any of you guys. So aim, load and shoot. Um, on that note, uh, it gives me great pleasure to say hello to my good friend, Sepp Perret. We've known each other many, many, many years. Uh, he's now working in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so Seb, please do your presentation on the Rosa. Thank you very much, uh, Shok. It's my great pleasure to be with you today, even virtually, and I hope that we can make it in person very soon. I have some disclosure as I'm one of the Rosa designer, and of course, it's gonna impact this talk. I'm practicing in Abu Dhabi at the International Knee and Joint Center, and if you're not convinced yet, you can come over and visit me and I'm sure that you will be convinced for sure. I was one of the member of the team of designer of ROSA. We have been working all together since many years. We have been doing ROSA version one for total knee arthroplasty, unicompartmental knee arthroplasty, uh, total hip arthroplasty, no revision arthroplasty. And like the other speaker, ROSA has many potential and we did a great work together. But before starting, we was thinking, what do we really need? Do we want to do like the others or do we want to do something different? We observed in the past that there was active robots, very quickly abundant because it's very cumbersome and very boring for the surgeon. We had seen some aptic robotic system. Many of them have been created in Europe and I have also been able to ex been exposed to Mako before. The problem for me and the problem for most of the designer in the team that were former Mako user is that we ate when someone is holding our hand when we are drinking a glass of Fumfi. And I'm French, you know, and I cannot believe that. I cannot believe that someone will hold my hand when I'm actually drinking a glass of good French wine. So the idea was to do something different because we have constraint everywhere. We have constraint in the clinic. We have constraint with the taxis. We have constraint in every system. It's increasing the time and we wanted to get rid of that because surgery is one time where we are free, free to do what we want uh, as a surgeon in the OR. And we wanted to keep that. We wanted to be able to do it on ourselves without having, doing, without having uh, even if they are beautiful, uh, uh, help uh, uh, from the company to do a surgery. And I don't want to have to cancel my surgery because my uh, rep is not here. I want it to be free to be at any time. And we didn't choose aptic as well because aptic can be falsely reassuring. And if you look at the FDA reports, aptic is not 100% safe. So it's increasing the constraint, it's increasing the time, it's requiring a CT scan, but it's not 100% safe. So we wanted to stay away from that because as a surgeon, if you cannot handle a sew, then you have to change your job and do something else. So we wanted something where the surgeon remains the center of the surgery. We wanted something collaborative where the surgeon has a play, the robot is helping to do what we can't do as a surgeon. And Ashok can do it, but I can't hold the jig at the same time that I'm sewing. So we wanted the robot to help us to place the jig perfectly, hold it in a very stable manner. And we wanted to make sure that we are efficient. We didn't want to replace something that we do well. And I strongly disagree with the four in one. It's one of the most reproducible part of the surgery, one of the safest and one of the more efficient. So we built it something with some key features. First, accurate for the bone and ligament. And we published that recently in the Journal of Arthroplasty. A unique 2D to 3D standing planning tool where you can, from the patient standing, recreate the 3D model of the bone and make sure that you have the 3D anatomy. You can plan, you can anticipate your surgery, choose your sizes, make it efficient by reducing the numbers of trays. 
We want you to be able to work image less as well, because sometimes you don't have the time or you don't have the opportunity to do this uh, 3D planning. It can work with any surgical workflow. We don't want to force the surgeon to change his or her workflow to adapt to the robot. We want it the other way around, efficient, time neutral, and of course, better results for the patient. I've been very lucky to do the first approved case in the world of Rosa in 2019 in Abu Dhabi. And as you see, it's a whole teamwork because robotic surgery is a teamwork. It's not only about us, it's also about our team. There's a long list of Happy Rosa users all over the world, and you can see the smiling face all over the world. There's one new Rosa unit installed every week, and people are happy to use it. There's an enhanced planning tool, as I told you, interactive joint balancing, where you can have the ligament balance all along the procedure to optimize not only the 3D reconstruction of the knee, but also the functional anatomy of the knee, which is very important. It's working in a collaborative manner, and it's basically used with the most advanced implant on the market because it's very important. Robotic surgery is great, but at the end of the day, you have to remember what you're leaving into the patient because it's for the next 20, 25 years, and the quality of the implant is crucial. We're using modern morphometric implant to restore the anatomy of the patient, and we prove and publish the benefit of this type of implant. You can therefore create personalized robotic total neatoplasty with an off-the-shelf implant where every size is, can help you to adequately uh, reconstruct the anatomy of the knee. Why do you want to have a one millimeter precise robot if you have only four millimeters differences between the sizes? If you cannot accommodate the gap as you want, like it is for some other companies and other implants. You can find all this concept and technique in this paper that we recently published about Rosa. Practically speaking, we see how it's working. And you see there's, uh, there's the uh, unit, there's the base, the team is uploading the case. You don't need any rep, you don't need any, any representative from your company. We're working on our own. We can do everything. You see the trackers, very basic. And you see that everything is ready when I'm entering the room. They have prepared everything, the draping, this installing the robot, and I can perform the approach. I can put my trackers on while the team has been working on preparing the robot, which is very easy. It's about five minutes to get everything ready. I put my pins into the incision, subvastus, tourniquet-less approach. You can see that you can perform the reconstruction of the anatomy as you like. You record the ligament balance, you do the calibration of the robot, you do the registration of the point. It's very straightforward. You don't need to paint during two hours the knee because it's only a few points that matters to reconstruct the 3D anatomy of the knee and match with the 3D preoperative planning. You can record the balance. You do your planning alone. You don't need an engineer from the company to do your planning and then you execute the plan. It's very straightforward. You see the jig is arriving. It's exactly where you want. It's co-planner and Rosa is maintaining the, the, the plan. You do to the next step and it's almost time real here. You pin, you place your four-in-one jig because it's very straightforward. You don't need 10 minutes with the robot to do the four-in-one. It's in two minutes, it's done. Like in a conventional surgery, you can use any saw and you can do that very straightforward. You see that there's not 10 retractors either, if even it's an haptic because it's safe. You can position your jig exactly where the robot uh, is helping you to position, very straightforward, and it's done. Robotic time is done, and then you just have to finish your procedure. You can go to the final testing of your ligament, and it's very straightforward once again, and you have the final vision with the full uh, 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 evaluation of the ligament balance at the end of the procedure. So very straightforward, nothing crazy, nothing very different from what we do. I want also to tell you that before, the surgeon was the center of the operation, saving the world with the knife. And there was only two techniques, the mine, the good one, and the bad one from the others. You remember that? But we move forward from that. And now the surgeon is not only Superman in the OR. The surgeon is working and leading a team. You can have data preoperatively with smartwatch to your iPhone, and you can collect data intraoperatively with the robot that you can correlate with the postoperative results. There's also now the possibility to have smart implants that are going to record the movement, that are going to track what the patient is doing postoperatively. And Rosa is one component of this platform to help you and us to do a better job. And it's the beginning of the surgery 3.0 because we can start an endless process, understanding, applying, collecting data from intraoperatively, 
from the implant, from post-operatively, and adjust with collaborative intelligence too. The next step to me is probably from the robot telling us where we are to the robot telling us where we should go. And that's what we are doing with Rosa. We have this analysis, we have this data that we can collect and that are gonna help us to go beyond what we're doing now and understanding better. So if you're not convinced yet by robotics, look at this paper, the train has left and it's that no turning back. It's the time of the machine. So you have to be part of it. And we always heard the same from the opponents of the new technologies. This is the Scott parabola, the rise and the fall of a surgical technique, but it's wrong. We recently published in this paper with one of my fellow that computer assisted surgery, robotic, all the assisted tools are here to stay. It's proven in the data, it's proven in the registries, and it's here to stay. Then you do a better job for every patient with a good accuracy and repeatability. The idea is to get better. Even if you are an excellent surgeon already, you can always improve your performance. At the end of the day, there's beautiful car everywhere in the market. I know that Darren loves BMW in general. In Singapore, you guys love BMW. I'm more of a G-Wagon type guy, but it's up to you guys. There's beautiful car in the market. Use it, use it well. And Rosa for that is efficient, surgeon-centric. You remain a surgeon. There's one component of a platform of solution with a great implant to improve surgeon performance and do a better job for our patient while creating the era of arthroplasty 3.0. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Seb. At the end of this uh, debate, you all four of you are going to be get uh, put into one of these monster jam and you can go bash each other on in your respective vehicles. Uh, great presentation, Seb, as always. Um, last panelist in this is another very dear friend, Ridith, uh, and he's going to talk to us on the merits of uh, the Navio robotic system. All yours, uh, Ridith. Thank you so much, Dr. Raj Gopal. So good to hear your voice, and uh, thank you all for having me here. Um, it is a pleasure to be speaking here today with such uh, eminent surgeons and colleagues who have been on the forefront of technology in the space. As a part of Smith & Nephew, I'm excited to share the journey of uh, real intelligence. Um, and I'm going to speak about the Cori surgical system, which is our second generation robotic system that comes after Navio. Um, and with that, we aim to bring a solution which is broader than robotics in your hands, and we can help walk into the future of orthopedic surgery. As a part of Smith & Nephew, we build, believe in building solutions and products that have, like our colleague said, our patients and surgeons at the center of what we create. And while proud of our distinct and unique offerings with clinically proven implants and technologies, we aim to bring these products into your hands where man and machine can work in harmony, stemming beyond robotics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, where these solutions in your hands begin a journey of real intelligence in your operating theater. And before I uh, dive in about uh, uh, speaking to the specifics of our robot here, um, uh, give me one second, my uh, slide deck seems to be a little stuck. Um, uh, yeah, so I'd like to take a moment to recognize the decades of significant, significant progress that we have made in the space of robotics. Oh, um, my apologies, uh, my presentation seemed to have crashed. Can you still see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, I apologize. Um, my PowerPoint, as you would expect, uh, uh, seemed to have just taken a dive. So give me one minute as I pull this back up. Does that count as a part of the three minute uh, uh, encounter for the for the rest or not? Uh, no, I stop with it. <laughs> yeah, um, so sorry about that. I will try and cons uh, you know uh, uh, shorten my uh, speaking time so that we don't take away from the three minutes there. No, right now you have 10, you used up 90 seconds. <laughs> we are not counting, we are on hold right now. This is the IPL timeout. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, can you see my screen again? Yes, we can. We're being kind to you, Rizit. 
thank you so much. Really appreciate it, and 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 I apologize uh, uh, deeply for that. Um, so coming back to it, uh, you know, while while today robotics and technology have gained a considerable momentum in the market, it has been built on the backbone, as uh, Professor Sebastian was talking about, on years of development and research in the space. Precision and accuracy of techniques for what different prostheses and methods of implantation have seen. Um, we have seen many variants of that over the years. And in the technology space, we have seen evolution over time that adds clinical value in the space where some have stood the test of time, whereas others uh, have, have evolved into something very, very different. Um, and this brings us to the, the prospect of why are we building these robots? And we are here to essentially address the fundamental needs that exist in the space of orthopedics. My colleague spoke about uh, the aspects of addressing the patient needs that we have. If we look at the satisfaction, the functional abilities that we're trying um, as an industry surgeons to get back to for our patients. And the key elements that we believe technology should enable are individualized care for the patient, flexible solutions for site of care, a support for broad range of indications, and technology that unleashes the implant advantages that certain implants can provide, and all tied together with data analytics. And for the end user, as depicted in most of the systems, have a simple, flexible solution for complex clinical problems. But needless to say, uh, we all highlighted certain limitations that does come with technology. High operational costs and additional time burden to provide care, sometimes with additional imaging, sometimes with setup. High service and maintenance costs of large embedded electronic systems and added time due to registration um, um, and others. Our goal within Smith & Nephew has been to best address these challenges as we embark in the direction of improved clinical and economic value for you as surgeons. And with those goals to address these challenges, we as an industry have been investing in evolving technologies which follow a very similar trend to consumer tech. Orthopedic technologies have become smarter, smaller, and more versatile in their function to serve the clinical needs in joint replacement surgery. And that brings me to the Cori surgical system, which is our second generation system that we're introducing into the market as with the nephew. It's designed to serve as the core technology that enables intelligent platform-based robotics, software, and smart tools powered with data. This is a robotic system that is still in your control. And more so, our robotics is with handheld intelligence for a very modern approach um, to the aspect of robotics, keeping your usability in mind. Cori is an image-free system that requires reduced instrumentation and supports flexible workflows with both a saw as well as an additional toolkit, which is a precision milling-based uh, approach that brings time-neutral robotic surgeries into your practice. This with the addition of real-time patient-specific planning of not just bone anatomies, but also predictive balancing um, for mechanical or physiologically designed needs. And this system is actually portable. And to speak to uh, the specifics of the Cori surgical system, um, we, re we re redesigned uh, our, our second generation robot from the ground up, learning from our first generation robots in the market and uh, other systems that are out there, where our cameras track five times faster than most available systems. And that is important for real-time adjustments during bone preparation. Small modular components with reduced instrumentation and ultimately, all our computing power is in the core console, which is a console that can fit on any shelf in your operating theater. And that is essentially is the brain of the ecosystem. But all of that is in the background. What you have as a surgeon in your, uh, in your field of view, in your operating theater, is essentially a tablet with which you can plan and you can have in your field of view as you are executing a surgery. And with that tablet, you can plan, register, as well as execute. And when we think about the execution piece of it, we have redesigned a handheld precision milling tool where the robotics is all embedded. So we do not have any other uh, peripheral equipment that needs to come into your uh, surgical uh, area as you're performing your surgery. And so speaking to registration, planning, and execution through the Cori surgical system, um, as most systems follow uh, fundamentally these three stages, Cori for knees is image-free but it's not at the cost of compromised precision or accuracy. It's not at the cost of a generic model. In fact, Cori uses proprietary algorithms to generate personalized services for each patient, 
And so every model generated with our system is different. And therefore, it leads to different plans and different balance predictions depending on the morphology and ligament tensions that exist for that patient. To demonstrate, I'm showing you the background inner workings of how Fori works. And you can see there are two mappings of, of two knees here. And you can see how the shapes are very different. Because we map where cartilage exists, Cori recognizes that. And when there is disease and bone deformity, Cori recognizes that. And that's why we have uh, stuck with, with this aspect, which reduces the entire spectrum of care needs, uh, and it brings it all into, into the interoperative realm. And moving on to planning, our system considers the fundamentals of geometric and plant designs, um, which also is on the back of decades of research on material science, uh, to support clinically proven implants, which can be symmetric or uh, uh, patient-specific, patient-matching geometries, such as the journey to implants. We also support with our Cori surgical system a platform of implants, starting from partial knees. We are the only robotic system to support a bicruciate retaining knee implant, as well as a, a platform of total knee implants, which start with legion, genesis to anthem, and journey to knees. In planning, surgeons have the ability to control the position of these implants in half degree increments uh, to cater to personalized alignment philosophies. And that's not only in the coronal plane, but also in the sagittal plane, allowing them to predict implant joint line, as well as balance and patella tracking in half millimeter and half degree increments. In this particular example of the video that you can see playing in the bottom, um, we are demonstrating a kinematically designed knee that allows a surgeon to replicate the alignment principles of a three degree joint line matching in a patient's pre-arthritic condition, but without the need to having adjust bone cuts beyond a degree um, in either direction. And that's the power you get of personalizing uh, a shape matching technology or mechanical alignment principles with the choice of implant design with the Cori surgical system to get the best balance for that patient. And finally, execution is in the space of robotics with a handheld technology with two modes of robotic control. One which is exposure control where the mill extends out and into the guard to prevent overcutting in any direction, as well as speed control where the uh, speed of the mill can speed up or slow down and completely stop, allowing surgeons uh, complete flexibility in their hands. And this allows us to further increase surface preparation, minimizing the traditional errors of guides or blades as we know how they skive and bend. Or for more easier needs, the, the Cori surgical system actually allows the use of a, of a saw-based technique, and we are very versatile and flexible with AP cut blocks that can be used during the preparation um, with our, our robotic system. So looking through a slightly broader lens of the industry, um, we look at the evolution as a metamorphosis from traditional products to an ecosystem of products, where this journey is enabled by connected, intelligent automation of processes, all backed by data and analytics. And so as Milton Nephew, just like our colleagues, we believe that the ecosystem is built by a suite of solution oriented applications and devices that serve in the pre-op, intra-op uh, cases. And we are building solutions in knees, hips, and care management where surgeons can plan to their preferences or use data science-driven solutions to individualize the surgical plan interoperatively and ultimately have uh, the data autonomously connect from pre, intra, and post, and feed back into your interoperative surgery uh, to self-enhance the procedural outcomes in this space. And we are bringing the first generation of such solutions with interoperative data from Cori Surgical System into your hands. So with the system, you get the ability to look at that data. And that data essentially allows us to not only look at the, the specific trends of our cases, but dive deeper into how accurate are we with, the, with our system and get those at your fingertips. We can dive deeper into every specific case and look at our learning curve, as well as see how our time differences are changing with every specific case. We can drill down and examine every procedure that we have done and look at every element of uh, cuts or angular uh, variations that we've made and look at our final alignment plan that we've made and see whether we are personalizing surgery or sticking with mechanical principles. And ultimately benchmark that against global data. And that way we support right. crowdsourcing surgery from that perspective. Vedit, may I request China, please? Yeah. Um, so uh, to just close out with all of this, um, we believe that the Cori surgical system, we are on the journey to 
lower risks with enhanced predictability, provide personalized care, and increase value um, um, in the space of orthopedic surgery. So with that, I, I want to thank you all for your time and, uh, and hand it back for uh, the, the debate session. Thank you, Ridhit. Uh, we've had four absolutely stellar presentations. And uh, this is the part that I like the most. Each of you can go for each other without, with no holes barred. Uh, this is like WWE. You can toss, you can fling, you can jump, you can do whatever you like. So we, we're going to go down the panel in the same order that we started. And we have an audience here. You've made four very compelling statements on why the audience should understand and follow your lead. So here is your opportunity to go in two minutes to tell the panel, your panelists and the rest of the audience, why your system outdoes the other three. So just tell us in two minutes, starting now, we'll start with you, Kim. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know how happy I am about going uh, first on the counter. My husband uh, would tell you that uh, I always like to have the last say in the conversation, but uh, nonetheless, let's, uh, let's have a go. Um, and look, let's face it, none of us are going to tell you that our robotic solution is less accurate. We're not going to tell you that it's less precise, and we're not going to tell you that it exhibits worse patient outcomes than a regular total knee arthroplasty because each of us are on the road to improve that one in five dissatisfied patients. But the reality is that we have an aging population that is challenging healthcare systems around the world to rethink how we best deliver care. In orthopedics, the growing number of knee replacements is expected to increase by a staggering 56% globally between 2015 and 2030. 80% of those uh, sorry, 80% of that growth uh, in 2030 in the USA and in my hometown of Australia, we will realise a huge 276% growth between 2013 and 2030. While many digital solutions add cost and complexity to procedures, it's important to take that into account that we are delivering value proportionate to the outcome. And with the greatest respect, Darren speaks to the, the, the desire to plan twice and execute once, but when there's significant deformity and osteophytes in situ, static CT-based planning can be performed a dozen times over, and it still won't provide the surgeon with the critical insights around the soft tissue integrity that the surgeon can actually palpate when opening up that knee. Now, you're a surgeon, so I don't want to tell you to, uh, to uh, suck eggs, so to speak, but... Um, uh, certainly that's uh, my perception. The right. Velis Robotic Assisted solution simplifies total knee arthroplasty by providing efficient and accurate patient registration during the operation. This allows the surgeon to do a natural joint assessment and then deliver versatile execution for a well-balanced knee. As a sorbet system, it emits the need for cut blocks. The blade stability is maintained regardless of the quality of the bone. If you've got an osteopenic patient, the pins of the cut block won't move. If you've got a sclerotic patient and that bone keeps moving, the saw will move with it. Together with the attuned knee system, which has been shown to reduce discharge to rehabilitation facilities by 58% compared to some competitive knee systems, the Velis robotic assisted solution is accurate. It's reproducible. It's efficient. And it's got a focus on meeting the expectations of all stakeholders in the journey, the patient, the surgeon, and the payer. That's right. it for me. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. You started safe and then you came into your own in the last. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to see that. Right, Darren, now the stage is yours. Uh, okay. Uh, Thank you, you very much. Uh, well, firstly, I think in Singapore, we, we are now very fascinated with the Tesla. So the BMW is going uh, off and, and similarly, uh, you know, it, it just uh, goes to show how much uh, we love our technology and, and the BM is probably uh, old tech uh, compared to the Tesla. The Velis is unproven, uh, you know, so like what they say about all technology, we don't, we don't want to use technology that hasn't been proven uh, because we don't know its drawbacks, but it certainly sounds attractive. I think that uh, with regards to the Valis and the Mako, 
Uh, you know, I, I personally feel that to robotic surgery is when you don't need to use jigs. Anything else is more of a glorified navigation system because you're still moving a cutting block, you're still pinning. And as much as you want to paint the romantic notion of surgeons loving to use a saw, uh, you're just basically saying that surgeons love to be inaccurate. And that's what you will get when you use a cutting jig. Uh, you know, so, so the only time I use a rosa in my practice is when the mako is taken up by somebody else. Somebody has gotten their hands on the Mako before I got it. And then I don't want to wait. So I say, okay, whatever it is, just pull in the Rosa. And then on a, on a day where I'm particularly moody and I want to punish the entire operating theater, then I'll use the Cori and I'll punish the anesthetist and I'll punish my assistants and I'll punish the nurses and I'll make them all go home really late. Uh, so, so that's kind of my stand. I think that I've, I haven't used uh, all three systems and, uh, you know, I, I was, I was even, um, partially involved in some feedback for the Valis as well. Uh, well um, I think that uh, if perhaps anything is going to take the crown of the Mako, it may be the Valis, but at the moment, because it's not, there is no haptic boundaries on the Valis, uh, you know, soft tissue uh, injury still can occur. And uh, even if the, the Mako, you know, uh, Perhaps in that study showed that there was some soft tissue injury. If you're using a cutting block and you have no idea where your soft tissues are, you don't protect your soft tissues, you're going to injure soft tissue. Uh, so that's my stand. I think that, uh, you know, the truer sense, uh, the robot, uh, the only robot currently uh, that qualifies in my, in my mind as a robot is, is the Mako. Right. Thanks, Darren. You have thrown down the gauntlet and... Uh... With it, you've got like another two minutes to get up, get up and get geared up for the counter. Seb, your, thank you. your stage. Thank you, Ashok. thank you, Ashok. So first and foremost, uh, Kim, I'm sorry, but I'm never going to trust anybody from the pew in terms of timing uh, when I'm going to hear that the Velis is time neutral because you don't use the same watch as I do. So it's finished and uh, never, never, ever. And even our friends uh, using the Velis. It's the first point. Second of all, it has been built in France, and I know exactly where it's coming from. The guy who built it is a friend of mine, and I'm not too sure that it's the next generation of robot because it's basically taking old things to do new ones. Uh, Darren, uh, thank you for the jig, but you know what? I love Tesla too, but if you drive a Tesla, you have to put good tires on it because otherwise you're never going to go anywhere. And if you drive on the wheels, it's never going to work. And to me, this is the problem of the Mako. The robot is not bad, of course, but the implant is terrible. And if you have a very precise robot, millimeter, 0 0.5, but you cannot choose sizes in between four millimeters difference, you cannot recreate the anatomy of the knee. And at the end of the day, that's what you're going to leave in the patient knee. And I'm sure that you're going to do a great job with a macro. However, the implant will not do a great job for the patient. And to me, this is very important. In terms of sewing and rosa, I like the fact that uh, the, you can use your normal instrumentation. It's into the flow. It's surgeon centric. I'm still doing something. I have the ligament balance that Kim was talking about. I have the data pre-op. I can have the data post-op and I can go to the next level of, of, of surgery. Because to me, the problem today is not the tool. The problem is to know where we have to go and what we have to do for each patient. And this is my thinking. And to finish, read it, I'm sorry, but I'm not a dentist. I have nothing against the dentist, but I'm not going to use a burr for the whole day because it's painful. It's painful all the time. And it's terrible. I'm sorry. And everybody using a burr try to stay away from the burr. So I'm sorry to see that the next generation of uh, uh, Smith and Nephew robot is still using a burr. Maybe one day you will change. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Seb. Uh, now, my friend, read it. There's a lot of defending you have to do. This is almost like the India-Pakistan match. We were left sharing at the end. We were getting bashed around. And uh, so let's, let's have your counter. And while he's doing that, may I request the audience to get your questions together. We have about 20 minutes at the end of it. We've had a fascinating session. So get your questions together. We'd like to put this uh, up to the panel. Redit, all yours. Next two minutes are yours. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Raj Gopal and, and uh, uh, Kim, Dr. Tay, uh, Francis Sebastian, thank you for your wonderful talks and, and, and your points. I think all of them very, very valid. Um, uh, 
uh, however, the way I look at look at it is we're all trying to evolve our technologies to make make you know your lives better as surgeons as well as bring uh, the ultimate patient outcomes that we can with our hands. And it is a mixture of technology, the workflow that we choose to ex execute with, the toolkits that we have, whether it's a saw, a cut guide at the end of what we have, and then ultimately the implants. Um, our robotic surgical system, even the second generation surgical system, we decided deliberately to use a precision mill. Um, we have uh, explored technologies of roboticizing saws, but at the end of the day, a saw is an, a cantilever beam. And a cantilever beam passing through a guide or passing without a guide, um, as we've all studied, you know, it's a, it, there's a fulcrum point that you'll have, and then, then there's cantilevers where things can bend, skive, and ultimately when, when we look at and talk about three, three and a half degrees of slope or one and a half degrees of varus valgus, and Dr. Tay, you, you showed a wonderful demonstration of how you can still adjust uh, with the saw blade and, and make uh, secondary cuts with the microsurgical system. But regardless, different bones will have different densities. And along with that comes those little inaccuracies that, that, that uh, uh, saw blades do bring around. But we also, as Smith and Nephew, recognize that it is the most widely used tool, uh, Professor said to your point, uh, you know, uh, that that milling has not quite caught on in the world of uh, orthopedic surgery. Um, but what we do provide is um, there is no other system that provides that tool for you. So when you want to make a precision uh, fixture to your uh, uh, cuts, this is, an, this is an enablement that exists within the Cori workflow. And, and Dr. Tay, I, I'm uh, sorry to hear that you had to have your uh, staff members you know, prove, prove whenever you were using uh, Navio uh, surgical systems, but we have uh, options of using uh, you know, cut guides and saws, as well as we use our milling technology very intelligently where you can literally mill a couple of fixtures for your cutting block and have specific cutting blocks where you can use a saw with the system. So you can start there uh, and, and get that level of precision for your easy chip shot needs um, from that perspective and get that efficiency. And with Corey, we really focused on studying um, can milling really reduce time? And we saw a 27% reduction from first generation systems. So definitely much better than the dental procedures, uh, Professor said, because we uh, redid our, our milling technology with redesigned burrs that's good for cartilage and bone. And, and uh, these burrs extend 12 millimeters for a full resection from that perspective. So um, uh, very focused on making sure that uh, ultimately in your hands, you have the, the best tools and you pick the right tools for your surgery. Uh, with the Cori surgical system. With the uh, aspect of reducing costs, reducing trays, reducing instruments, um, and ultimately having uh, a variety of toolkits with uh, our platform. Thank you, Radit. So uh, I think you defended your turf uh, admirably. Um, so are there any questions from the audience for any of the panelists here? Please feel free to reach out to the mic there are a couple of uh, flow mics there are some floating mics also so so while we've got uh, while people are getting their uh, questions and coming up to the uh, to the uh, mic my one question to to all four of you and you know any one of you can take this um, is there a boundary for robotics i mean in this part of the world i said working this part and uh, darren's working here we get these really, really bad, horrific deformities. Now, is there a threshold that each of your respective robots will deliver up to? We've, we've had experience with uh, both the, the, the uh, Navio and Mako, and we seem to get the, uh, the sense that beyond a certain point, to your point, all four of you mentioned about not doing soft tissue uh, releases. And that becomes a bit of a challenge, particularly with large osteophytes on the medial side or the lateral side of the posterior surface. Uh, how, do, how do you folks react to that? So my real question is, is there a threshold up to five degrees, seven degrees, 15 degrees? Where do you draw the line with the robot? Any one of you can take it, whoever can just put your, yeah, yeah sir. Yeah. Yeah, I think that with the Rosa, there's no threshold, Ashok, because you can plan and you can do very complex cases and you, you, you're right. And here we have the same type of deformities that you can observe in your practice. 
And this is my point too. We have to remain surgeons, you know. And if you do the, if you let the rep do the planning for you on the CT scan, you cannot really evaluate the uh, uh, the effect of the osteophyte, the posterior medial osteophyte in the varus knee on the tibia is terrible. And that's why, to me, it's very important to have a nice tool. But we need to remain surgeon. We need to remain capable of sewing, of completing uh, releases when needed, removing the osteophyte. And that's also the beauty of the rosa. There's no limit, there's no boundaries, and it's keeping you a, a surgeon and it's making you a better surgeon. Great point, sir, because at the end of it, uh, the robo is a additive complement to your surgical skills and surgical rules. Yes, uh, Dana? Yes, uh, uh, sorry. Could I, could I just uh, maybe make a comment about the osteophytes? I think that indeed it's uh, something that you have to factor in when you are planning. Uh, sometimes if you're going to do a pre-resection balancing where you are going to plan your entire component position before any resection, then you will have to factor in the osteophytes. And with the CT scan, you're able to appreciate the actual volume of osteophytes in the back. Now, fortunately in Singapore, most of our patients don't have tremendous posterior osteophytes, but in cases where there are very large osteophytes, you can deliberately plan to leave the knee in varus with a tighter medial compartment gap, planning that when you release and remove the osteophytes, you're going to regain those few millimeters of gap. So for example, if I were to plan uh, a varus knee with big osteophytes in the posterior femoral medial fem femur, I would plan maybe a 19 gap on the lateral side, which is enough for me to put in a, a nine millimeter in insert. And perhaps I would leave the medial site at 17 or 16, depending on the volume of osteophytes. Uh, with regards to the boundaries, uh, I think that if you want to capture for the MAKO, uh, you need to get the knee straighter than uh, 20 degrees of fixed flexion deformity. And that may not be achievable in certain patients with very large deformities. And in that case, you may want to do a, -re a mid-resection balancing where you cut the tibia first, and then you put a tensioner in and then you carry on and then you can straighten out the knee and you can plan and you can recut the tibia if you feel that you need to remove more tibial bone or you can just dis uh, proximalize your femur, elevate the joint line a bit to reclaim some of that extension. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Uh, my, yeah, Darren. my question to Kim. Yeah. Uh, Darren said that there is no haptic uh, boundaries in the valleys. Uh, is it like that or? What is it so, mean? Kim, did you get the question? Do you do you have haptic boundaries in the Velsis uh, system? You don't. No, Velsis um, was deliberately uh, designed uh, with no haptic boundaries um, for a couple of reasons. The first is looking at the uh, the outcomes versus again the uh, the value and the investment. Uh, we made the very deliberate decision to not have a CT based planning system uh, for Velsis. Uh, because the clinical outcomes that have been exhibited thus far, um, you know, again, uh, benefits in being, uh, uh, you know, second uh, or, you know, later to market, um, we get to review some of those clinical outcomes and the patient outcomes with that haptic control um, at this stage haven't uh, necessarily um, shown significant improvements to justify that uh, increased cost and investment. So um, we, we made the de deliberate decision not to have uh, haptic control with the Velis robotic solution. So another question that I have for, for the panelists is, um, we're really early in the robotic evolutionary sort of cycle as it were. And I don't think we're going to uh, see these standards of robots or the haptic fields or whatever in the next five years. So it's really evolving in, in terms of its uh, existence within the armamentarium of the arthroplasty surgeon. Um, there are going to be naysayers, and there was a very nice editorial in GOA 2019 by Javed Pravizi and uh, uh, Bob Booth and a couple of others who said that these 20 year survivorship is 95%. 15 is 98%. Why go through this entire elaborate, expensive technology sort of overdrive? Can you make 98 to 100 and can you make 95 to 98? So 
any comments on that? And these are guys who got between them some 40,000, 60,000 knees behind them. Yes, sir. Uh, can I make, yeah, sure. I do agree. Huh? We, are, we will uh, have trouble to prove better survivorship, but I think we don't have to consider only survivorship because survivorship is a, a result that is meant to be for cancer surgery, where you survive or you don't survive. For knee arthroplasty, we know that sometimes patients still have their knees on, but they're not happy. They don't do well. 25% for instability, for example, which is a, a huge problem. And I do think that these tools will help surgeon to probably make patient happier. It's gonna be difficult to prove once again, because uh, uh, Kim showed a very nice uh, uh, diagram on healthcare based value. And the problem is that we don't know very well yet to evaluate the results of our patient. And we are probably not good enough. And that's what we are missing on the equation. We cannot measure the value because we can measure the cost, but we can't measure the outcomes that really matters for the patient. And to me, that's also the sense of my last part of the talk where we have to evaluate better preoperatively, postoperatively to understand better what we really have to do better. And the idea is, uh, like you say, the tool will probably change, but it's really to understand what we have to do for a specific patient. And today you can do that, Ashok, because you have thousands of knees in your hands and you are the brain and the hands at the same time. You don't need a robot because you have this experience, but it's not true for every surgeon over the world. And that's where we have to go, I think. Great point, uh, Seb, and I've just been informed by the organizers that we've just come up to the golden hour. We have to wind up, so it gives me and uh, my co-moderator, Dhananjay, great pleasure in thanking you, Kim, Darren, Seb, and Ridit, for an absolutely wonderful uh, exposition of your respective robots. And may, be the, may the force be with all four of you. All the best. Thank you so Thank much you. for having us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for this uh, session. So now we would like to move forward to the next session, which is newer technologies in joint replacement. I would like to call upon Dr. Dhan Shaikra. Dr. Biraj Gogai and Dr. Abhay Ellens to moderate this session. So we are going to continue to discuss about the newer technologies. So the next is, uh, speech is, talk is going to be about robotic unicondylar knee arthroplasty. Is it worth, uh, Darren is going to continue on that. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could, I, could, you, could you all see my screen? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. And thanks once again for inviting me uh, to talk about uh, Robotic UKA. Is it worth it? So we all know that uh, conventionally, UKA in the correct patient is indeed an excellent option. It provides great outcomes, uh, just as good as total knee replacement, if not better. Uh, it, it gives the patients better kinematics, a more natural feeling knee, they go home faster and they have lower complication rates. However, the problem with partial knee replacements is that the revision rates are undoubtedly higher when compared to total knees, which seem to last 98% at uh, 15 years. And so the revision rates of two to three times higher than the total knees has become a problem and is one of the detractors of offering this excellent option to the patients. In fact, this uh, survivorship, uh, inferior survivorship can be seen on this graph where uh, partial knee replacements fail 
uh, at a higher degree uh, compared to total knee replacements from the National Joint Registry of the UK. And uh, it, at eight years, there was only at 87% survivorship as compared to 95% for total knees. So we certainly see much better success when we're looking at a uh, case series, and that prompts us to believe that success is indeed technique dependent, it's surgeon dependent, and probably volume dependent. And some of the techniques that we have been taught in order to perform an excellent partial knee replacement is to avoid interprosthetic malalignment, which leads to edge loading and wear. We need to get the component size correct. We need to cover the tibia properly so it doesn't subside. And we need to balance the soft tissues and not overstretch the medial compartment leading to valgus and progression of osteoarthritis. So this is where I, I have decided to use the Mako robotic arm for my partial knee replacements. Again, it's a haptic guided robotic arm with boundaries. But instead of using the saw, as mentioned uh, previously for knee replacements, we're now using a burr. The three key advantages of the Mako, as mentioned previously, uh, is enhanced preoperative planning based off a CT, then subsequently refining that plan with dynamic joint balancing, incorporating soft tissue values, and then executing it perfectly once and for all with a robotic arm-assisted bone preparation using the uh, burr. So in terms of the partial knee replacement, where a CT becomes very useful is that we're able to appro appropriately restore the joint line, which improves kinematics. We're able to match the femoral condyle contours. We're able to choose the appropriate size and position of the tibia so that we can cover the, the, the tibial plateau uh, as much as possible and minimize the amount, amount of bone that we need to remove. And this is all done preoperatively and it gives us a great starting point Subsequently, we need then to understand the soft tissue envelope because we know that soft tissue does play a very important role in the kinematics and the functioning of the partial knee replacement. And we capture this soft tissue information throughout knee flexion and that's collected by the computer. We can either do it using manual valgus stress as we flex the knee throughout its range of motion, or we can use the small included bone paddles inserted into the joint and tension up or distract the joint and the computer collects the values in. Once we have that data, along with the uh, virtual placement of the implants, we have provided a soft tissue graft. And on this side, you can actually see that all the blue columns represent some laxity and all the co orange columns, which is deeper down in flexion from 60 to 100, have a, a tightness of up to a millimeter. And so what this basically represents is a tight flexion gap. And if we wanted to get a balanced flexion gap, which in my opinion looks, should look something like this on the right, then we need to either do some soft tissue releases, for which usually we try not to do too much in a partial knee replacement, or we fine tune the position of the implants. And in this case, we can either increase the posterior tibial slope, or we can anteriorize the femur as we saw in the live surgery uh, in, in the afternoon. And by doing a combination of these, we can actually shift this graft from the left where there is tightness in flexion to a well-balanced soft tissue graft from which we will then be happy to proceed with the surgery. Something to be said about the posterior tibial slope, there are people who believe that we should restrict the, the, the tibial slope to a safe zone, maybe somewhere from five to 10 degrees and not exceeding that, or some people will believe that they should recreate the native slopes. However, native anatomy and prosthetic anatomy can be different, and we may not want to push the boundary too much by having the posterior tibial slope too excessive in order to achieve a flexion gap, a balanced flexion gap. And we know that when we increase the, the prosthetic slope, this uh, results in increased failure uh, in terms of poor outcomes, uh, implant loosening, and ACL rupture. We can also further refine the positions by optimizing the interprosthetic alignment. And how we do that, usually in manual instrumentation for fixed bearing unis, is we try to medialize the tibial tray and we try to lateralize the femoral component all the way, maybe closer to the notch. And the purpose for this is to prevent edge loading and premature wear and failure of the implants. And you can see from these uh, pictorial representations, even before we've done any surgery, we've fine tuned the components so that it has moved from where it was edge loading on the tibia to where it is seated nice and central on the tibial plateau. 
And because we're able to shift the implants and appreciate the soft tissue information, we're actually able to standardize the soft tissue graphs of each and every case and optimize their curves by fine tuning the position of the implants along with a limited uh, soft tissue release. And as a result, we can get very predictable outcomes. So once we're happy with the implant positions, we then bring in the, the, the um, robotic burr and we are protected by the haptic boundary. And as a result, we're able to execute the plan very precisely. And because of the haptic boundary, there is actually very minimal need uh, for uh, soft tissue retraction. And sometimes just a simple uh, self-retainer is sufficient. So why the use for a burr? Why the use of a burr for bone prep instead of a saw that we usually use uh, for, for fixed bearing partial knee replacements? And that's because it allows the use of geometrically complex prosthesis. So in the Restoris implant, the in, inner surface of the implant is actually curved and that's not achievable through a saw. And additionally, we can provide an inlay placement to augment prosthetic stability. And with the same burr, we can prepare the lug holes. And all this uh, is done through the use of one single burr. And the benefits over cutting jigs, as mentioned before, we don't have to worry about the jigs coming unstable. We can do a much smaller incision with the use of a leg holder, uh, approaching the knee through uh, various soft tissue window, um, moving the, the mobile soft tissue window. And we also remove stress rises from the pin sites, which may lead to inadvertent fracture. And as you can see here, we're actually able to squeeze down the implant without compromising position to an incision of about four centimeters. So do we have superior results with robotic partial knee replacement? And like most technology, we have to be wary that most of them do not confer much benefit and therefore it becomes difficult to justify increase in cost. So technology has to prove itself safe and with providing superior outcomes before we can promote it for mainstream adoption. Thankfully, there are some positive uh, studies that show good clinical outcomes. Uh, we have randomized control trials that show lower um, pain scores up to uh, up to 50% up to eight weeks postoperatively. However, of course, uh, you know, these, um, these uh, do not carry on uh, further down the line and uh, manual conventional partial knee replacements do just as well at two years. In terms of survivorship, this is really where we want to see the impact of robotics. And uh, we know that with better position, hopefully we are able uh, to provide better survivorship and a lowered revision rate. We see that at 5.7 years, 97% survivorship reported by uh, Pearl et al. As well as uh, um, by Michael Mont, he talked about revision analysis of robotic arm assisted versus manual unicompartmental knee arthroplasty, where they did a propensity matched one is to two of robotic and um, manual partial knee replacements. And at 24 months, we were already able to see that the robotic partial knee replacements had fewer revision procedures of 0.81% versus 5% uh, in the manual uh, partial knee replacements. Looking at the Australian National Joint Registry uh, in 2021, uh, at five years, we can see that the cumulative revision of manual is 5.6% versus robotic partial knee at 4.5%. So I think in conclusion, Successful partial knee replacement is indeed very technically uh, technique dependent. However, robots do provide better understanding of the patient's soft tissue and the patient's bony anatomy. And it also allows us to do the surgery with reduced soft tissue violation. And hopefully this will allow us to improve an already excellent arthroplasty option. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Darren. Uh We'll take questions at the end, and I would now like to invite Dr. Andre Ferreira for his talk on does navigation still have a future in totally arthroplastic? Thank you. Dear Chairman, <laughs> dear colleagues, thank you very much to invite me. It's a real pleasure to be, to be there with you. So after this very interesting session about robotics, does navigation still have a future in TKA? That's the question, of course. Because at the beginning, we know that the 
survival of the Tiki A is completely dependent of the axis. Ritter and Baron had shown how it is important to have a very good axis. And when we have a deviation more than three degrees, the risk of failure is multiplied by 17. So navigation and alignment seems to be parallel and logical. Um, Merson did a meta-analysis of 29 studies. At the end, it is uh, evident that the tibia is easier to perform, but even with the standard instrumentation than with the uh, navigation. So what about femur? Femur is most difficult to properly align. That's the problem. And why? Because we have a loss, a, a, a luxury of landmark, the center of rotation of the hip. Another a study did by Jenny in France about uh, 247 TKA with a minimum of 10 years of follow-up comparing standard instrumentation and navigation show that the, net, the difference is difficult to demonstrate. There is no significant difference between both standard instrumentation and navigation. That's probably why we use it for less than 10 persons in our global activity. Why so, so less? Because it increases costs, of course, equipment in operating room, operating times, and approach because we have to enlarge it to place the pins. And it requires a learning curve. And now we know that because we want to avoid any release, for example, the ligament balance is not taken into account. So that's the reasons why it's not so interesting. It seems to be not so interesting to use navigation. Navigation seems to be a trend like robotics. And uh, for example, for the, uh, during the ISTA meeting in 2015 and 2017, if we compare the presentation, we can see that uh, computer assisted surgery navigation is very, very popular because it gives most of the pub oral publication more than robot 3D kinetic sensor or PSI, for example. So it is a trend, but it is true that fashion, the trend is not necessarily what we want to use on daily basis if we compare with that. So the second evolution is smart technology. Uh, what is it? It is like the auto line. I use a portable navigation based on an accelerometer, like your uh, cell phone. Theoretically, it combines the precision of the navigation and the simplicity of the standard instrumentation. No prior tracking or bond morphing, no radiological image necessary before, and it is suitable for any prosthesis with a lower price. So we did a study with 56 patients with a standard instrumentation and 156 with outer line with the same TKA. There were no difference between the two series about uh, sex, etiology, deformation, bone quality, age, BMI, and as a score. At the end, for the results, we can see that only the, Ox the Oxford increase is better with navigation. I think that there is no real signification of that. But about the uh, IKS and uh, functions Oxford score, there is no real difference. So same clinical results at last follow-up, two years, but what can, what can we expect? About radiologic results, we see that the each key A is about the same between navigation and uh, standard, uh, standard instrumentation. It, it's a slight, a slight tendency of valgus, one to two degrees, but no, no real significant difference. And we can see that, as we have mentioned before, the tibia in average is closer to orthogonal. It's really easier to do tibia. What is interesting is to combine all the results, all the angle results. And we can see that 
if close to 90% of standard instrumentation has a good HKA, less for the uh, navigation, when we combine all the angles independently, we can see that only one half of the patients uh, have a global correct results. And what about precision? Precision is the ability to be reproducible, to avoid the outliers. But we can see that we have a lot of outliers with and without navigation for the HKA, the angle of the femoral, mechanical femoral angle and the tib, me, mechanical tibial angle. So there is no real difference. And we can see that maybe standard navigation seems to be better for the femur because of the intermediary road, which at the end is a good landmark, may, better than the range of uh, motion of the hip center. And when we compare vagus knee and varus knee, pure up, of course, we can see that we have a lot of uh, valgus deviation in both series with probably uh, less results with navigation. One example that uh, confirmed that navigation can be useful in, in case of a high deformity of the tibia, for example. So in summary, there is a, some limits of this study, low number of cases, of course, uh, no demographic difference is an advantage, with the, and we have the same clinical results at two years. The precision is close to 90% in both situations. So navigation doesn't confirm its superiority, or probably the standard instrumentation uh, has increased its accuracy. And there is a mild valgus tendency with outer line. Why? Because it's so difficult to determine the femoral center rotation. So, now, what are the current developments in uh, navigation? Light weighting of equipment, of course, decrease in additional benchmarks, improved cutting accuracy, and integration of ligament balancing. Ligament balancing is, in the past, the sequential, sequential release of soft tissues, but now we, we try to optimize the bone resection to bring the same gap in flexion and extension with a good, the correct the exact external rotation. But what is important is to know the pressure between the two compartments, but what landmarks are we? What are reference should be applied? 10, 25, 75 pounds? We don't know. And even if mechanical devices are not really good, the kinetic sensors are more, much more expensive, the same, some problem. So probably the optical tracking device for navigation could be a good evolution as shown before by Sebastian Parat, for example. The surgeon controls the tool, but it is guided by the computer. Probably it will combine the advantages of navigation and robots. So evolutions are robots, not this one, of course, but these ones, we, we saw them before. So navigation, those, it is a part of robotic in general, and it must integrate in the future the ligament balancing. Why? Because we tend to have a more kinematic axis than mechanical one, and it will become a connected object. But there is an economic approach. I review the clinical and economic literature of three navigation TKA modalities, about 100 publications, there is no technology show that cost effective effect as none show better long-term results because the problem is the long-term results. And with the short and the mid-term results, we have already very good results with standard, standard instrumentation. It seems that kinetic sensors seem to be the most promising. So a toy or the future? It's not a toy because it helps us to improve our knowledge on reasoning. It's a good tool to teach juniors, and probably it is a good tool for TKA more than THA. And it can give us ideas in laboratory, but it's not the future. It's a, we have a sufficient long-term results to many parameters to manage. And there is no real difference proved with conventional instrumentation with a lack of completeness. So navigation is only a step, a step which is precise, rest, yes, prompt, we are not sure, and perfect, 
surely not. So what could be the future? Probably we have to think about our behavior as surgeons. And probably the solution is close to haptic robots to reduce the standard deviation. And even if we don't like this idea, robotic surgery is the future with the question of liability in case of problems. But with our poor health economy, could we in the future have robots? I'm not sure. But it is the evolution. And evolution is ineluctable. Evolution is not the future, only the present, a step which leads to robotization of our practice. Perfection, whatever the cost, that's only the question. But remember with the phone, how we have evolved from that to that to that, and probably that in the future. I thank you for your intention. Thank you, Mr. Andre, for your wonderful presentation. Now the next topic is cementless total knee arthroplasty. Is it better? Now we call upon Darren Tay uh, for the presentation, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having me on stage again. So I will be talking about cementless total knee replacement. Uh, we've actually had cementless implants in Singapore for some time, but it usually, uh, it was actually only the femoral component. Uh, it was only recently in the last uh, two years uh, that Singapore had uh, the options of cementless tibia. So our own local experience is uh, still quite uh, young. Uh, but with regards to historical results, uh, cementless implants have been used uh, and entirely uncemented uh, total knee replacement has been used since the 1980s. However, the survivorship was poor with early designs and it had fallen out of favor. And that was probably in due to the fact that we were seeing great success with its cemented counterpart. And on the right, you can see a picture of the Millet Galante uh, one prosthesis with the fiber mesh uh, backing. So when it came to understanding why the uncemented knee replacements failed, we had to look at the individual components and the metal back patella, which was very common back then, was the most component component failure in early designs. And that was probably due to many of its design shortcomings of which much of it has been improved in modern days. The poly was thin, they had uh, eccentric um, osteointegration, which led to pec fractures the polyethylene dislocated or dissociated from the base plate, and the trochlea on the femoral side was unfriendly. And unfortunately, because the metal ended up grinding against the counterface of the femoral components uh, during revision, the femoral components had to be revised as well. However, on its own, the femur components, the uncemented femur components actually had very good survivorship, and it was the best surviving component of the entire uh, construct. The tibial trays were also subject to quite high failure rates. There was uh, inconsistent osteointegration from inferior and patch coating, and that led uh, together with probably um, poor understanding of how to balance the knee earlier on, that led to loosening, lift off, and subsidence. And uh, as a as an as an opportunity to improve improve the fixation, a uh, screw fixation was added on where you could augment the uh, uncemented component onto the, onto the metaphysis with the use of screws. However, this led to further complications, which were uh, deep osteolysis from these channels uh, that led to particulate debris making its way down into the metaphysis. So why not just stick with cement? Well, I guess this picture probably would prompt us that we should at all times be always thinking of, is there a better solution? And because if this, uh, if we always went with the adage of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, that's probably how we'd be traveling today and not in our Teslas. But is cement such a perfect solution? And we understand that indeed it is very uh, user-friendly and many surgeons are very competent in using uh, cement as part of their arthroplasty options. However, aseptic loosening still accounts for a third of revisions, and we know that younger and heavier patients are much more at risk as seen from registry data. In addition, cemented implants usually tend to be associated with greater bone loss when we have to extract these implants from the knee. 
Proper cementing is also technique dependent. It's not really fire and forget, and it's not so simple as to say that anyone can do it. It really takes meticulous technique of drying the bone, of making sure we don't get lipid on the cement, and making sure that uh, we get a thick mantle. We need to make sure that uh, the amount of cement that we put onto the bone surfaces and onto the implant is adequate before impaction. So why go cementless? Well, there is always this potential benefit of osseointegration as we are seeing from the hip side of things. It achieves a living physiological bond between implant and bone, and so you don't have a dead junction of cement between the two. And as a result of this living bond, there is a potential for repair and remodeling. And once that osseointegration occurs, then this potentially can decrease late failure and aseptic loosening, and it becomes attractive in young active patients. Additionally, it can avoid cement-related complications. Uh, if you don't cement well, you can get debonding. And in the middle, you can see a picture of uh, where uh, cement was applied late onto the implant. And uh, upon uh, putting everything in at the end of the procedure, we were actually able to pull the entire femoral components off, leaving the cement interdigitated into the bone. Additionally, uh, cement can, uh, third can cause third body wear and uh, irritation if you leave too much particles behind as seen on the image on the right. So it's seldom that we see technology come in aid of surgery where it actually decreases the complexity of surgery. And indeed, when it comes to cementless total knee replacement, less is more. We see that with the use of cementless implants, we can enjoy time saving, and that really works out to be around 10 minutes per case. It reduces stress on the entire surgical team because we no longer have to look at the clock and plan on when to put cement in and how to remove excess cement. It reduces logistics and less waste is generated per case and it facilitates tourniquet free surgery. So we can operate in a bloody field. We don't need to get a dry, uh, dry bone to, to, to uh, put the implants in. We are, we are, we're aided by advances in manufacturing today. So the degree of micromotion and ingrowth is definitely affected by implant coating. And technology has come a long way to help us in achieving cementless fixation, durable cementless fixation. Improved biocompatible coating options available to us can be things like hydroxyapatite, which is bioactive, and highly porous surfaces such as trabecular metal, 3D printing, where we can control pore size and porosity, and plasma spray. Additionally, we have improved in our contemporary designs. We now have uh, cruciform pegs or hexagonal pegs uh, that are coated, and we can work without the use of screws for achieving press fit stability. But it's also important for us to select our patients properly. And uh, although there is literature to show that there is, absolute, there is no absolute contraindication in terms of age, gender, and sex, we need to understand that in the, the use of cementless implants, we are trying to achieve osseointegration. And if we cannot achieve a rigid fixation at the time of surgery, then perhaps it's time to bail out and go back to our dependable cement. And so in these cases, they would include osteoporotic bone stock in which you can actually press in with your finger, uh, perhaps severe inflammatory arthritis and places where the tibial trays or the implants are not stable due to bone defects. Proper surgical technique is still required. We need to be very gentle with the bony surfaces once they are prepared. We can't be rough with them and cause further damage and that would reduce the uh, host bone implant contact. We need to try to create flat cuts. We need to maximize tibial component coverage to prevent subsidence and uh, micro motion. And if there are small bony defects, then we may want to consider resecting a bit deeper to remove the bony defects. And finally, as we put the implants in, uh, because it's of its tight fit, we have to be collinear to make sure that we do not create bigger defects. Robotic assisted knee replacement also helps uh, in, in um, performing better cementless uh, knee replacements by uh, removing minimal bone, better seating of the femoral component, having a rigid blade for flatter tibial cut and appropriate component sizing. What do we know about the contemporary results of uh, modern day cementless total knee replacements? Well, numerous studies show comparable uh, patient-related outcomes compared with cemented total knee replacements. 
In young patients uh, less than 65 years of age, I think we're still struggling to show a big significant difference in terms of survivorship versus cemented replacements, uh, it, both in registry data and, uh, in, um, and in case series. However, with regards to cementless total knee replacement in the obese, there are promising results which show that cemented, uh, uh, cementless fixation has superior outcomes up to 8 to 12 years uh, when, when used in these uh, patients with a BMI of over 40. Uh, what about the rest of the survivorship? Well, reports on survivorship and revision rates are comparable to cemented total knee replacements as a testament to how durable cement fixation is. There have been three randomized controlled trials published in the last five years with a mean follow-up of anywhere from two to five years showing similar survivorship. However, registry data is a little bit more negative, which shows a slightly increased uh, rate of uh, cumulative revision uh, up at, to 17 to 20 years, both from the UK and the Australian National Joint Registries. What about cost? Adoption of technology has to always be tempered by being a bit cost conscious. And this is especially so in today's climate where value-driven care is very big amongst many hospitals and centers. And cementless implants are indeed a little bit more costly than the cemented counterparts. However, we factor in all the cement, the cement accessories, the, the increased operating time, the cost difference is actually quite negligible with some reports actually showing cost savings when using cementless implants. So in conclusion, I think cementless total knee replacements is up against very tough competition in the, in the form of cemented implants. It does, however, have potential for better survivorship, especially in the young and now proven in the heavy set patients. It allows for much simpler, faster and less messy surgery. And it's really not that much more expensive when all things are considered. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Darren. We'll move on to the next talk. Not all that is shiny and new is better. The talk about all poly TBF by David Chu. Hello there. Thank you for joining. Hello, David. Good afternoon. Yes. My name is David Chu. I'm the immediate past president of the Asian Pacific Orthopedic Association. I was a president of the University of the Netherlands, and then retired now. And you can see from my profile there that I have a very big interest in joining the business. Um, my major declaration with regard to this talk is that I have been a long time user of the ABCC for the business. Whether that makes me bias, it's up to you. The question we're going to ask today is uh, whether we need to go back to the new trades or are all volumes better? And for this argument, it would be best if we use evidence to the goals. In my experience, since January 2015, they got all the trades that um, from the prior generation, all volumes. There have been no implant updates as compared to you can see that from these post of the back surgeries that they've been done in some pretty specific cases. But in large number of these issues, what we have. We instinctively feel that the metal back to the tray is stronger and more lasting than an all volume material. But is this true? Let's just look at it. For the first time, we need to look at the device and use the digital version. And here is a paper very interesting by Geo and Bowman, published in the Nicole Twins. Not a recent paper, though. It's a kind of paper. This was published in 2000 when they compared all projects to the project to the projects in the old series. And all these patients were greater than six years of age, not yet. They received a medical crucial retained means, or not a piece of crucial retained means. And there were two types of crucial retained means. One was a cemented or and the other one was a cemented metal back means. In that, 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 in that
And you can see from the X-ray and the picture of the infant uh, is that this was last year the PXC system is very completely because this is still completely going on. The other thing is, look at 304 unique pieces of equipment. 213 joints and have to live with length of over three files and the minimum of three years of life were included. And this was one hundred and eleven all for the team. One hundred and two had the back team. There were in this series thirteen revisions of various meters and none of the subjects aware in the group. It's only three years, so we don't expect a good number of revisions. And then, but saving one year said there was no difference in clinical scores between both groups. Um, uh, so they are confused with uh, actually what is our technology problem with all body clinical functions equivalently to the matter back of the and it's subject to possible complications which should be considered reasonably cost or uh, less cost. Interestingly, we did a paper to a part of this paper. And this table just shows other studies that have been done in this area. It's a very small, very busy table. So I think a little tape is growing up with so it's a little bit. And you can see that any of these studies, including some studies this year, so you don't get to this time, uh, then they should go to this between both these groups. Um, so that was the paper. We had the visitors and the same group of patients after 10 years and repeated with the study and uh, found that there was no difference between other groups. So um, we would say that because the cost is that, we would use all polyclinic content. And then we should go there because the results are equivalent and the cost is far less. Um, they then went to look at the cognitive, the same group of researchers with the And I look at the survival characteristics of the individual cognitive for the history of that group. And compared it to the level of that counterbalance. And you can see from the graph, here is survival curve to all the individual cognitive. And here is the survival curve of the level of that race. So you can scale these groups. The more last, long lasting That's then one of the different sets of studies in the applications. <coughs> this is a very small group <laughs> because it's done by a particular kind of group. So it's obviously a class test. And if you're talking to a very young group of people, so talk about the patients. So the patients are going to be able to find the analysis. And they found that in this group of patients, there were good results in 96% of the And 62% of the patients were still participating in this course after a mean of, of 10 to 18 years. Um, so there were no cases of that white use progressive rate of the license and so on. You'd expect that because it's a uh, and the person who has been in the area of privacy has had this reason for technical reasons of 97.7% and for all any reason for some time at least for 10 years, these are pretty reasonable results for a young actor to do. Okay, well, maybe you know more than the answer to the analysis of science. When you look at it, Yes, it's been almost okay. Uh, 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 this is a female, female challenge. Okay. Instinctively, you look at this and say, well, the impact of the bias on the left is more stable than the all of the bias on the right. So there's 40 patients followed up by hours and hours. And when you look at the impact of the bias, 
Look at this. This is a demo back. We see all the things. What? No one has to do with all this. All the world is to do with this. This is the last of this. This is rotatory stability. And there's more as a And this internal is a rotation of the entire. And again, it gave us a <laughs> Here's another one. It's the very last thing that we have analysis. And it's a summary of all the analysis. Most of them were done on So, we did that really something. Uh, although it's not the they notice no difference in all the results between all the values of the values. The various elements of us. MTPM stands for total movement in parts. And when you compare uh, who's in the game in parts versus what series they were, so that's the measure of the percentage. So I used to believe that. Or so you say, why is it not? Perhaps we would have more specific inputs when you look at the thing and that is the fact of this resource that we need to have to do the thing. And then, of course, at the end of all the studies, the results here actually represent the size of the structure. So the data of the data study is only sustainable. But anything above the zero line favors the open. And anything below the zero line favors the other line species. You can see here that actually this uh, stream owns generally favors the open. So the fact of that is that I have to say that the open is not open. And it's a bit Seems to favor the whole thing. It's so the stops. So we don't have to cheat. That's it. One last thing. If you start with these conversations, I would go over here. Thank you very much, David. And uh, for paucity of time, uh, we will now have the question and answer session. And uh, we would like to limit the session to two questions, please. And before we uh, Go on to audience questions. I have a question for the panel. Very interesting uh, editorial about two months back uh, in the Journal of Arthroplasty comparing 240,000 knees, and which seemed to say that uh, all poly versus metal backed, navigated versus non navigated, cemented versus cementless, and uh, robotic versus uh, non robotic knees. We really do not know what makes a difference. So, comments from the panel Darren, Andre, and uh, David. You know, I, I'm sorry, can you hear me if you can? Um, actually, I'm Malaysian, and uh, I believe in the appropriate technology for the appropriate time and place. And we are not exactly a very rich uh, country, unlike Singapore, uh, but we are allowed to own many cars. And amongst the cars I own, I own a BMW, I own a Mercedes, and I own also my mother's Paradorm IV, which is the, the kind of like a Suzuki Maruti, you know? And you know what? When it rains in Malaysia and it floods, I take my mother's car out because this car has been known to go underwater almost all the way up to the roof and come out the other end with no problems at all. I cannot do that in my other two cars. Darren, your take. Lovely explanation, David. Yeah. Um, I agree. I think that the, I think patient selection is important. Uh, in the end, I think that as surgeons, we should be able uh, to decide what is best for each patient and, uh, and, and use the technology in the right context. Um, I, with regards to robotics, I think that it's an instrument. Uh, and so uh, the more that we, you use it, of course, it does come with a cost. 
but the more you use it, the more powerful it becomes as an instrument. And, and so it, it's it's probably wise uh, in the end not to spread yourself too thin. You know, I think select a few uh, technologies that you think, uh, you know, um, are cost efficient and that uh, give you good results. And I think that then you'd be happy with that. I think it becomes a problem when you start dabbling with too many technologies and you spread yourself thin and then you start to lose focus and you cannot refine your art. Uh, and, and I think that, that in that case, patients end up being uh, at the worst end of the stick for it. Thanks, Darren. Andre, your take on it? No, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. So um, I agree with the, the, the previous speakers, of course. I think that all technologies are only tools. And uh, we must remember that ancillary, for example, the, name, the term ancillary uh, comes from the Latin, Latin term uh, ancilla, uh, which means slave. Technology is, is a slave, is our slave. We can use whatever we want to for uh, patients. In my experience, I use uh, cemented uh, knees, uh, we all knees cemented, but all poly for uni and with a uh, metal back for the total knee arthroplasty. Because I have chosen them at the beginning. But at the end, I can use a whole poly for uh, tibia, for example, in case of allergy, for example, with the same results. So I, I think that technology must, must be just managed and we can do how we want with all standard navigation, uh, standard instrumentation, navigation, robotics, and so on. No, no, question, yeah. Thanks, Andre. Can you pass the mic to me? We have a question from the crowd, Dr. Thari. Yeah, the question to Darren regarding the uncemented total knee replacement. Is it there? Uh, yes, I am. My question is, most of the literature states that the failure in the uncemented total knee replacement is a tibia. Is it possible to go for a hybrid like uncemented femoral and the tibia should be cemented if the quality of bone is not good and because of fear of the sinking of the tibial plate? Oh, thank you, sir, for your question. I think that that is probably a very common practice. Uh, I think that uh, the, in terms of track record, the cement, uncemented femurs have done extremely well with very low uh, rates of aseptic loosening. Uh, in the past early studies, the majority of femurs that were revised were because they were damaged by the metal back patellas. And so there are, I know of many surgeons in Singapore who actually choose to use uh, an uncemented femur and paired with uh, a cemented tibia uh, in what we call hybrid fixation. Um, however, I think that uh, what we're trying to explore uh, is now the use of an entirely uncemented construct, both tibia and femur, uh, for the purpose of creating these uh, living physiological bonds on both ends uh, of the knee joint, uh, whereby it potentially can resist uh, future aseptic loosening. Uh, even with cemented tibias, I think that uh, the, the failure point, the failure uh, is usually in the, the cemented tibia as well in, in, in a fully cemented construct. Uh, the femurs tend to, to survive much better uh, than tibias. And that's why even for cement uh, techniques, we really have to pay attention as we implant them on the tibial side. Uh, and the femoral side is a little bit more forgiving. So I hope that answers your question, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, speakers, uh, for the wonderful session. Uh, uh, short of time, we are concluding this session and uh, thank Dr. David Chun, Dr. Um, <clears throat> Andrew Ferreira and Darren for your talks. Uh, as we continue to adapt newer technology, we should not forget the old and uh, proven technology. So with that, we conclude. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. And moderators, we'd uh, like to invite Professor Anjan Trikha and Dr. Ashish Pandey for our next session, which is on ERAS in COVID zeitgeist, daycare arthroplasty.
Thank you very much. We are about seven minutes behind schedule, so I think we should start immediately. And for the, after all these orthopedic surgeries, Siemens or no Siemens, robots or surgeons, we now come to the next part, which I think is equally important. We talk about anesthesia, pain, and early discharge. And we have Dr. Professor Ranjana Khetripal, who's from Amritsar Medical College, Punjab, all the way. And she's going to talk about ERAS guidelines for total joint arthroplasty. Uh, enhanced recovery after surgery, ERAS, is in fashion. About 15 years ago, it all started with GI surgery, and now it has taken over all possible uh, surgical fields, cesareans, laparotomies, had in uh, neurosurgeries everywhere. She's going to talk about ERAS in total joint arthroplasty. Dr. Anjana, please. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, topic, as Dr. Anjana has mentioned, it's an enhanced recovery after surgery guidelines in total joint arthroplasty. Now, the fast recovery pathways, also known as ERAS, this concept was basically developed by Henrik Kellett. It's a patient centered, evidence based, multidisciplinary, multimodal, and continuously audited approach which was initially started in 1997 for colorectal surgery and then subsequently adopted for orthopedic surgery. Now, question arises, why ERAS for orthopedic surgeries? The purpose is optimizing pain relief via multimodal opioid sparing analgesic technique, reducing the surgical stress response, early mobilization, supported discharge, reducing the post-op complications, length of stay in the hospital, thereby decreasing the burden on healthcare, in, uh, and achieving both patient as well as the surgeon satisfaction so that patient is empowered to gain independence as quickly as possible. Now, why it is for orthopedic surgeries? Again, I said as this is, uh, it's a coordinated team effort. And uh, uh, this was a study done in 2019 and another study done in 2021. Both these studies talked about the protocol components in model ERAS pathways which consists of uh, pre-operative, intraoperative, post-operative phase and early mobilization after surgery. Now, conduct of anesthesia as per ERAS is divided into three parts, pre-operative, intraoperative and post-operative. In the pre-operative phase, most important is the informed consent, where the patient is talk, told about the care practices he or she is going to re uh, receive. The unrealistic expectations of the patients are also addressed. The active role patient is going to have in the program and is made to meet all the members of the multidisciplinary team. The next part is assessment and optimization where the patient's vital functions and health conditions are optimized and high risk patients are at the same time identified by calculating the individual risk factors, especially for post-op nausea, vomiting and deep in thrombosis. There's a targeted pre-operative counseling. So the patient is told about uh, smoking and uh, the risk of continuing smoking and alcohol intake so asked to stop it two to four weeks prior to surgery. It's very important to identify the caretaker at home and start joint function exercises and quadriceps strengthening at home. Preoperative anemia and nutrition are very important to be taken care of because these lead to increased postoperative mobility, risk of infections, and thereby increasing the length of stay in the hospital. ERAS is quite liberal with the preoperative fasting. Clear fluids are permitted up to two hours before and solid foods are permitted up to six hours before the induction of anesthesia. It also recommends a carbohydrate load given via a clear carbohydrate rich drink two to three hours prior to surgery that presents a patient in a metabolically fed state leading to less post-operative protein loss. Preemptive analgesia as per ERAS, it's given with paracetamol, celecoxib, gabapentinoids, and some centers give oxycodone also. Now the in the intraoperative phase, neuroaxial anesthesia is the gold standard because it provides a sympathetic blockage it annuates the post-operative insulin release, decreases the blood loss, blood loss is a decreased chance of uh, DVT. If GA is to be given, then total IV anesthesia using propofol and remifentanil or fentanyl is preferred. Surgical technique has to be minimally invasive and ERAS as such does not recommend use of any drains, tunique and catheter. Normothermy has to be maintained and temperature of the OT should not be under 21 degrees Celsius and which can be achieved by the use of electrical hot air devices and uh, fluid warmer devices. 
Now, intraoperative fluid balance is very important, and goal directed fluid therapy protocol is followed in ERAS, which maximizes the tissue oxygen delivery without fluid overload by achieving measurable optimal hemodynamic indices. And volume status assessment can be done by vitals like heart rate, blood pressure, end tidal carbon dioxide, urine output, cardiac output, capillary refill. Blood conservation strategies include preoperative fluid resuscitation, blood salvage techniques, autologous blood transfusion, IV tenexamic acid. And then anesthetic and analgesics again consist of multimodal opioid sparing analgesic techniques, NNCs, COX-2 inhibitors, or paracetamol. Peripheral nerve blocks are again very vital to ERAS. Facial iliac block can be given. This does not require much of skill. It's an inexpensive uh, block, and the most of analgesia lasts for around 10 to 12 hours. Three-in-one block is not preferred because it causes quadriceps weakening. Uh, adductor canal block is safe, motor sparing block, which does not result in quadriceps weakness. Quadritus lumborum block can be given for THR patients. Now, uh, techniques like IPAC, where the, where the interspace between popliteral artery and the capsule of the bone, and cryotherapy, they have a definite place. Local infiltration analgesia is given, with, uh, given by the surgeons, and uh, local infiltration analgesia, along with peripheral nerve blocks and IPAC, is considered very good for, especially for TKR patients. Uh, for regarding perioperative nausea and vomiting, IV dexamethasone, 8 mg before induction of anesthesia, and serotonin and antagonist, uh, 30 minutes before awakening are given. But if the patients are high risk, then combination of 2 to 3 antiemetics can be given. Prophylactic anticoagulant treatment, rapid mobilization, elastic compression stockings, low molecular weight heparin, and uh, but these days uh, we are giving oral anticoagulants also. Antimicrobial prophylaxis consists of second or third generation cephalosporins, 30 to 60 minutes before skin incision, a single dose depending on the patient's weight. Now, the post op phase consists of multimodal opioid sparing analgesia techniques. So, early changeover to oral analgesics and uh, uh, post operative fasting is not recommended. Early allowance of food eating is there. Uh, there has to be a multidisciplinary fall prevention program established at every orthopedic level. And so early ambulation on day one and physiotherapy are the key elements and early removal of tubes and drains if inserted. Family support and home-based home care is very, very important and it provides motivation and avoids all the complications. Now, this is one of the orthopedic analgesic uh, protocol and this is a conduct in a nutshell. Now, this was a study done in 2019 which compared traditional and ERAS pathways for and patients undergoing total knee arthroplasty and patients were all older than 65 years of age. And this study concluded that ERAS program is safer and more efficacious in elderly total arthroplasty patients as compared to traditional pathways. And ERAS program could effectively reduce perioperative pain, especially on day one and day five, improve the range of motion, decrease the blood loss, blood loss transfusion rate, length of stay, and total complications without increasing the short-term mortality. So this was a, a comparison drawn. And as you can see, no, uh, uh, not much interventions were done in the traditional uh, pathway. And uh, this was the result. Now, extending it is in the outpatient joint arthroplasty. Advantages of OJ, we all know, it's reduced cost, length of stay, especially in COVID times, better clinical outcomes, patient satisfaction. But proper selection of patients is very, very important in outpatient joint arthroplasty. So there's an aura score, outpatient arthroplasty risk assessment score, which assesses the present severity and extent of optimization of medical conditions in nine comorbidity areas. And various some points are given according to the comorbidity. There are various inclusion and exclusion criteria. And uh, as we can see the inclusion, generally the patients who are taken for OJ are relatively younger patients, uh, age up to 70 years. And uh, they should be living within a certain uh, close distance of the hospital and they uh, uh, are willing to participate in OJ. And the uh, various exclusion criteria, the comorbidities, cognitive issues and psychosocial issues are important. Now question is how it has made OJ a reality. That's because of the various innovative anesthesia techniques opioid free anesthesia, use of spinal with short acting local anesthetics. Basically, we don't want any residual motor blockade or uh, orthostatic hypotension or any other thing which can preclude the same day discharge. So short acting local anesthetics like chloroprocaine, lidocaine, 2% prilocaine, mepivacaine, depending upon the surgeon's competence uh, that is used. Then motor sparing blocks like facial aca block, adductor canal blocks are used. And if G is to be given, then short acting drugs are used. The minimally invasive surgical technique, so much is being talked about the anterior approach. Basically, it leads to small scar, reduced tissue trauma, decreased post-operative pain, greater mobility, and decreased length of stay in the hospital. Then multimodal opioid sparing techniques, as we talked about, then early ambulation of patients, 
and definitive discharge protocols. Patients can be discharged on Liberoxaban, 10 milligram OD for 35 days in uh, THR patients and 15 days in TKR patients, or we can even give Epixaban. Then proper follow-up of the patients along with all the routine protocols of ERAS made outpatient joint arthroplasty a reality. This was a study done in 2019, which uh, compared the complications, duration of stay and cost of hospital care after using ERAS protocol for TKR patients and total hip arthroplasty patients. So two basically cohort of two groups were compared. One group was consisted of 120 short stay ERAS patients and another was a control group of 150 patients. And the conclusion was that ERAS short protocol led to better outcome of patients by cutting down the rate of unwanted events like pain, post-op nausea, vomiting, urinary retention, and achieve the decreased cost and length of stay to less than 24 hours. And also combined epidural sedation along with local inflammation and analgesia was used and patients were able to walk two to three hours after surgery, thereby making OJ a reality. So this, uh, this was another study done in 2020, which talked about fast track hip and knee arthroplasty and how fast. And this study said that the implementation of fast track programs has not been universal. So the, the need for improved prediction methods for safe outpatient procedures and already uh, the outpatient arthroplasty is possible only at the centers which already have a su established successful fast track protocol available. Otherwise, it will lead to an increase in the readmissions and morbidities. Then the, these were the studies uh, uh, about OJ and then there was a review article and all these articles concluded that with innovative anesthetic techniques and minimally invasive surgical procedures, outpatient joint ar arthroplasty has become a reality. So properly implemented ERAS protocols have reduced length of stay in the hospital, especially in the COVID-19 times. Proper patient selection is must on the basis of ORA score and ESA grading. And these pathways have made same day discharge possible, reduce the healthcare burden, increase the patient satisfaction without compromising the quality of care and patient satisfaction. Uh, so to summarize, ERAS is a coordinated team effort and a natural evolution, but we should be mindful to walk before we run. Reduced duration of hospital stay should not be a goal in itself, but rather should be an outcome of successfully executed recovery protocol on the basis of notion was first better than faster. So change to adopt it us. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for a very comprehensive overview on RAS and also reminding us orthopedic surgeons that it's not just the robot, the navigation or the change of approach, which will help us to discharge the patient on the same day. Your support is equally important. And uh, like Dr. Malhotra had mentioned in the morning, how during COVID times, uh, despite the health system being overwhelmed, he has been able to successfully perform arthroplasty surgeries and discharge the patient on the same day. I'm sure it wouldn't have been possible without the support of the anesthesia department. Our next talk is precisely on the same topic, uh, outpatient total joint arthroplasty by uh, Lee Rubin. Lee? Greetings once again. And I do have a recorded version of the talk I sent in. If you could bring that up, please. and to the organizing committee members. Greetings from Yale, here in New Haven, Connecticut. My disclosures. Proud to share the disclosure about my textbook, A Direct to your Approach to Hip Reconstruction, which is available as a reference to those of you wishing to learn more about this technique. The second edition of this textbook will be forthcoming in 2022. I'm very excited about that. I hope that we'll be able to share that with you as well. So why perform outpatient total joint arthroplasty? There's a host of the pros and cons. The pros, of course, shorter stay, no hospitalization needed. Use of minimally invasive techniques and advanced nerve blocks and anesthesia. Patients get home more quickly. We have used tele-rehab to save on outpatient service costs. And selection of healthier patients helps reduce the readmission risks. 
Cons, of course, there's risks of pain, nausea, or other complications that could evolve at home. Uh, there's no in home nursing services to manage the patient, and there can be issues with communication when patients try to reach you. So, what has changed for us in the total joint world that's allowed this to evolve? There's a host of things no general anesthesia for the most part, no IV or intrathecal narcotics. Regional anesthetics are now our standard of practice, and I'll talk about that later on. We use sensory only blockade and no motor blocks. Multi drug injection nerve block cocktail with anesthetic and steroid, which I'll discuss in a minute. Indwelling, no indwelling nerve pumps or catheters, no bladder catheters. We use tranexamic acid routinely and have almost no transfusions. We use anterior approach with minimally invasive techniques depending on the surgery. Turn to use is minimized. There's no drains postoperatively. And occlusive dressings are used so we don't have to do any dressing changes for anywhere from one to two weeks. We do immediate physical therapy, immediate weight bearing is tolerated. In the US, this forecasting that looks at the outpatient joint world and shows us that there's an uptick in how many patients are expected to be scheduled and completed as outpatients. There should be a 77% growth in that category over the next 10 years. And indeed, as you'll see in my own data, we're following that trend. In the US, it's being also driven largely by the insurance companies who send patients these types of letters that I show you here where the surgery is not approved for an inpatient stay, they'll approve it for an overnight stay. At 23 hours, the patient has to go home and they won't pay for anything further. So this encourages patients to think about do they really need to stay because they'll incur a cost. There's quite a bit of research on this topic. I wanted to share with you some of the, the data that we've looked at. We've looked at the National Surgical Quality Improvement Project here in the US. My research group at Yale has published three papers on this. Total needs, we looked at 112,000 patients and of those, just about 642 were outpatient. Total hip, similar population, 63,000 patients, 420 were outpatient in that population. And partial knee, 5,000 patients, and about 568 of those were outpatient. In that total sample of 182,000 patients with unique surgeries examined through the database, looking at 30 day outcomes, there's no differences in the adverse events for outpatient partial knee, total knee, and total hip. Here's a study, the Otto L. Frank Award, multi-center randomized trial of outpatient versus inpatient. They looked at a smaller group, 220 patients, who followed them very closely in 2014 and 15, all through the answer approach, and 76% of outpatients were same day as planned. Uh, at that time, they didn't get 100% of patients home, but they had no difference in complication rates or phone calls. Another study looked at a meta-analysis, 41 studies showed no differences in the adverse event rate. Uh, fewer adverse events were seen with total hips compared to total needs, and the average cost savings and reduction was about $6,700 U.S. dollars. What's been my experience? Well, we had an interesting experience. We had a cancer center at one of our hospitals that was kind of defunct because it moved down the street. So that building, we drew up plans and blueprints and renovated it. And we built this, and this was our outpatient surgery center. It had six absolutely beautiful operating rooms. And we identified key criteria of patient selection and screening, preoperative education, counseling and optimization, multimodal pain control, fluid management, control of nausea, spinal anesthesia, meticulous hemostasis with use of combined TXA, IV, and topical, occlusive antibacterial surgical dressing, establishing clear functional goals for therapy to do rehab to get those patients home. This is a look inside one of our hours the first day there a few years ago in 2018 when we opened. We had some roadblocks. We had to make sure we had good selection criteria. We had to have standardization of care. The anesthetic blocks and the analgesia, the post-op plan had to be the same. Wound care regimen had to be the same. Uh, we had to establish a partnership with local home health agencies. We had to make sure we had equipment for our ambulatory ORs. They were used to doing knee scopes, not total knees. And of course, DME needs, which is you know things like walkers or canes or ice machines, that sort of thing. So my practice, looking at my outpatient population over the last you know two years leading up to COVID, um, you can see that total hips are the big driver. Fifty-four percent of my cases were total hips, uh, and at this point, I'm thirty percent same day discharge, another thirty percent overnight. So about sixty percent of my patients are home in that twenty-three hour window by the next day. Only forty percent of all of my patients stay more than two nights. We published uh, an anesthetic review showing the essential elements of outpatient total joint program. We have a number of other research areas I'll touch on just very briefly. So the nurse navigator uh, optimization program, postdoctoral wound care dressing, we've done some work to study that, and regional anesthesia. 
This is our optimization pilot of our nurse navigator program. We published our results, essentially showing that in the, the group that the nurses work with, we call the optimization cohort, they had a lower length of stay, a lower return to the emergency department for readmission, a higher rate of referral to the tele rehab program that they established, almost no transfusions. And this was consistent against different cohorts. So the impact of our nurses to help us make sure that those patients are prepared for surgery, educated, et cetera, it gets people home. You can see here that discharge from a much higher rate than the baseline cohorts. Uh, and now we're even higher, almost 95% discharge from my practice since COVID. The aquasol dressing, in my experience, dates back to 2014 and became a standard of care for us at Yale in 2017. There's definitely studies in 2014 and 2017, the literature and elsewhere, um, and, and both and above and Columbia University below that showed a reduction in the infection rate of the aquasol. And the dressing can stay on. It's a patient satisfied, they can go home, no dressing changes typically for a week at least, uh, and they can shower with it, get dressed with it. We leave that occlusive silver pregnant dressing, which is antibacterial for all primary aquaplastic cases at this point. Manufacturers suggest a seven day usage. We leave it anywhere from seven to 10 to 14 days. And we, we are able to get patients home very successfully with this. Femoral nerve blocks became a thing for our hip fracture program, which we studied from my partner, Jin Lei, who was from anesthesia here at Yale. We looked at 192 patients having a hip fracture, which is not the same thing as now patient heart velocity, but we studied their pain reduction, just simply giving a local anesthetic to the femoral nerve block. Uh, and it had a tremendous uh, decrease in opioid demands for those patients. So this was an encouraging finding. And what we did was we adapted some of the study findings to the total joint population. This is a study looking at total hip arthroplasty um, and the control group versus the treatment group. Uh, we're looking at spinal, either the surgeon delivered injection versus treatment group. They got an anesthesia ultrasound guided uh, injection in the LFCM and quadratus laborum. This is our cocktail as it's shown here, rocavitine with five milligrams of dexamethasone and 40 milligrams of prednisolone. They get that volume in each of the two nerve block areas prior to surgery. We now do this for total hip as well as blocks for total knee. So this was Jim Lane's work. She recently published it to so 228 patients. And essentially over the first three days, the nerve blocks had a tremendous reduction uh, in the amounts of pain as well as the amounts of narcotic those patients consume. And this has now become our standard of care for total hip at Yale, including the outpatient groups. We have a randomized control trial in progress looking at 200 patients. We're almost completed at this point looking at similar things, anesthesia delivered versus surgeon delivered using that same block regimen. And we'll find out soon about that. So in the last minute to summarize some of the thoughts in this presentation, outpatient total joint trends in the United States are currently somewhere between 32 and 37% of cases are estimated to be moved into the outpatient space. And that's exactly where we are in my practice at Yale. And you can see by 2026 on the right, uh, we're up to 51% potentially uh, being discharged as outpatient. There's no estimates on academic medical centers, and I think our numbers are higher than would be otherwise expected. Selection of outpatients is really the critical step for you as you develop practice on your own to so send patients home. Really, you want to help your patients. You cherry pick your own patients and put them in the outpatient arena or set them up to the home. You use risk assessment tools to make sure they're healthy and they're screened medically. They have to be motivated. That's very important. They have to have good support for family or caregiver to get them there, get them home, and support them. You have to have standardized protocols for perioperative pain and anesthesia and antibiotic. You have to have a very meticulous, well executed surgical plan and excellent post operative care and communication, perhaps a hotline so they can call your nurse or you directly. Contingency planning, five or six percent of these may stay overnight and have 23 hour observation. Nausea, hypotension, and pain are the three most common reasons. Uh, we have a hospital associate AFC. We can admit them into the hospital when needed directly rather than a freestanding surgical center. The final slide surgical skill and meticulous hemostasis, where technique are essential. That hemostasis and infection prevention are really your keys for success. And I do believe our nurse navigator program that we built here at Yale has helped us to improve our outcomes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for having me as a speaker at this wonderful conference. I'm so sorry I couldn't join you, but congratulations to the organizers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for a very lucid talk on outpatient uh, arthroplasty. I just have one question for you. Uh, what is your antibiotic protocol uh, in case you're doing a outpatient total joint arthroplasty? And is there any increase in the readmission rate uh, in in the first two weeks 
due to some wound problems or anything like that is is there a difference between the standard protocol and the outpatient protocol so our antibiotic regimen is a single dose of iv ansef for most patients and we have decided to repeat that in the recovery room at uh, three to four hours before discharge. And those are the only antibiotics that they get. They do get that second dose before they go. And the second question is uh, about wound healing complications. We have not had a major issue with wound complications. Uh, my data since, since that time in February, where I showed my data, we have another six months and I have had one readmission patient and now in three years since we started in October, 2018 with our outpatient joints program, um, that one patient had a, an infection. So he had a, a reoperation, a readmission uh, and we washed him out. Uh, but other than that, you know, there's not been a single other case. Uh, so anything from the audience? Uh, from the yes, audience? I think somebody's come. Sir, what is your selection criteria for outpatient TK? Is there any distance criteria from the hospital to the patient uh, house or anything? Is that also matter? Selection for outpatient total knee is the question? Yeah. Yes. So I think that, you know, it's first of all indicated based on the arthritis, but most importantly is the patient's willingness to recover. Actually, I found when you talk to a patient and they're, we call a positive descriptive affect, they're upbeat, they're, they're capable, they're eager, um, and they have good family support. Those are very good patients. Um, they cannot have any non-correctable medical disease either. They have to have a, a relatively stable, healthy history. Uh, and then we know that they can be done through anesthesia very safely. Um, so we can't have patients with fixed cardiac disease uh, or severe pulmonary disease. So our anesthesiologists have a list, which I didn't show in my talk of, of exclusion criteria. And most of those are patients with severe medical disease or significant obesity that will complicate the safety of anesthesia. And they're very strict. And I mean, very strict in the outpatient unit about allowing those patients to come into the unit. Um, and if I have any concern, I have a way of, of discussing it before I book the case. Um, but that's, that's important too. The anesthesiologist, to their credit, a very strict anesthesia inclusion criteria. And what is your post-operative advice to the patient so that they can take care of the at the home? Because none of the none of if any patient is not not having any medicals at their home or any good nursing nursing care at the home, so how they will take care of their, themselves? So it's an interesting question as you pose it because we don't use any nursing care at all. We use physical therapy at home, so it's a home health agency a company that goes to their home, but we use therapists to go visit them. We give, we give our nursing, we have, a, we have that group of nurses that work directly with me. We have about five, six nurses and those nurses call the patients. They have scheduled phone calls from my group, but we don't trust the, you know, the uh, other patients, uh, other nurses to go out. We have our nurses, but we do send physical therapists to the home and that's all they need. We have not found an increased need for nursing care because that we have a very stable medication regimen and we have a stable wound care regimen. And so the things that the nurse would otherwise do historically for wound care, dressing changes or medication management, there's no need for those things anymore because we standardize those care. Um, but you do have to have a close partnership with some type of home health agency. And we have, we have formed a relationship here with a local company that does all of our total joint outpatient patients. It means some agency are there to take care of that patient in case of emergency or in case sir. of the home care. Well, this could be the last one there. We're running out of time. Okay. Thank you, Yes, sir. Dr. Lee. Yes, there's, there's, other than the family, there's nobody at home. Other, there's a visiting therapist that comes usually, uh, if it's a morning case, they'll come in the afternoon when the patient's at home. But most typically, they come the next morning. So that gives the patient time to have a, a restful evening. And then the therapist comes the next morning. And then day two, the nurse, my nurse will call the patient to converse with them and talk with them about how they're doing, get updates again at day seven. And then they see us at day 14, my, my physician assistant, um, they get a check-in, they get a wound check, the staples would come out, for example, and then they see me at six weeks. Right. Thank you very much. I think uh, I must put across to all our Indian delegates that uh, because of paucity of drugs, which are not available with us, it's, we are still a bit... Uh, too early in the system that we can discharge our patients the same day, especially uh, in areas which are away from tertiary care hospitals like ours. We were still able to do it because we have a system running. 
uh, uh, we have opioids available, but then, but then you must realize that long acting uh, local anesthetics and availability of ultrasounds to give all those blocks is not a very common feature in India. As a matter of fact, to keep an ultrasound machine in a smaller setup in India will be next to, it's, it would be impossible because there will be a PDNT act which will be working on you. So we still far off as far as the periphery is concerned, but Ranjana has given an excellent overview of the whole thing. And I think if you all start trying it and you may get away with it. Uh, same day discharge should also take into account the number of hours it is. The first cases which are done are normally discharged by evening, but then most of nearly all our patients would be walking in the say on the same day, and then it's up to them to decide to, to go back home. And we have a lot of logistical issues in India. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee and Dr. Anjana, and we uh, hand you back to the organizers. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'd like to move on to the next session, which is alignment and total knee arthroplasty. I, we'd like to invite our moderators, Professor S. L. Nag and Professor Abhay, Abhay, Abhay Ellens for as moderators for this session. Hello. 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 Yeah, go ahead. You can start now. Thank you. So share my screen. Um, thank you for inviting me. And I think the session on alignment is a very important session. Uh, we heard this morning a lot about technology and the technology will help us to be precise and reaching the goal. But um, I think it is more in doubt whether the one goal is really the right goal for all the patients. And my talk is on, on ligaments variability and I will show you that a varus knee is not a varus knee. So um, classical varus knee as, as we all describe it from the bony side, um, you, you see it here, HKA, uh, uh, below 177. The MPTA uh, is often also uh, below 88. And uh, from the femoral side, the medial condyle is more prominent than the lateral. From the ligaments, if, if you look in the literature, the definitions for a varus knee is um, that the lateral extension gap is larger, larger than the medial one. The lateral flexion gap is larger than the medial flexion gap and the flexion gap overall is larger than the extension gap. But if you look into both definitions a bit more into detail, and Michael Hirschman has done that for the um, bony anatomy, and he found out that um, there are 43 phenotypes um, from the bony side uh, in various knees. So that is the consequence no number one. There is not a single bony type of varus knees. When we look at the ligamentous situation, we have analyzed uh, 1,000 of our uh, navigated knees uh, uh, regarding that classical definitions. And we found that only 65% of the patients meet all these three criteria. The other 35 uh, does not. So in general, of course, a varus knee has uh, those three criteria, um, but there's a big difference between extension and flexion. So in extension, you find a high correlation between the amount of varus deformity 
and the gap difference between medial and lateral side. So that means if you have a varus, for example, of five degrees, there's a difference in the extension gap between two and three millimeters. In 10 degrees of varus, as you see here, it's around four and a half to five and a half. And in 15, it goes up to um, seven to 10 millimeters. In the uh, flexion gap, that, um, um, uh, that correlation is not there. And this is also shown here in that slide. So the left upper one here, that is showing the high correlation between the amount of deformity and the difference in the extension gap. And the more you flex the knee, the lower this correlation is. So consequence number two, the ligamentous varus knee does not exist. You need to analyze the knee individually. So there are of course various knees that have a huge difference in the flexion gap too, but there are also some other various knees that have a equal um, flexion gap medial lateral side. So it is very individual. What is the relevance for the surgical technique for both the findings? If you look at the classical goals we have in the TKI surgery, when it comes to alignment, we want to correct the knee to zero plus minus three. And if we look at the gaps, we want to have all gaps equal. What do we change by reaching the goals and how good are we in reaching the goals? So therefore we have analyzed again our 1000 data set and um, all those knees had been navigated, gap balance technique and adjusted mechanical alignment tibia first. And first of all, we analyzed how good are we in reaching the goal? And here you see black alignment, three degree corridor, not 94. If you look at all gaps equal, the extension gap uh, overall 96%, flexion gap 97, and flexion to extension gap uh, in 90%. The subgroups um, um, also show a very high um, degree of um, reaching the goal. So with this technique, yes, we are able to reach the goals for both, for alignment and for balance. But if you look at the resection analysis we have done, um, then you see that you change a lot in the knees. So if you do a zero cut on the, on the tibia in those various knees, the overall amount of cut on the medial side is two millimeters, lateral side uh, seven to nine. So you only have 8% of the knees where you have changes on the medial tibia side less than two millimeters. The great, great majority, and that is the more severe the deformity, the higher the percentage uh, you change um, with your cut more than four millimeters. For the lateral tibia plateau, um, you see that that is a, a lot different, but still almost 50% changes um, by two millimeters. Distal femur, um, medial and lateral distal femur, um, minimal changes for the medial, um, the best, almost 90%. But when you look at the posterior um, condyles, you see, the medial condyle, again, anatomical reconstruction in, in 80%. Lateral posterior condyle, um, only in 10%. So yes, we reached the goal, but this is based on partially non-anatomic resection. And maybe that is one of the reasons why we have 20% unhappy patients. And that not only the precision, because we have shown precision is high, we reach the goals, but um, um, the, the uh, non-anatomical resections, that uh, can be a problem. What options do we have for individualized TKA? And there are a lot of different uh, alignment philosophies now on the market. And um, you can do it tibia first or femur first. And if you do tibia first, your, your tibia cut is uh, in most of the alignment philosophies orientated on the MPTA um, or on the cartilage loss of the patient. 
Um, so you have, uh, for example, the options of constitutional virus, anatomical alignment, or patient-specific um, technique, um, where you all place your TBIs in a more anatomic position in, in an individual virus. The limitations of those tibia first techniques is that the femoral cuts are not fully anatomical. So you have to have a compromise then on the femoral side. And it's the other way around if you do it femur first. You're very precise with reconstructing the anatomy of the femur with the restricted or um, uh, fully kinematic alignment. But then the limitations come on the tibia side. And that's not only based on for the um, for the bony resections but in the kinematic alignment it's more on the balancing side so they have different balancing goals for example defined so their lateral uh, their lateral flexion gap in the end should be larger than the medial one yes that is uh, in a lot of patients more anatomical um, but um, in some patients it is not and the third options, uh, the third option we have is a, is a gap first technique. So you restore first of all the gap envelope. So take out all the osteophytes, um, and uh, then second, uh, you place your tibia and your femur as anatomical as possible. But that is technically very demanding, uh, especially when it comes to the posture of uh, osteophytes. So that is something uh, we're not able to do at, at the moment. So to summarize, uh, um, I think that is the, the important message from, from that talk is um, knees have a large bony and ligamentous variability. It is not the single type of various knee that exists. So please analyze your, your various knees. And you can do that pre-op with the image uh, uh, analysis, but you should also do it interop again for the ligament situation. With navigated standard TK technology, uh, we're able to reach uh, the goals in a very high percentage, however, due to non-anatomical resections. And we believe a more individual anatomical approach might help to improve outcome. However, a single surgical technique, even with modern alignment characteristics like kinematic alignment, constitutional virus, whatever, will not solve all the problems because it is still one technique fits all the knees. And that is, I believe, not the case. An approach has to respect the bony anatomy and the ligamentous situation for each patient individually. And that uh, might be the future direction. We still have the unanswered questions. What is the perfect knee? Is her knee the perfect knee? Is his knee the perfect knee? And if it comes to the patient, should I reconstruct her knee to the same situation like her knee or his knee? I don't know. And um, in the end, are all the goals um, for all the different knees identical? So is it for a virus knee really a good goal to align it in maybe two degrees of virus or maybe that individually needs four? I don't know. And um, that's the same, and I think even more difficult for the valgus knees. However, how shall we get answers without quantitative data? And that's why I think robotic surgery will help us, or it's the only option to, uh, to um, answer all those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we'll take the questions from the audience in the end. Now we invite the next speaker, Stefano. Hello. Yeah, yes, please. Hello. Hello, and uh, thank you again for inviting me to speak at the CCA and to be with my friends and names. Professor Lamontra, thank you again for inviting me and Dr. Dimitri uh, Khan for organizing the event. Uh, I am uh, delighted to have the opportunity to talk with you again. I was in, uh, in, in, in Delhi. Uh, being the first, I think, uh, to make a knee replacement uh, five years ago, I think now. It's such a, such a pleasure. Um, and I'll get the opportunity to give you a bit 
a little oversight of what's happened since then. A lot of information has come out of my data, and I want to share with you. And also going to the with the community. And I decided to follow along with one lecture. I hope it's not too long uh, because it's just hard to pick it up. Um, so let me share with you my deck and uh, we'll get started. Okay, so pyramid alignment, the evidence of change in surgical technique. Again, I'm speaking on media and I get quickly. So let's have this set. The goal for all total neuroplasts, I think we all agree, is that we want our patients to forget their anatomy replacement. We want them to restore the meaning to its pre arthritic level of function. And the KATK philosophy is really designed around that. The knee, your mother made you, was pretty close to perfect. Um, the goal should be to recreate that function as it was prior to injury wear or trauma. And all we have to do truly is to replace the worn cartilage and loss bone, and we will not have to do any releases. I mean, keep the posterior cruciate movement, which in our case is crucial. crucial. So, just very quickly, how we do it at the end of the day, we just want to recite the same amount of bone and cartilage on the distal femur, on the medial and lateral side, and the posterior. Similarly, we want to shave off the same amount of bone immediately and laterally to the proximal tibia on where it was prior to surgery. In the operating room, we love to see this sort of picture. We have the resection being measured, which is why we call it palpable based alignment technique. I want that thickness to equal the femoral condo of the component when we're done. So the femoral condo is eight and a half millimeters, the saw is a millimeter and a half. And you have to have seven millimeters of bone, that's cartilage and bone together. And if you've lost cartilage, then maybe it's just five millimeters of bone. And posteriorly, you might have like six to eight millimeters of bone, depending on whether or not the cartilage is left. Hopefully, that makes some sense, but we'll talk about that in a fair bit. That's what a distal femur. And proximally, just like this picture, you want to pick off the same amount of bone on both sides. But you may make some adjustments. The tibia does lose more bone. That was bone period, and you may have to take a, a, a preliminary cut to see if you got it right. But in theory, or in the end, you want that cut to be parallel to the distal femoral cut in extension. All right, let's go take a step back and challenge some accepted anatomy because it does make it, it does impact how we think about genetic alignment, especially post operatively. So, constitutional virus is something that Melvin's uh, champion. In 2012, and I think nine years down the road, it's finally being accepted that there is a normal distribution um, within uh, human anatomy, and that very few people, less than 2%, are actually in mechanical alignment. 32% of males are more than three degrees on axis, and 17% are females. The native tibia is not relative, is not vertical relative to the floor, is not a point. There's this assumption that the tibia is vertical. Well, it was drawn that way. And we assume that normal patients who don't have any arthritis would have a vertical tibia. But in reality, we looked up 65 patients standing anxious. We found that in various things, the tibial axis orientation angle, or the angle that the tibia itself tends to the floor, is almost five degrees in normal people without arthritis. The tibia is not vertical. We should try to restore it to that position. But it never was in that position. It's a very good. The native jawline is neutral to the floor. That's another interesting concept we show in a number of papers. Bioarchies are follow to the lytic axis of liquid standing, no matter what happens with the tibia below it. And the jawline of liquidity is not affected by constitutional barracks. What does that mean? That means if you look at me on the video, and no matter what happens, nature keeps that tibia parallel to the floor, the, the jawline, regardless of what happens below it. Um, in terms of the tibia uh, and its relation to the floor. Let's talk a little bit about the soft tissue envelopes. We talked about alignment and said that the soft tissue envelopes are different. We've been taught to do balance flexion and extension caps. There was a reason for that many years ago. But right now, if we're trying to restore normal anatomy, what do we learn? We learn that extension, the knee absolutely has very balanced extension caps. If you put any healthy knee, full extension, put a medial barrier, a barrier and all those stress is rock solid. If you do a heel strike, you want to put the heel strike, and all those loads will be transferred very, very well to the knee, healthy and stable. But the minutes of any knee need to twist and turn and bend. It's not a hinge. It allows rollback, but allows on the lateral side. The medial side 
then tends to stay pretty consistently as a medial pivot. We now consider that. And that pivoting is a lot by having a lateral function that we see on this picture to the right. It's a good three or four millimeters. If it wasn't, we couldn't do the near velocity. That's why that picture is there. If you think about it, in extension, you're not going to miss those as you need. But in flexion, it's hard on the other side, it's easier on the lateral side. And if it goes over that gap, we would be able to do a miscount. So we now know that you've experienced that the lateral side should not be tight. Now, let's talk about the Bowling average for a bit. We've been thinking for many, many years that the rotational axis of the femur is a transit of the axis. But the last 10 to 15 years, we started talking about the fact that the cylindrical axis of the femur, a line that bisects the spheres that would be dependent by the condyle, is actually the rotational axis. And the bottom right is that it's a three dimensional model of actual CT scan of patient's knee. The green line, which is parallel to the posterior condyle axis, and is also parallel to the distal front line, is the actual rotational axis. The yellow one wouldn't make sense, which is the transit of the axis. Right? If you think about it as a wheel or a car with an axle between it. I will also mention there's a picture about the mechanical axis is not neutral in 98% of the population. But that's the going end is similar to the briefing world. Now, the idea that the cylindrical axis can be achieved simply by resecting bone, the same amount of bone from the distal femur and the posterior femur, has been challenged to a degree because of patient's anatomies. And sometimes it can create an offset as much as one millimeter and can put the toe and the only to move more down as they started. But it's certainly much closer than the than the axis. All right. The other anatomical thing we have to keep in mind is this idea that the lateral femoral condyle is not hypoplastic. And that would suggest that if it was hypoplastic, we can't use the posterior condyle or axis because it's hypoplastic. But in fact, the truth is the lateral femoral condyle is not hypoplastic. And we looked at 6,829 MRIs to prove it. In fact, we found that the lateral femoral condyle is slightly larger by 1.2 millimeters on average than the medial femoral condyle. And it does set the rotational axis if you know quite well. The articular cartilage thickness is something else that we talk about a lot in kinematic alignment because we need to know how much cartilage to replace with your man, how much bone we want to remove with this looking And we looked at three almost 4,000 MRIs and found that in fact two millimeters is a good number. Two and a half, 2.2 millimeters is reasonable. So in summary, the anatomy has changed a little bit in the last decade. We now know knitted knee is perfectly well balanced in extension. No release is required. Let's see if we can keep that. The native extension and flexion gaps are not symmetric. This allows for rollback and flexion, and it's gapping on the lateral side or the medial side space tight. The native knee is not in the alignment, so trying to put everybody back into the mechanical alignment is not necessarily required to try to restore normal anatomy. And the native lateral condyle is not hypoplastic. That's just a bigger than the medial lateral condyle. We learned the rotational axis of the native knee is the cylindrical axis, not the transit condyle axis. And then the tube is not vertical and standing. That's an important mind shift. Uh, if you look at the post operative x rays, you don't want to look for the vertical tibia and the post operative knees. We want to see any uh, horizontal thermal. All right, let's get into how this is. Um, and I'll show you this again later, um, but it's an interesting concept. How do I reset the same line of both sides? Here I am actually removing the cartilage of the bone because I've developed this sub, uh, uh, subcondyl technique for my mind because I never know exactly how much bone is lost. You notice we move the osteophytes, that takes the tension off of our ligaments, and we put the cutting block straight down to the bone so that when the pins go down, we reset the equal amounts of bone on both sides. Once we've done the intersections, we use a caliper to measure that intersection to make sure that it actually is as expected. It makes sense, makes sense, makes sense. We then can use the poster condyle to set rotation at zero, which gives us a correct poster condyle axis. And if we do that, we'll have equal amounts of bone resecting both sides. And since you resect the bone equally, you can now put the trial component in before you do the tibia, and the implant will be completely stable because the collateral is. At this point, we can do some resection of the proximal tibia. 
measuring, trying to measure you guys at that close time. How well was it? And if you did correctly, then you will be log solid in expansion. So when you go to collection, the ego size stays very tight and we'll talk a bit and the lateral side will come up just like it would in a bigger four position for the air flux. If you feel like you need to recap the tip, you can because you have lost the extension, change the slope. Either way, you're going to get a super stable mean. And then and the beauty of it is, even though you have the one that proposes your conjugal axis, which is internally rotated relative to the top level, that line you will see that the top track is absolutely perfectly central. And we'll see that in a minute. And that is because this, if you look at this x ray, uh, you will see, you will have seen, sorry, we passed a little bit, that the uh, trope there is actually smack bang in the middle of the two columns. It is not actually in front of it once the patient stands up because of the common work which goes with its normal head. All right, so now let's go on to um, the data. So, does kinematic alignment restore? The joint line to the to be parallel to the floor. And what you see here is a really lovely article by uh, Dr. G showing that kinematic lines tonings can align the internal to the horizontal. What you see on the far right is the distribution. At the very top, these are normal control. At the bottom, these are kinematic lines, low means, which very much respect that distribution. Whereas with conventional or navigated tones trying to restore, trying to create. What previously was a there was in the tank alignment, you see they shift the alignment of the joint over towards um, zero as opposed to the where it was. Um, and this is another article looking at joint line alignment. This is by Hutton and Company, um, and showing uh, this is in terms of stain 55 to 9 by John Weaves, uh, showing that you get the slight virus line on post op, but the joint orientation remained neutral as post op, which is up to one. It's perfectly restoration of native alignment. All right. Um, how about the ankle? There's a number of people now being interested in what happens to the fawn of the ankle, especially if you go to try to do these uh, unusual kinematic alignment needs. And what we found in 90 kinematic alignment needs versus 90 mechanical alignment needs, you want to stand in the grass by people's stands that the tail of the fawn and film closes laterally in the mechanical alignment and were restored to normal alignment in kinematic alignments. So KA not only restores your jawline and the, and the knee, but, and it makes sense, retains a normal orientation at the feet of the fawn. How about knee abduction moments? There's a lot of concern about uh, putting the tibia varus and increasing the, um, the, the load of the knee. And this is a gain analysis study that an average of 3.6 years post op by uh, Nikhil and Japan, and finding that the jaw of liquidity that is created by restoring normal anatomy actually reduced peak knee abduction moments, and particularly so in patients with constitutional varus. So, in fact, the more varus the pupil jaw is relative to the pupil anatomic axis, but keep in mind that that should be parallel to the floor the whole time, you're actually stabilizing, normalizing the knee joint. And this is exactly what I found in the study that I did in, deep, in, uh, in vitro. Um, we, we do loading parameters. We use a micro strain, we text scan and pressure mapping, and we find the cuts and neutral cuts, and a heel strike we found almost a 70% reduction in strain and bone. So in other words, kinematically aligning the and restoring normal anatomy actually decreases the stress in the bone, doesn't increase it. We did a similar study with finite analytic modeling. In that one, the number was not quite as drastic that we saw on the, on the actual cadaver bones. But what we did find here uh, is that the, uh, the, the sort of was an increase in strength that many people have predicted. Now, if that doesn't persuade entirely, uh, what about tibial contact pressures and kinematic line needs? What found was that the contact pressures in vitro, when you do a kinematically aligned knee, were very similar to normal knees from 0 to 20 inch motion that are off in 2017. Contact pressure video showed 4x lower contact pressure in kinematic alignment compared to mechanical alignment. That's a graphic to the right that it means are in 2016. And the Desion showed twice lower contact pressures. Uh, and much and uh, fifty percent more likely to have optimal balance and forty percent less likely to do a recap than compared to the alignment in the people five and test in twenty twenty. 
the biggest concern frequently is this idea of the medial compartment overload. So again, the data that's a lot. Outlier patients, those with more than three degrees of varus on the tibia compared to tibial anatomic axis, found that intraoperative forces uh, were closer to those in range. In other words, there was no difference in stress in outliers in the uh, intraoperative forces using the uh, sensors. Uh, there's been no increase in uh, migration patterns of tibias putting through medical island using RSA compared to mechanical. Um, there is reduced intensity and frequency of dynamic edge loading, uh, 27 paints. Paradoxically, decreased tibial cord constraint, that was my paper, and loosened tibial component very, very well at two to 10 years of analysis. Now, what if the loads, even though I just showed a bunch of data suggesting loads are lower in kinetic loading, what if the loads are big? Well, today's implants can handle higher loads as well. So, not the same polyethylene, but not the same people trace that we put in 20 years ago. And just like these cars take corners at very different speeds, our implants could handle higher load, even though we're not actually putting them under higher load. So, what are the clinical results? Um, in terms of aseptic loosening, it does not seem to be a problem. Um, as mentioned, it actually decreases strain. I think it's protected. And we've seen a couple of articles with uh, significant numbers of the medical findings showing um, no, a normal cumulative survivorship. You know, tenants get their hair granted, some of these follow up for six years, seven years, we don't have a ton of data yet, and we'll come. But we should have seen um, a massive failure if the concerns of the, uh, of the detractors of this technique were not been true. Um, in terms of clinical reported outcomes, this is a paper by Mello in the uh, British Journal 2014. So the pneumatic line means were three times more likely than mechanical to report helium normalcy. Semi patients um, in a Sheldon paper uh, reported 15 points higher uh, for joint score. Um, and in a paper that for Blakeney and all in 2018 showed that uh, restricted decay. Okay, K and DK uh, showed no difference in mechanical MG or cruise force. At least it was not worse than it was the same. And we're just a that by my time right there. Another paper, no difference in clinical results between Hughes, Arthur, et cetera, Watson, Asia in 2016. Um, another article by Young and all, uh, 1990s, PSI versus CAST. They did allow the reading and release, uh, showed excellent equivalent, uh, equivalent results for five years. Um, essentially, you can look at yourself. These are all, all the papers that such a show either the equivalent or slightly better uh, results with kinematic alignment or mechanical. So, what is restricted kinematic alignment or RPK? The idea that there's a safe range, the cuts have to be within five degrees of the tibial mechanical axis, and that number of years by the author, uh, and that the overall alignment should not be more than three degrees mechanical uh, or. Would be acceptable. Um, it's difficult to execute accurately. Um, there's PSI and robotics animation that does help, and almost always in a more aggressive uh, bears will require and uh, subreddits. But this technique is, is relatively popular. Um, however, they're not showing much improvement. They're showing that restricted K is as good as totally a placement in terms of mechanical uh, results. Um, and slightly better mechanical pressures in surgery. There's been a meta analysis, in fact, there's been a few, but this is the best one, except for my at all, presented a site that's got Look, the systemic review, any paper that I want you to follow, found that comparable that comparable or superior clinical outcomes, overall with the middle line are similar, and the general line the patient angle is powerful before, more often than the mechanical outcomes. And the complication rate is no different between the two. These are papers to write that we're using in the ER. The six published meta analyses overall showing better well like uh, scores in general, better overall function, general similar complications, problems similar, function occasionally better, usually if it's, if it's measuring the excess. And this is the world literature of the four outcomes of kinematic design use down to two should the pain technique as the final I have. Um, so this important. Uh, it's been out for at least 15 years now. If there was a problem, we should be done by that. Um, but this is usually the slide that is shown at some meetings when I'm in uh, 
asked to, to tell, you know, say why, you know, this is a problem we can't collect. The number of urges. This is a mean that failed in Paris because it was a poorly executed mechanical polite mean. It's not a kinematical polite mean. You can't say this failed. And then say, you know, the mechanical line doesn't fail in Paris. And that is the problem with the kinematic alignment. That's not the way it works. The kinematic line does not fail in this way. This is, this is a primary problem of mechanical alignment. And I have a theory about why that is. As to do with the fact that the amount of pressure that is small, I was just too tight. But the other thing to keep in mind as we look forward and try to uh, capture these results and try to show the outcome is that weight bearing x ray alignments are prone to massive error caused by both hip rotation and flexion contractions. It's really, really hard to get good numbers off an x ray. And further, patient for outcome measures have massive ceiling effects. For the KSS, it's 53%, for the OPS, it's 33%, Molmec is 30% on the pain side, fortunately, 10% on the function side, which is why it's a good score, better one of the better scores. But even if we're talking about those scores, it's 16% uh, ceiling effect. And furthermore, if you look in the KU literature, there's a very, uh, there's growing variation in how it's defined. So there's a bit, we're having a trouble, a little bit of trouble. Um, uh, defining uh, the outcome of that and that climate. So the work I'm doing and some others are doing is trying to find a way to use objective measures. In this case, sensors are important. And from Google, you've heard of them, um, to, to create a predictive analytic platform to a grant at the university uh, to be to do the research. And we've been looking to apply sensors directly in joints and create algorithms that are designed for the replacement of patients and hopefully. Um, find someone to identify some objective measures that allows to differentiate um, the results at the very highest end of our uh, surgical skills and our inputs. Okay, so I looked at India. Uh, you guys deal with some very advanced uh, disease. And so often people say, well, that's easy if you have a you know, relatively straightforward hand. I'm going to show you some crazy x rays. Um, just showing that it's not necessarily true. So this is a lady patient with 13 degrees of bearing on the tibial shaft on the on the joint from the prior injury. And what you see on the picture in the middle is that uh, we've restored that alignment uh, to two degrees off of the transit. I'm not quite as embarrassed, but it looks really worrisome, right? You can start about that picture until you put the patient standing. Now when you see a standing X-ray, it's the knee to the right. And the jawline is parallel to the floor with this patient's back. There are no stress, unusual stress on this joint. And she loves that knee. Whereas the other knee, somebody tried to do a uh, mechanically aligned knee, and you see that a lot of trouble uh, getting that knee to be stable, and that went through a lot of releases and used a thick insulin. And she does not like that knee at all. In fact, this is how she functions. Um, oops, sorry. This is how she functions uh, in clinic for about two or three months out of surgery. And she's super happy with that knee. I mean, compared to the other knee, this knee doesn't swell, it doesn't hurt, and it feels like to her like a normal knee. Um, this is another uh, post traumatic gentleman, and uh, I've done a fair number of post traumatic deformities. And you see how embarrassed he has on his knee preoperatively. Um, and you're probably familiar with knees like this, and aims for sure, probably be. No, not not very similar to the kinetic knee, but what I'm showing to the right is that we actually did do a kinetic knee. After we be ossified, so we had no problems with the collateral. You see, his post up of extra suggests that the um, that the knee was pretty straight. He was very happy with his overall outcome and did very very well. Um, there's also something I'm doing now where I'll take some stiff uh, knees that were taken out of there, so I put into mechanical alignment. Uh, with a significant change in the overall uh, joint line, this is a five degree variance. I'll then take them out of, uh, of neutral line and put them back into Paris, adjust the beam on for them, and then we're having great results. It's an interesting technique. Uh, Post traumatic, uh, this is a challenging patient. She had seven operations. She had a beauty. You can see all the barriers of the bone above the nail. The nail is clearly in the way. It would be very difficult to remove this nail. Um, and maybe not even a great idea, given that she does have some uh, problems uh, proximally. And so, how can you do this without removing the nail? Well, you do not need an inch tank for a guy with a robot, or even without the robot, we often do this. 
So I'm sure what happened is that I was not really, uh, a pre upper lecture. This generally allowed to turn and turn. But you can see that when she's standing, it doesn't look like so bad. In fact, it's just fine. She's going to be the various pre upper she's going to be the various post up. And you can see in a second that the needle is really straight. I love to help you use the mouse. It's actually a trauma surgeon's mouse. I can't use the mouse. And uh, this is her watch. And kind of one more follow up. There's another patient that a uh, very complex is the level for her. Again, she's the drug like back to neutral, and this is her walking. I'm very happy with her results. And you can and uh, didn't have to do the hard work, didn't have to uh, give me a neutral this one with the with the manual instruments as a robot. Um uh, she was quite happy with this before. And then there's another patient with a post-traumatic deformity, and uh, you can see this post off lecture here, sorry. Type of sequence. Uh, you see what you can looking like. So we have amino threads, and uh, and uh, he. Uh, I want to show you him walking. There it is. Uh, yeah. oh, oops. Yeah. There we go. Anyway, that's him about a year out, and he was super happy with that knee. Uh, no osteotomies required, um, and just respect. Um, so this is a very flexible technique. You can tackle three difficult operations. Um, I want to remind you what call me a turnaround client is not. It is not a vast digital capture. Um, it is it requires a sterilization of the hand and the device at the same time. Um, sorry, that's what I want to say. Was that if you start a rotation from the point like you do in a kind of alignment and you accidentally put the tip in there, you're going to create a lot of closer around a conflict. There, where you should be opening, you're actually tightening down, and that creates problems with the patient and then eventually the tip. Okay, with that, uh, I have to tell you my journey started in summer 2013 and continues to unfold as we learn more and more about this interesting technique. I'm sure there's going to be a different innovation technique that there was in the camp for over the years. So, give this certain place. And uh, we have launched the Personalized Orthoplasty Society. Uh, soon we'll be taking members um, just to bring together those of us who are interested in discussing uh, personalized unis, personalized full hips, personalized full knees, um, and, uh, and and have a place to have that conversation. Thank you again to my friends at Games and the CCA Point Point One. Please feel free to follow me on LinkedIn or on Twitter where I talk mostly about digital orthopedics. Um, I just want to be part of it. You can one on one sort of review the technology that's changing our world if you're interested in that. Uh, with that, I will need to stop sharing. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, a long talk. But lots of different interesting stuff to, to address, and it's just better than just an hour to all. And we'll go into the robotic technique on the next one. All right. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Binney. Uh, very exhaustive and lots of data. Very, very interesting to think about. So we'll go on to the next talk, which is value of CT based robot in total knee arthroplasty. Martin Roche, all yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, great talk, Stefano. We'll um, follow through before his surgery on where the value of a CT based robotic knee is, because as we know from the first two speakers, each knee is individual and each knee has its own set of alignment parameters as well as soft tissue balance. And we need to know where we are both sagittally, coronally, and rotationally prior to any surgery. These are my disclosures. So why did I go with the CT-based approach? I wanted to obtain preoperative data based on anatomic intraoperative laxity curves, <clears throat> and then an execution that was accurate and safe. And when we think of CT-based, we have to think of the whole program. We have CT-based planning, we have haptic technology, and we have insightful data and, analyt and analytics about that patient's knee and function. So the value of it is it expands my resurfacing arthroplasty options. I can go from a partial knee to a bi-uni to a total very accurately. And as you can see, once you trust the system, you spend less time looking in the knee 
and distracting it and more time accurately resecting the planes three-dimensionally that you want. It protects the PCL to a degree that I've never seen. So my knee now functionally is a much more stable knee in the sagittal plane. And if I need to make quick refinement cuts due to the knee being contracted, I can do that efficiently and accurately. Stryker acquired the technology and in 2016, we were able to perform the first total knee arthroplasty. And we are learning because now we have data. We don't look at standing x-rays anymore. We look at three-dimensional views. So it's more predictable, showing improved patient outcomes and satisfaction. And it really takes the three core elements, enhanced planning, dynamic joint balancing. Now we have sensors to look at rotation and kinematic rollback, and then execution with safety. So core features, the CT en enables me to look from the hip all the way to the ankle, look at extra articular deformity and look at anatomical planes. Intraoperatively, I can dynamically joint balance whether I want equal gaps, rectangular gaps or trapezoidal gaps. We've learned that the position of the femur and tibia, both in sagittal and coronal planes affects this. Haptics enables me to efficiently perform my surgery. And this link to a single radius, which allows me from 10 to 90 degrees, achieve kinetic rollback. I can push, position this knee and obtain stability through the soft tissue, not having to worry on constraint. So let's walk through the CT. And I think we spend a lot of time on the coronal plane, but we don't always give full not knowledge to the sagittal plane. So if you look in the upper right-hand corner, we can recreate the patient's flexion moment and make sure we are anatomically fit to their articular margin. This enables us to place the femur sagittally to obtain isometric position to start with. Now this can be based on soft tissue ligament laxity, or if you have a theoretical anatomical approach, that can be adjusted. We can look at the trochlea because the trochlea impingement, soft tissue, especially in the valgus knees can be a problem. The tibia, you can recreate the patient's slope. You can look at the bone quality, thickness, and overall alignment. So here we can look at our different axes. We don't, we don't have the cylindrical on there yet. We can look at where the implant will fit. Will there be impingement? Are there posterior osteophytes? And how does it match? It enables us to look at the resection landmarks. You can look at the rotation and the position. But what's very interesting in the single radius is that if you place the femur in the appropriate position, as I flex the knee, you can see I'm not distalizing or posteriorizing through the flexion arc. So this enables me to fit the knee perfectly and not worry about impingement or non-anatomic positioning through a full range of motion. That's been very powerful. And by decompressing the trochlea, we have less worries about our femoral rotation in regards to patellar tracking instability. So as you'll see from the surgery next, you can preoperatively define your alignment, your resection thicknesses, and not worry after cutting, measuring them and they may not be appropriate. And what's been very interesting to me on the CT, if we do take equal resections, the variance in the coronal plane on the femur ranges from one degree of varus to nine degrees of valgus, but that gives you information going into the knee. And one thing that's not talked about a lot is your sagittal plane in terms of the patient in recurvatum. And you can see this now before you go in. It's very good with hardware. You can get around hardware. You can position it well. You can understand what bone defects, what re you can retain and what you have to resect. And very good with extra articular deformity as well. Anytime you're bringing a new technology, you have to have a partnership with either the hospital, you have to show clinical excellence, and you have to evolve now into the outpatient setting, which this enables us to do. Surgical efficiencies have to be looked at, minimal instrumentation. I know the sizes, I know my instrumentation needed. I get dynamic feedback, I have stereotactic boundaries, and I can efficiently go through the process. The workflow entails preoperative planning, the cons consistent setup, 
array placements, registration to the patient's bone. We now can input the patient's ligamentous laxity, which is variable in each patient. And we don't have to address each patient with the same anatomic position. In my clinical experience, the accurate bone resection, and as importantly, the protection of the PCL has changed the stability factors in my sagittal plane tremendously. This enables me with accuracy to now start looking at the values of cemented versus press fit. Um, you know you're going to have an accurate bone resection. You know you're going to have an accurate fit. And so that enables you to have the confidence that you can put a press fit in every time if you wanted to. The dynamic joint balancing is based off navigation. We're applying a stress. And I just wanted to show you a quick case where this valgus deformity, I take poses and flexion and extension. And you can see it's six degrees of valgus. The lateral compartments are tight in both flexion and extension in these static poses. But what we need to understand is what's the inherent laxity within the soft tissue envelope after you've removed osteophytes. So here we can stress the knee, not in full extension with blocks, but you have to unlock the knee in about 10 to 15 degrees, and you can apply a varus valgus stress to look at your overall ligament laxity. And you can see in this case, my flexion gap opened up nicely, but my extension gap, which is common in my valgus knees, is tighter than my medial side. What we can do here before we even cut is to now adjust the implant relative to this patient's anatomy and soft tissue balance gaps needs. So in this case, I can pin the femur on the medial distal femur because the medial column is now stable, and I can rotate the lateral wheel of the femur into valgus, opening up that extension gap, placing the uh, femur more anatomic and achieving stability through bone resection. It also enables me to understand how much valgus I will place and is three or four degrees the barrier or border I'd like to achieve. I then look at the anatomic positioning of the knee sagittally relative to my moves before I execute the cut. And then I perform the cut, place the trials. So here you can see now I have equal gaps by just two millimeters of resection, both in flexion. My lateral side in flexion, I do like looser than my medial side because I have my PCL there. And when I look at the dynamic aspect of that stress strain, I see equal extension laxity. Without an ACL, I am expecting about two millimeters. I confirm my rotation, my soft tissue pressures, both in flexion and extension and test my sagittal stability to achieve a well-balanced knee. I can then look at the kinetic signature. As was said before, I like a medial pivot lateral rollback to show that my PCL and my MCL is well stabilized. So when we look at the accuracy, the intraoperative predictability of utilizing the CAT scan based, we looked at 500 knees postoperatively and standing x-rays, even though there is some variance, we showed a very tight correlation at six weeks between what we saw in the operating room and our poses versus what we saw standing and functioning. And then briefly on clinical outcomes, as it is still within the early days, we had Dr. Mont looked at the accuracy, which we took from the uni compartmental, and he showed that bone cuts and implant positioning were five and three times more precise. So when you have precision, whatever target you're looking for, you can hit accurately. And based on collecting that data, then you can go back and see what you actually did to that patient three-dimensionally, not just in the coronal plane. Safety was looked by Dr. Haddad, Professor Haddad. He has this nice score called the MASTI score where he looked at soft tissue injury and showed statistically significant improvement with haptic protection of the soft tissue, which I've seen also lead to quicker recovery as he showed in his study, both flexion, extension, and quad recruitment. So in conclusion, robotic systems are not all the same. I have learned more from CT-based application and also the ability to use the pivot points and three-dimensionally adjust my implant relative to the patient's anatomy and their soft tissue tension. Select your patients as was shown in the prior slides. Define an anatomical fit for resurfacing. You can recreate um, varus, you can recreate any alignment you want, you can look at your thickness pre-cut. You don't have to guess that you hit it on the nail after you cut it. Personalize the plan. This is gonna be sagittal, coronal, and rotational. 
You can execute the plan accurately and efficiently with haptics. You don't have to dislocate the knee anymore because you're protecting your soft tissue boundaries. With sensors now, you can confirm your kinetic signature and appropriate soft tissue tension. It enables you to properly cement and even move on to the press fit technique. And you can then enjoy the benefits of consistent outcomes. I appreciate your time today. Thank you, Dr. Roj. Uh, before we go to the real life surgery, uh, we'll take a few questions. So if there are any burning questions uh, in the audience, please come forward. Uh, but before I do that, let me start with the two questions. Uh, the first one is to Dr. Bini. Uh, if you see and uh, if, we, if, if we understand uh, the biomechanics of arthritic knees is not the same as the biomechanics of the same knee in a pre-arthritic state, how then do you accurately do your goal setting for your kinematic alignment for your knee in the arthritic state, when you say that you want to align it to its pre-arthritic state. You're making, the, you start the question with an assumption I don't agree with. I think the ligaments are exactly the same length. The collateral ligaments barely change. Um, that's the thing we've seen with the kinematic experience is that the, we were always taught that the collateral ligaments stretch on one side and contract on the other. Now, of course, in huge deformities, I'll have to agree with that particular lateral collateral, but the medial side does not. And so the biomechanics of the knee are, are re restored. The only thing we're doing in a, in a total knee replacement that massively changes the biomechanics is we're resecting the ACL. Now, so I'll give you the fact that both of these resections will give you an ACL deficient knee and also medial meniscus deficient. But to once you um, once you restore the, the 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 alignment, and incidentally, the important thing to remember is that we've been focusing on the tibia for the last thirty years. The trick is the femur. The femur is what defines the joint line. The femur is what defines femoral rotation. The femur is what defines rotation. And if you if you can place your components exactly back where the um, original joint was, in fact, Dr. Roche's slides were beautiful. It shows just how you can really reposition the components, especially with the constant radius of curvature, knee replacement, pretty much exactly where the original femur was. And if you can do that, and all you have to do is cut the tibia in the same, in a position that an extension is exactly parallel. If you don't know exactly where that was, it's simple enough. You simply cut, a, you cut an initial, initial cut and then you recut until you're balanced. And you have, an, you have a restored the, the, the kinematics. Another study that, um, uh, I, I showed the, with the pressure sensors, with the Verisense that uh, showed the Meneghini, so that we also restore far more consistently the pressure points when you do mechanical alignment. And pretty much uh, the experience with the robots, a lot of folks have gone to understanding how this functions and have almost universally gone to a kinematic friendly alignment technique. Most people are not sticking to create straight mechanical when they're doing total knee replacements anymore. If they've had the opportunity to see what restoring normal physiology looks like. One more thing. So if you always, if you think it's so important to restore anatomy or normal mechanics, but then you go and cut the knee in a completely different plane, you can't really say even we've ever done normal mechanics in the replacements. And um, it's simply not what we do. We, we alter mechanics with the exception of that two or 3% of people who are already mechanical alignment. So I would say that uh, in conclusion, fundamentally to answer that question is I disagree with the premise of that question, but thank you for it. <laughs> so if there are no more questions. Uh, I think we can go to the real life surgery. Thank you for your talks, gentlemen. Great talks with Dr. Roche, by the way. Sean, can wait to see you. Okay, sorry, uh, hi, okay, so hello, my name is Peter Albini. I am a professor of research at the University of California, San Francisco, and now we're going to get into the surgical part of our discussion of kinetic alignment, specifically focusing on robotic assisted 
your medical and a total knee replacement. Thanks again to Dr. Mahotra for inviting me and Professor Mike, the professor of the for inviting me and Dr. Mahotra for uh, supporting this entire session. I'm going to share my screen so I can share with you my talk. Um, okay, here we go. So we did cover um, a uh, manual instruments, pure manual and knee, but in case you are here for those lectures, I think I should just cover it real quick and show you a little bit well how we do uh, mechanical and um and against the knee replacement with mechanical instruments in this patient with a embarrassed knee. And just to remind you our goal is simply to respect the same amount of bone and cartilage from all aspects of the knee joint so as to restore its native alignment and therefore not have to make any changes to the collateral ligaments. Okay, so this is, again, a calcul-based technique. Um, I prefer to do what's called, what I would call a subchondral uh, procedure. Measuring procedure is to move the ossifies, move the cartilage, so both sides of the joint break down to the bone. We then put the resection guide to slap up against the bone so that uh, when we put the pin guide in and remove six millimeters of bone, uh, which allows for one year and a half from the saw as well, I've actually got essentially an eight millimeter resection. So we check that on both sides, make sure they're both eight millimeters, and we put the resection jig on, also set that at zero degrees for the left side of the patient so that we do posterior resections that are equal in size and we're still the patient's posterior complex masses. If we do this, you can put the thermal component in, and guess what? We need to be pretty normal because we're going to be now we're going to look at what's going on on the tibial side. I'm going to select the same amount of bone immediately and laterally. Obviously, it's a small loss on the side, but as you can see, we resected the bone well, and the knee is now super stable extension, super stable immediately, and does open up laterally, which we know to be physiologic and as well allow an excellent rollback. In this particular case, we probably needed a little more extension, and so we get a little more bone uh, in the and change the slope a little bit. We've got us a very, very stable knee. Uh, no reflection stability. That is one of the key findings of these things. Super tight immediately, little wax lottery that allows you excellent range of motion, but for all of the top tracks. Never had issues with the top track. So, but we're very solid. I have to say, you know, this is the top of the things. And you know, it's a little more, but routine total news, uh, never had issues. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, move on to the uh, the result of the right knee replacement, uh, which again tries to do the same thing, tries to recite equal amounts of both nearly elaborate than me, get this started, and then pop on the second. All right, so here we go. I prepared this video very recently. I reflect our current technique, and we took we did this on a, a, a lady with a Valgus disease, but I had a, I forgot to put the screenshot, so I apologize. I'll show you a screenshot from the location. So this is it. Uh, stop. Okay, here we go. Stop. All right, so what we're trying to do on this screen, because the surgery was like that line for the work place, it starts um, prior to surgery on a, a screen where the uh, system has taken a CT scan and created a three dimensional model. On your knee. And at this point, you identify the points of those dots, those pink dots right here. Um, and these, these dots here uh, represent the resection height, the point where you think is this almost point, this will be my person to make a resection of six millimeters above. Um, in this case, the system is allowing for carbon, so this is putting 8.5, but the bottom line is uh, we're looking to resect. This is the distal femur. Uh, equal amounts of bone on both sides. This is the posterior combat. Equal amounts of bone on both sides. Um, we will flex and extend the bone component to the shoulder and the notching. Uh, and then on the tibial side, we will set the posterior slope to match that of the lateral tibial slope, which is the easiest to, to identify, obviously. Um, and on the, uh, the curl view, we will uh, take the least disease side and resect. Uh, in this case, a total nine millimeters of bone cartilage and uh, as you saw, uh, on the medial side, we've adjusted for two millimeters of bone loss, which is what we set up that the person had in this particular situation. But that was a different picture, as I mentioned before. I apologize. You'll see the screenshots for the next patient in a second. All right. So moving on, we are here moving on uh, the, the dressing when the staff in the background is already 
set up the robot. Um, I'm looking, showing here uh, to make sure the dressing does not go to uh, the fuel tubercle or four fingerprints uh, below the fuel tubercle for the placement of the pins uh, for the uh, operator. So we're going to uh, place the foot down the foot holder, which fits inside the version of the main tray in the leg holder um, that Stryker uh, offers uh, for this particular procedure. You'll see that it actually comes in quite handy when you have to position the ring in such a way as to enable uh, the robot to achieve the right angle of uh, the effect. So that's how this device is able to see the against the table. And it puts it outside the holder. And then the rest of the preparation is relatively straightforward. Um, these devices we're just checking, they are actually operators that hold the tractor that we will uh, take them out and hold the tractor. Uh, I extended the leg, I've done it kind of both ways, and so at this point, uh, I think it turned the time less than an hour, uh, turned it acceptable. Uh, the autonomy is nothing too unusual, it's a medial parapetal autonomy. On the medial side, we're back approximately 30% of the way back to the tibia, well before the end cell insertion, but that is the extent of the episode of the patient. Uh, here I'm going to do a patella release cyclone. It's taking the bone down on the nose of the patella on the axis of the patella itself. And then uh, once I get to the tip of the nose, well, we can take the, with, uh, the soft tissue uh, that's adhered to it onto the scar. And if we release it, you are able to do a patella release like this. Um, also, make sure that I restore the height and the orientation of the patella itself, but we prefer to have pelvic patella design. And I will put this clamp on in such a way that the saw blade will hit the corners of the cartilage bone junction uh, um, yeah. um, on both the medial and set, which uh, assures me that the patella tract is orthogonal. We then measure the height of the patella to ensure that we more or less where we were. And pretty much all the telekinetic clamps have a this sort of design, and therefore, as so long as those planes are parallel and the center of the patella sits inside the clamp and the clamp itself is parallel to the cuts, you know that you're orthogonal to the patella head. So now we do a little uh, autonomy and we have respect to the uh, synovium. I do this on pretty much every patient. Then I want to place our uh, pins uh, intra, uh, inside the wound. There are some people that place them much higher on the pelvic shaft. I don't see any reason to do that. This works just fine. Um, in addition to be able to see the reflect the, the, the sensor, the camera on the right side of the screen, which you will not see at this point, we place the pins on the proximal tibia. And having done that, um, the, uh, we're pretty much ready to get started. The trick is to make these reflectors face the camera. Um, they've gotten better in the years than the ones that we were using in navigation years ago, but uh, for the most part, uh, quite a lot. Um, the pin you saw me place earlier is a lot on the proximal camera for the TV as well. And then we do uh, very much the big navigation. Uh, we're now going to look for several bony landmarks, the medial and lateral milioli, as well as the center. I just saw earlier that uh, there's also two, uh, two uh, markers on the bone that help uh, ensure that uh, the alignment of the robot is accurate uh, when it comes down to the cuts. Now, here I simply exposed the cartilage again, and you see here I'm removing it, the residual cartilage so I can have some chondral bone, which is the only thing this is going to see anyway, and so I can make sure that my cuts uh, will match exactly what I'm holding. So I'll be picking up any residual cartilage as you can see here. And then with this probe, I'll be uh, asking the robot to show me what it's seeing. And at first we map that we, we identify these points, that the software then takes those points, uh, matches them to this scan that we have in the file, and ensures that we create a dimensional model that matches what the patients are. What you see here on the top in the middle of the screen, you see the the point of moving along the particular surface of the bone, which is really very cool to see how accurate it is uh, reproducing the anatomy. So that's really great. Um, here's the anatomy of the bone cuts. I also like to use this device because it gives you a sense of the planes are before it gets started. And also, I can um, certify that just in a minute uh, once we make cuts, um, that they're exactly where it's supposed to be. Especially with a fair amount of measurements, and even after the robot. 
at this point. Um, so now we're doing the same thing we did for the theme on the video side, identifying points on the surface that then the cell phone can have to use to match the uh, patient's cell anatomy. And again, here, what we can see if we have a picture, if the markers on the image are exactly what the photos are. Prior to surgery, I'll check the, the patient's range of motion going to the surgery. She had a valid disease. So no surprise, it doesn't have much of a question traction. A um, couple of degrees, it probably should have a standard tiny bit. And overall, uh, the eyes of is all as I've noted. Um, we then uh, reposition these retractor holders because as you see here, uh, it's great to have the self-retaining retractors. There's other options, of course, um, but the problem is that it, there's really no room for a system uh, once you get started. So you have to have something that has so, um, here we are getting ready to do the distal tunnel cap. I can position the leg in a, in a position that the saw that the saw and the robot can access. Um, and so that's one of the benefits of that the holding device. So you see here I'm putting the thing on the bone so it doesn't fall off or fly off, I should say, because I want to measure. So here you see I'm measuring, and I'm also on the back table to track of these things. Um, and what we're shooting for here are distal papers are approximately six millimeters. And again, you don't lose it <laughs> because they fly off. So again, measuring them, and if you see a great deal of bone loss, you guys make adjustments for that as well. Um, every time you reposition the saw or the blade, you have to uh, re do rechecks to make sure that nothing's changing. Here we can get the post three condyles. Um, and again, we're going to be removing those, and once they're out, we're going to be measuring the thickness. Ensuring that the thickness is the same so that we actually match the patient's posterior condylar axis, not the transit condylar axis, but the posterior condylar axis. And now that this will, that the valgus alignment of this femur is not five or six, it is whatever that patient's native anatomy is because we're doing the same number on both sides. But you can see the four and a half degree uh, mid channel rotation for the transit condylar axis, 40 degrees of that. Once we finally get there. Um, here I'm recapping a little bit. We were able to make those adjustments in the slides and by changing the numbers on the computer. It's kind of cool how this works. You basically can't actually see the top of the female okay, but you can see what it's doing on the robot. And as you, um, as you make these cuts, uh, which is so the robot positions itself for us, if you push the trigger, the arm moves the saw into position, and when it knows it's correct in line, then the saw can be back. They were uh, cutting and recutting the, the proximal tibia because of the, 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 the saw flex a little bit, so I intersected all the arm that you want to intersect. And so we went back in and uh, did a quick recap um, of about two millimeters. Um, again, because the bone density had been with the saw, and so here we are doing that um, particular uh, resection. And then you can see that we got us down to about. We didn't move that down with this particular cut that was down to one millimeter, or one millimeter from where we did stuff. Okay, so here comes the table bone out, and we're going to measure the caliper. Um, it will not be the same size, unfortunately, with the of wear, but we can get a sense of the slope if it's uh, pro uh, appropriate, and the thickness, and then we can adjust us again. Uh, all you have to do is if you plug it into the software, and I want one degree down, or one degree down, it's more than do that. We were pretty much finished with our cuts, and I used the people cuts and use this device to check if we achieve the goal we did that we plan on. Um, again, see this is the uh, apologize at the end. This is three kind of fossils that we can show you. We were where we want to go, and we are at 1.1 meters, uh, which is perfect. It's exactly what we wanted. Okay, so here's our we, we finished our cuts of the robot. Before we send the robot on its way, let me make sure that we, we're getting one point. So we're putting the point on the trials and then seeing that we have a near full extension, um, excellent stability throughout the rapid motion. And then we're going to finish the preparation for the tibia, open the components as we go, and uh, achieve the, uh, uh, the outcome that we're hoping to get, which is uh, a really great need. So this part is relatively straightforward. If we do the character injection cocktail, um, so we inject around the knee with the methylene, toralac, um, even prime ingredients with the saline to get all 100 cc's 
the beacon around the periosteum, um, around the jawline, and uh, around the patella, which is actually the most, uh, the largest number of the nerve fibers are actually located. Very, very meticulous about pressurizing the bone of the cement directly into the bone so that I can actually see the trajectory coming out. Having hooked into the cementation, we'll want to trial, keep the patella under pressure and ensure that it is uh, sent to the patella plant. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, this part of the technique is not particularly different from the analysis. Uh, we do do the J9 wash. Uh, as you know, the J9 technique is dilute. It was a bit like T, is probably at its most powerful, and the I9 in the solution. Um, here we removed the lateral patella facet. You saw this picture earlier of the balance scene. There's a million of different the tube. I think that's a bit larger there. And now that everything is cemented and the cement has set and checking its alignment, positioning what you see here in the patella, this track is absolutely perfect. So this is a valuable scene. Thank you, Dr. Bini. It was an excellent uh, demonstration of a robotic uh, total knee arthroplasty. So the house is open to questions if there are any. And while we're waiting for audience questions, I have a question for you. So uh, mechanically aligned or kinematically aligned, uh, we have excellent survivorship and we have very satisfied patients. 98% uh, survivorship at uh, 10 years, 96% survivorship at uh, 15 to 20 years. Now, how do you know which set of patients is going to fit into the 7 to 12% unsatisfied group? And how is a kinematically aligned knee versus a mechanically aligned knee going to do better in that X group of patients who's going to be unsatisfied? Is there data to show that this percentage is lesser with kinematically aligned? Or how are we going to know that this is going to be the subset, which is why we are trying to do so many things and so many deviations from what we did so successfully? Okay, I disagree with that entire question. You're assuming you're successful. Great. 
So you're, you're saying you have success based on what? Patient report outcome measures that I showed you have a 50% ceiling effect in some occasions. So let me give you an example. Let's just say that you have a nice 1967 Porsche and you put on the road and you put a, a 2021 Porsche next to it and you say, okay, great. You just can't go more than 55 miles an hour. If you test those two cars and from their perspective of speed, you will say both of them go exactly the same speed and there's no difference. We can't sit on our laurels. 97% success rate is important. I think the question to ask is to ensure that kinematic alignment only changes doesn't change that. But the patient reported outcome, the concept the patient is satisfied, I think is something that we need to challenge. If I can give you a knee that has 135, 100 degrees of flexion, has no mid-flexion stability, zero, none, that whole concept goes away. The patient will be happier, but if they don't have another knee against which to compare it to, they'll just tell you they're happy. So consistently across the board, patients with different Womax scores will give you the same satisfaction scores, right? So the assumptions that we've always made is that the premise of knee replacements are that the knee should be straight, the knee shouldn't fail, the knee should, and the patient should, should do well with them, patient report outcome measures. These patient report outcome measures were invented, designed, and, in, and intended to address very limited functionality. If I have patients who can play 18 holes of golf or can walk miles and miles and miles without any swelling or any pain or any dysentery, and others that yeah, they just don't walk too many miles, they take nine holes of golf. Who's doing better? I think the guy who's doing 18 holes are better. So my point is that we have to rethink how we judge our work and keep pushing the barrier forward. We shouldn't sit on the work of the 1980s and say, oh, we solved aseptic loosening. We solved polyethylene. We're done. I'm like, no, okay, fine. If you want to be done, great. But some of us want to move forward. We want to start seeing how can we get people to have their knees feel like really, truly like a normal knee. So I don't even think we're done. I think the alignment is part of it. We have to do better on knee design, implant design. I'm a fan of medial pivot. I think that we still have to deal with the fact with an ACL deficient knee with a medial meniscus deficiency. I think we have to find ways to stabilize the knee on the medial side even more than what we're doing. We have to open up the lateral gap because that's how you get your flexion. And we have to find new ways to measure outcomes that are allow us to be able to say, hey, maybe we can make that speed limit 75 and create a car or a knee that can handle it, that we can move beyond it. So that's sort of the, the work that I'm trying to do is like, we don't have a good measure for, um, for measuring accurately our ability to restore function. And that's where the sensor work, the, the sensor work is coming in, in my end using machine learning and, and partner with companies like Google to understand how to take raw data from multiple sensors and reproduce normal kinematics in ways that I didn't think was possible. And then move forward and say, okay, how can we get continuous data? Because we also stop, had to stop thinking about, okay, at one year, how are you doing? The patient visit, the one time they see them. How, well, what about start thinking about how the patient does every day? And how about creating uh, expectations for patients that depend on what their expectations are, their lives are? If it's someone who has to bend very deeply, maybe they're, they're East Asian, they, have, they want more flexion. Why can't we give them more flexion? Someone needs to do a lot of running. How can we stabilize the knee so that it's always available to them? So let's not sit on the premises of the past. Let's rethink what, we, what is possible and how we can address and improve this process and try to create the same advancements in this decade that we've seen in the past and then find a way to measure them. So to those that say, hey, you haven't proven this is better, I say, you're right. You're right. I haven't proven it's better, but they're definitely not worse. There isn't a single paper out there that suggests that these things are loosening consistently. I do want to say one thing, though, real quick. There are people now doing kinematic alignment and resecting the PCL. There really is not any data, biomechanic data, uh, any kind of data to, to back that. All the work done by Howell and those that followed him maintain the PCL. And... I'd be a little concerned about taking it. Sometimes it's not feasible. I just don't know how it's going to play out because you have to raise a joint line if you cut the PCL and we don't do that in KA and you have a mismatch balance if you take the PCL. I hope that answers your question. Happy to have a debate around that. I obviously have a point of view and it's not the same as everyone else's. Um, 
Also, if you're getting 7% dissatisfaction rate, congratulations, you're, you're doing really well. In the United States, we're closer to 15 to 20%. Thank Point you. well taken, uh, Dr. Binney, and thank you. We'll, so we'll have I, to close the session. Of, there is one question, please. So, uh, hello, Dr. Binney. It's very hello. nice to hear you always. So I have one question for you. If you have a windswept deformity, windswept deformity, virus on one side, virus on one side, what do you do? You will still do a kinematic alignment on the both sides? Yes, absolutely. Now, here's what's going to happen. Your distal femur will be in some degree of valgus on both sides will be the same. There's the wear pattern on the tibia that does change from whatever happened, trauma, meniscal injury, et cetera. When you do your distal femoral cuts, so both in the same amount of valgus, and when you go to balance your knee, you'll be doing, you'll be doing a different type of tibial cut right? Because you got bone loss one side laterally, one side immediately. And you'll find that knees come out to be in the same amount of whatever valgus they used to have pre-op. The valgus remain valgus and virus remain valgus. No, so they're not they will be, no, they will be assuming that at some point in their life, this patient didn't have arthritis, which is where the femur will be. Now, if you have a, uh, so I'm assuming there is a massive amount of bone loss on the femoral side, which rarely happens, but occasionally happens. But if you do your, your, you look at the joint line, as defined by the distal femur, not where the tibia wound up underneath it. Okay, your distal femur, take your extra, you draw a line, you'll see that the distal femur, the, the line between the two condyles is probably seven to nine degrees, even in what in both knees. It's not one is gonna be embarrassed and one's gonna be valgus at the femur. Okay, the tibia, once you balance it, you're doing bony cuts that will be not matched. There'll be separate, different kinds of bony cuts, but they'll give you a cut that is parallel to the distal femur and extension and your collaterals will be equal. If you have a tremendous amount of uh, deformity, there's gonna be some soft tissue stretching. So it's not 100% perfect that there's no collateral ligament stretching, but 99% of the time there isn't. Now I've been to I've worked with your team, I've seen people there. You guys get some pretty aggressive deformity. So you may have a different reality, but don't think that the whole concept is completely off, even with these very big deformities. And what will happen after you finish the surgery, you'll have the knee that a knee that will be symmetric, left and right. That's a good. I should. I have done cases like that. I just have to go find one and, and show you what that, that looks like. But it's a really good question, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, it's been a great session. Thank you all, and thank you for giving your time and being here. So we move on thank to you. the next. Hand it over to Professor Malhotra sir. Thank you, panelists, and thank you, moderators. I would like to invite Professor Malhotra and Dr. Ashish Pandey for our next session, which is the life surgery on robot-assisted total hip arthroplasty by direct anterior approach. So I'm going to welcome Sean, Dr. Sean Toomey, uh, who is uh, going to show us the real life surgery of uh, Robot assisted total hip arthroplasty uh, approach. Welcome, Sean. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you all. And thanks so much for allowing me to participate in this. Stefano, great to see you guys. Martin from the Americans. We all wish we were over there with you in person. Uh, Stefano, great job for pulling an all nighter there. Uh, you still look good. <laughs> even staying up all night. It's quite early on the West Coast here, uh, but it's great to see you all nonetheless. I, I recognize this is a bit odd with this hip uh, presentation video coming uh, at the end of a knee session. And I also am well aware it's right before the gala dinner. So I'll move forward and get, get through the video, uh, which you guys will present for me and then followed by the patient. This uh, is, is a standard case. It was actually from this past Monday. Uh, it's an outpatient surgery, direct anterior robotic assisted uh, hip replacement. So go ahead and roll the video, please. So that's a pre-planned 
lower on the plain heart rate. And so I want to give you an idea uh, based on having done uh, based on having not familiarity with uh tension campaigns and therapy to CT campaigns. So rather than visiting the rock and safety surgery, it was always nice to reference this topic like the treatment on the CT imaging. Which tells us the feel of transition to that next to the make the plan. Great, thanks. I got to do my head yes on this and these things that you call this for me. And see that we use the enhanced features of the 4.0 software to realign our ML access, right? So we switched it to reference off the teardrop, and this confirmed our clinical findings of barely any difference in leg length preoperatively. You see it's a zero there. So my plan, my pre-plan is to keep the leg length close to zero lengthening at all. So that being said, let's look at the cup and size. Now the CT scan, it looks like a five, six cup is more perfect than a five, four. And looking in the transverse plane here, the camera moves the slider bar up and down. You can see you have a really nice tight fit between the ancient and your palms that were totally down immediately towards the wall without over penetrating. And uh, we got a little nice fit, uh, despite the overhanging posture pipes, to really care. There on the satchel view, it's quite easy to see that as well. Um, so, 5 6 cup looks secure to the uh, Lib C Tim is moving around making adjustments. Uh, for those that are new to make them, you can move uh, the cup in any direction using those cursors up there uh, in six degrees of plane in like 0.1 millimeter increments to dial it in exactly where you like it to be. Next, you can go to the uh, this model, the 3D model, the actual patient, and you can see what the ring preparation is going to look like when completed. And the green represents the volumetric uh, goal removal that will be accomplished with the robotic systems. Lastly, we're going to move more to the stem and look at stem sizing and position. This is templated for a size four, and you can run through from the transverse plane as tinge rolls back and forth so you get an idea of how it's going to fit inside the canal. And the relative stem version is a 23 degrees. A filament version is 6 degrees, stem version is 23 degrees. And you can really gauge your fit and fill at the prosthesis uh, uh, based on the CT imaging. You can get up or down as needed. Simple, flip, uh, simple adjustments. Finally, you can look at your final mouth here on the, uh, with the, on the regular view. Uh, look at the leg lengths in terms of sizing and whatever adjustments you want to make. Lastly, we have DROM capability where we can do virtual range of motion testing based on data that we input over six scan views of pain in my office. Where we can do a demonstration of, uh, you know, after putting in state flow, we can uh, bring the hip into flexion and internal rotation as, as we can uh, go ahead and move up. We can look for areas of impingement. The red is turning on the screen now, so that's at uh, a high degree of um, external rotation. So that was extension, external rotation, and then you can go, go into uh, yeah, so that's standing as flexion, high degrees of flexion, and external rotation. You can go ahead and uh, internally rotate as well, and then you can go into extension as well. Uh, the same if you want to bring it out of the extension. So you have the capability of looking for implant and implant. And you can modify the either modify complementation based on your needs, or you can modify if there's over any ossifies or impingement securely. You can do the wall removal if necessary. The word that comes into play with is when there's more spinal spinal pelvic uh, issues related to either a hypo mobile, hyper or mobile spine. You may use this uh, software enhancement in order to plan whether or not you may even make adjustments to your uh, plan or actually implant selection if you need to go to a dual mobility type cup uh, that also comes into play. So this being said, I'm ready to go ahead with the procedure. Doug, so I'm going to move over and do my in placement. As you can see, I got my one assistant Paul and myself, the two left, uh, as well as my start by two words are going to perform the procedure. And to do this, we're first going to do our pin placement and for the direct anterior approach. This patient, uh, the head is in this direction, and the feet are in this direction. 
This is the opposite. So we're in the facial line supine. We drape out and prep out the opposite iliac crest. So in order to do this, we're going to make a little staff incision and then spread my tonsils and then the first pins. I do like these 2.2s. I know a lot of people use the 4.0s, but the 2.2s that find very uh make it quite easy to find the interpelvic plane. There's one plane nice and solid. My system will map out the approximate location of the second pin. Again, most of this I'm going to the table and reach the only one to accomplish this task with the cannon array placement on the pelvis. Spread with the tonsils, set the pin in place. And the three point two pins are kind of nice because you find a way right down the top plane and you see how solid they are. The third row I know is right in between those two. So last week's down is just going to fit to the shovel. Spread the tonsil. And third pinches. Back some pump tension that uh, I didn't really describe today. I do have a camera at the head of the bed. So when I do my point captures, at least uh, reference my tool in that direction, and it's pretty straightforward. Okay, for all the VA users and know I'm going to reference off the ASIS, I got my uh, decision plan out. Okay, if it's being neutral probe, I can finger and use my digital um, to move past the stop users and then place this represent on the ASIS. I don't know how to make the email like gets introduction. I'm going to expose your get the server over next. Me feel. I'm going to try to open this up so you guys can all see what I've done. The basket of each is going to be exposed here shortly, which is going to cauterize. And I like using a server over there. <laughs> Utilizing better, right there. Stand up. Move up over the neck of the humor. Double angle retractively. An answer retractor rather than the answer neck. Secured in a position. My system's going to hold that from there. Switch to the long. What was it? When uh, initially adopting direct anterior program, this is one of this was one of the challenging parts is to make sure that the antibody the vasculature coming from this direction and effectively cauterizing it. So I want to make sure that it's uh, robust and cauterized. And I go both medium and lateral before I bite check the vessels so that it is a very effective hemostasis at this location. So right here, we got the capsule right through here. This is capsule right over neck of the humor. And with the 45 degrees inch rotation, what I best was the anterior lateral aspect of the femur in proximity. So I can just take such a move. I'm going to copy about 1.5 to 10 centimeters distal from tip to toe canner. You just use a bowl, you go right down the bowl. So I'm just making a, a little straight. Mark with my leather cover, which allows me to use this on my checkpoint length. So you can ask me to go use the checkpoint, it's going to go right in that angel out proximal femur. And you hear the pitch change when I take it down the wall now. You can see I'm going to keep my finger right there and directly the camera just flip the position. A little bit if you can. But what do I do? I don't want to take my finger out of there because I want to put the tool right on that checkpoint. I'm still protecting the uh, the angle of my disc. I'm going to have to stand working back to zero. 
So that puts the blade right back in the same position when we capture after we put out after So in capture, so did our proximal capture, we do that now from that top feet instantly on the leg. So I've got to do the pan back, but I have to be cat over the uh seat of the on a big center. And uh yeah, down on this one, I'm down this way. But I'm gonna put the pool right on that the uh, EKB lead and capture. All right, so that's our free capture. Uh, this guy was just patient at the very stiff or pretty hip. Now we're getting ready to get back on us down here. So before we heat that, we're gonna use a laser cooler. So this is one of the next sections we use. So we're gonna take I'm gonna put the tip of the into the Focus there, very close to us, so I can check. And now I'm going to measure out the loudly to the edge of my neck. I'm going to watch the screen there. It's going to go right to 17, 18, right? So that mark, I'm going to find my finger and make my little And demarking that, I'm going to make this on the point. Great. Now I go back to my point, find that same spot on the pair of bonus boxes. And then I'm going to raise my knee elastic. I'm going to do the full And I'm going to keep my ring down until I get to that 49 50 mark, right? So I'm going to find that and then mark that with the dot ring. And then I'm going to connect those two points to the line. Okay. So you can use this digital measurement with whatever location. In the proximal finger of the bike, you can measure off the head, left of the tip of the trope canner. Uh, this demonstrated how I can, I can the DA approach, I can see that so it's pretty well. Here. And now I got my line there. So now I know I'm going to make my back out of the bottom of the leg. And tip's going to go to neck temperature, which you can see there. You see that E minus with the two points. Paul's got good protection, it's just a medium. I'm going to make this up. I'm ready for neck on the yeah. So you can see my marks. Okay, so now I got control of my head. I got the foot screw in there, it's all right here. Uh, camera in the 60 degrees, extra rotation. So I'm going to have the femur rotated out of the way. Remove all the retractors. And since I got control of the head, just remove it. And you see it's quite diseased. Put it out of the Now I'm going for ask power preparation. I like to use this regular flare code book, which our tip is basically I'll walk it up the wall. See, I got my fingers in here. This is done by the foundation. I'll walk right up the anterior wall, the acetabulum, to get right over the rim. And then the sharp edge, the sharp point of it is able to penetrate right at the labial couch junction. A little bit of a palm strike gets its toe in for me. And then a regular cobra, regular bungee cobra for posterior protection right off the wing. Again, I'm doing the digital propagation. Now, dry action, that's the town. And we should be able to see. Quite nice. Okay. Okay. So, next step is cover checkpoint. Put the cover checkpoint up here. And then we're going to register and check. Verify. Great. Now I'm going to go with the player. So, I don't know if you can pan back or show me whatever it is, but uh, I'm going to reach across the table and the clamp has these three divots of dimples on it. And uh, I'm going to carefully to make a little bit of adjustment of camera angle. And there you go. You got the capture there, capture there, capture the other. Great. So that passed. So that's on the clamp over there are three black dimples. And since the center post of this is down on the center of the crest, we're able to 
accomplish that registration. That's the little one of the keys that it's going to help the software uh, as far as registration goes. Okay, now we're ready for phone registration. And we'll see for GDA numbers. Uh, so the line is right now the DA approach. This is actually the way that two thirds post your and one third answer. You can make it easier for the DA search or register. But again, it's all aligned with site. Someone to assist or back out. That one. Okay, okay from the fans to our landmarks. This is the poster landmark. I'm going to get to the suction plants. And the poster is trying to get to as close to that point as possible. So, this is the patient's made of anatomy. I'm going to try to read the anatomy as best possible. And then estimate where the point is that responds. Not uncommon, we have to come back to this a little bit here to uh, kind of do our best. And then the answer notch. Here, uh, Tim positioned it nicely in the crevice for me, so I can I can copy. Uh, you can see my digits on the camera. I find this in there, this uh, answer is going to be by palpating my fingers. I can see where Kim wants me to go. So I'm going to shoot for this. I'm going to go back in. She's going to go back and slip and find the spot again. I'll tell you when. I'll tell you when. Check. Good. Fine. Now, 15 points next year. Which means that yeah, the work we're doing on the job is a lot of stripping of the uh, piece. And so I have to work, we have to work in the capture, get outside the world, and have to come. And so uh, we move on to the capture. And one of the different probe is outside the memo. Interesting back if I look at all the picture point. Can you measure? Um, that outside of the outside of Now to the floor. So we're going to verification phase. Go to post here. I can do something called rock the wall. So my tool, I can build and copy the wall. You see, it's 0 0.0, 0 0.1, but it's a pure 0.6. You have to try that. See, I'm down to 1.1. So I can circumnavigate the wall in all directions, just confirm and verify for myself visually that at one point with the uh, registration, I'm going to go to the answer. And then this one's a little bit uh, tricky on the, on the DA approach to this course because we don't do a lot of stripping, but we've pretty much managed pretty well. So we just verified the last column, then we're ready to do our printing. And robots coming in. I got the one. Right, four, three, put the right turn, two, one, three. Come on, forward. Mm 
We got our five six cup or five six. Um, so the box already in a uh, register, so now I have to verify the registration. So on that black symbol, verify. Okay, now I'm ready to do a green cup. So this is the uh, trident to cup. So I'm going to do a line to line green with the green ornament. So I'll just have those on the beads on the end there, drop on the hands and down to town. My assistant actually in the slide is to back it out. I just buy you know, this type of thing and this is just that you see five that you can see there. So I'm using the straight uh, reading cup. It's going to be on green. You can see I can get down to 16. And the three numbers I'm looking at, I'm looking at the same circle right there. Was so that's how I'm looking for my own prep. I just start with me. I start to come up and down. My sister's going to put the cross into a little bit more of a pull. So we can go medium. And we're going to go medial, two, one, zero. Okay, all the zeros. I'm going to strap the rumor. Yeah. Okay, One more pressure. And off, and off. No. Yeah, and instead, we're going to release the whole thing. Okay. Now you can see the whole thing in front is right here. There's all the bottom of the single ring, minimal bug loss, we just wrap them in a stones and then drop. Now, part of the plan, we come up with what we can expect. So I want this to slide in, put more drop traffic back in. It's supposed to be as a town. So the reading cup looks good on the last of the five six cup, five six that boost. Okay, so now we're ready for the cup. So here we have our trident two cup. It's loaded on the offset insertional device, uh, which I like. It has this feature where we can rotate the cup to how to position the screws. Should uh, she need to use to uh, screws for uh, augmentation? So that being said, I also like to insert the manual. You see, I got the pack manual plate on, and I'm just going to insert the director loop under the visualization and seat it down. And I can also make sure that I'm past the stop too. So my system's going to pull out the retractors, go just to the sutures, and I'm going to just Move the cup around, and I'm also rotating this to get the cluster to a cluster in the ID location should I need to ever put screws in. Okay, so this is in place. I'm just going to remove the input, bring the moment to change the resolution, and slide it over in position. All the way down to the black line, now the outline, check. Now, Nice and a nine to go, got a lemon. Check. 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 Okay. So, this is a, a key step that I want to do is I'm going to hold the alignment rod in place of my left hand, keep it stable, and I'm going to move the and then reach down the slide while maintaining control of the stretch of the arm. And then I'm going to bring the arm up and pull her. And then check stability. And yeah, it's nice and soft. There's no problem of the cup. So I know that's well fixed. I'm not going to use screws. I guess I'm still going off and stretch the wall. Okay. Now I'm going to take a look to make sure uh, the visual stuff I cut to make sure things are appropriate. Okay. So the answer to that is nice and tough. It's another film. Well, see if I can see all the way down to the middle portion of it, and then it looks nice and soft. Take the line, very safe. Natural line in the middle. Solid. 
all, okay, work is cup is done. Mentioned so now I'm gonna adjust the second phase. So now I'm in over the proxy here. Dry that out for you. Great. Okay. Now that the release is just a part of the other one, it's concerned about when you're trying to do the new approach. So I got control of my couch and the new release is here. A little more tension. So I'm using my leg is my leg is on this, controlling this arm. So I'm going to do my releases of the capsule from inside out to expose the proximal femur. And then my system's applying gradual increased traction with the retractors, enabling me to expose that proximal femur. I'll take this still of the retractor, please. Thank you. You can see that the thing that comes out loud. That's a there got some money shot. Here's our friend. Okay. He can sort of deviate out of uh, any kind of philosophy. He's got to make sure down and down. So I'll just do general pressure with this curve here up. And you can see it. It's down and straight out of the ground nicely. Right? Second one thing trick I like to do is use a pediatric bean tower, something like this. Nice and soft to it, very flexible. So I can pass that down to now. If I can pass a very flexible tube down there, then I know I'm not going to do now perforation whatsoever. Yeah. Now we're ready to do the box control and now the box controller. So that way I like to start off with what I call the tree that or five but it's a little device here, it's a little gold. And I can mainly get out things and start from the house to prepare my channel. And uh, as I do this, I'm making care not to pivot or rotate with my wrist. So I'm on a nice clean pin cut ropes and gun. Uh, so that will be zero. And our target tail is about four. The nice thing with this active is you can basically sometimes it grows from the same back and forth like that. Finishing off with a couple of tabs. Okay, oh, that's the good visualization here. We have thoughts on the femur. I was going to see what's wrong. So, our neck and head are the two of us. Okay, good. It's kind of come out now. I'm going to find my, my capsule to talk to you there. I'll move that around the corner. Okay, good. Stand keep the leg up. Let's see you come up. And when you're ready, traction one. Excellent, Sam. Can you turn about to zero? So I keep control. You see my finger to keep control in front of my head at all times. You want to use it. Let's track it. And yeah, traction off, please. So, on the directors, I see you might have watched the production happen. We have a right zero on the leg links, which is on the uh, rotation there, and back to zero. So, with the back zero, I can go and take my intro code once again to a final final set point. I'm going to look at the end make sure the hip is low, hip and leg are being reduced. Check. And then go to my distal. 
Just a Great, okay. So our oxygen is about the same number of three longer with the compared to three odd, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take that five, take it longer, please. Uh, 127, okay, scale. Got to add some long, please, got some long. And then X to the rotate, 130. And that's an option. Okay, Sam, when you're ready, that's an option. Take that back down. Now, I said that's an option. Now, we're going to do that once again. Okay. Take the boat a little bit. Very nice, tight fit. Love it, love it, love it. Um, okay. Just clean the approximate entrance to the front of our species. I'll take it. Back to the two. It's nice, of course, to teach them and to rock that right in. And I'll start off with the chain for the uh, implantation with the Flat offset, and I can control my rotation by getting that in. So I'm going to make sure my rotation is lined up. Go straight. Turn to the trial from minus to five next. Make sure. Now it's nice and seated. That's the thing quite easy. So T minus T5. Okay, I got this one up. And that's wrong with it. And turn the rotation to Great traction on. Nice thing. Okay, to make sure traction's on. Uh, hit the negative over loose. So we can uh, find that thermal checkpoint and make sure our right wing can get it to work. Awesome job. And check. Okay, that's a keeper. So you can see that the reverse is pre op or zero, and the reverse is opposite if we're one zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to like to go back up to zero and get on the millimeter to a blank instead of a sort in the middle. So I'm going to take a zero. See, I'm going to track some long piece. Oh, top of the Oh, yes, you know, one for the other one. That's not Jim. Okay, thank you, Alan. Those crosses will not appear to be Okay. 
sustain each other on the more so they can sustain the drive as possible. So I have to implant in the form of it. So the super sponge, super drive sustain, make the engineers happy. Come on, Patrick. Okay, uh, leg up, please. And traction on. You can rotate the zero. Great traction off in the final check. Very nice little okay. final reduction. Okay, proximal check. And check. Awesome. Okay, so we're one longer than our, our opposite side. Two longer than our three, our offsets within two millimeters. All right, so uh, I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity to show you the direct engineer product assisted maker with over here. Uh, I'm very satisfied with this. I did get a uh, five six cup and a size five stem. And see that uh, when I got to the floor, I still had a little bit of room and it's a little bit of a field type of thing. I knew I could see the five actually getting more uh, intimate contact and a lot with that tapered stem. So, um, overall, I think we had a, a great opportunity to see how we perform this with one assistant and one stroke tech. My MPS, I got my uh, uh, bail left here, is assisting with the engagement and the shot, and Doug on the other end. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sean, for an excellent demonstration of uh, a robotic assisted PHA with a direct anterior approach. I just have a couple of questions for you. Uh, uh, one second. Before we do that, can you play the video for the, that patient? Uh, if you can cue the video, this is that same patient uh, two hours after his operation. You will get that video to play. See, try one more. There he is. Try it one more time. There he is. Okay, you can end the video if you like. The point is that's uh, two and a half hours after surgery. He's going home uh, about an hour later after this, just to demonstrate the, uh, you know, the relative uh, efficiency of uh, same day surgery on top of the Mako robotic assistance. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sean. I just had a couple of questions. Number one was while preparing the establishment, in case you find that there are excessive floor osteophytes, do you ream sequentially or you go as per the pre-decided size and you use one final reamer? And the second one is, do you ever encounter a situation wherein you plan something and you need to go one size up or down, both in femur and the establishment, or does it not happen that way? Sure. So to address the first question, if there's if the patient has copious osteophytes around the rim, uh, or if it's a larger size, say you're up around a 58 or 60, and it's uh, say a, a bigger muscular male, and you have to work around the soft tissues a bit more. If if I ever, and I usually try to go line to line single ream, but if I encounter any difficulty at all, I'll quickly downshift 
and drop down four sizes on the reamer and do the ream with the four size down quick and easy. It's easy to accomplish. And then I go right back up to the plan size. And that's an easy way to work around it uh, quite readily. The osteophytes, like if there are overhanging osteophytes, one of the tips and tricks you can do with the reamer, with the reaming preparation, remember it's a conical ream compared to the actual cup implantation. So if I have overhanging osteophytes, as I pull back, I keep the reamer triggered and do a little movement like this around the rim. But what that does is expands any of those osteophytes that may be impinging or causing incarceration when you go to implant the actual implant. This makes it smoother and easier. Second question, do I change my size? Not on the acetabular side so much because with the pre-plan looking at the transverse and sagittal planes, you can pretty much dial in a good tight AP fit. So the pre-plan on the acetabular side is pretty much spot on with little variance. On the femoral side, however, there is a bit of fluctuation between sizing. That's why you see me look at the manual templating first. You know, the, the recon rep has a very good sizing capability. He's been doing it for a long time. On that side, the, the MPS uh, tends to be a size up on the femoral side, right? And this seems to get a tighter fit. So they'll be within one size on the femoral side, but usually pretty much the same side on, or the plan side on the acetabular side. Sean, it's Dr. Malhotra here, and congratulations, uh, and thank you very much for uh, for uh, participating in this. I have two questions. One is, of course, uh, we, we had uh, a cadaveric course on uh, direct interior yesterday, and uh, we'll possibly have another live surgery tomorrow. But if you will allow me, uh, your patients uh, with direct interior, I'm sure, will walk as well as they do after robotic or non-robotic, because I think a lot of credit does go to the direct interior approach. So my question is uh, twofold. One, do you think this is the holy grail? Do you think you got the best which could be, or there is something you would like to tell us which you would like to improve on this design? Because I saw that primarily it's planning and acceptable preparation. Um, I'm not sure whether it gives you the haptic feedback. So is there any improvement you would like to have as a surgeon uh, so that to ask the companies to do that? And second, in your series, have you had any dislocations in the robotic assisted uh, THAs? So, so for first question, no, I don't, I don't think this is the holy grail. I don't think that we're the best we can be. I'm nowhere near that for sure. Just ask my wife, but uh yeah, I think that we continue to strive to get better as orthoplasty surgeons. And, you know, for me, the adoption of this enhanced technology is uh, I saw as a way to make me better. And I don't I don't say that doing the robotic assistance enables my patients to walk to your point. I think that's part surgical technique, surgical approach are folded in there. And my posture lateral colleagues, they, you know, they have remarkable results as well. So I'm not saying that it's any better than anybody else or the procedure's better. It works well for me and my patients, but there's always opportunity to improve. So I'd say to your question, yeah, on the technological side, it'd be great if there was a facile way to do the femoral preparation. So say the robot, there is an ability for it to prepare the femur even better than what I do with my digital ruler and the manual preparation is still a manual preparation. And, and you saw that I had to deploy some tips and tricks to ensure I was down the femoral canal. So I'm not using fluoroscopy, which with a standard DA, uh, you, you use fluoroscopy typically to make sure your cup sizing and position orientation is accurate, right? So I say on the femoral side, uh, it could be enhanced to make it even smoother, better. Uh, and then at some point, if we're able to, if you see on the, on the knee side, right, we're introducing transducers and tensioner devices if you know I, I, in, in the future I foresee that we'll have some ability to, to in a similar fashion to assess the balance of the hip using some other metrics that we don't we haven't seen or deployed so far so those are exciting thoughts I dream about to help us surgeons get even better at our craft second question was about dislocations 
you know, you put me on the spot. I'm a hip surgeon and a knee surgeon. You asked me, did my hips dislocate? Answer is no. So I'm knocking on my wood table here because uh, no, I haven't had any dislocations uh, in the last several years uh, with my DA robotic assisted. You saw my cup orientation with the DA approach is right around 40-20. I will do some variants if I do have a stiff pelvis is usually what I might see then I might increase the uh, version angle and the inclination angle to accommodate that. Um, but so far I've had good luck. Now I don't, my patient population is different than, than my colleagues overseas and right. And so I have less DDH hips, I have less femoral deformity, uh, hypoplastic acetabulum. I get some, but not the same as, as my colleagues overseas, right? So you know, I, I can't I can't be too boastful or proud because uh, I have stand more standard OA type hip as my patient population. I think uh, you made a great point. Uh, I also thought that you know the problem. Uh, we all know that uh, surgeons tend to undersize their femoral components in the AA because they are so scared of fracture, and then they talk about using a collar so that if you are undersized, you don't sink. Now, if the robot could actually prepare an envelope, you know, and so that it, it, it puts the femoral component in without splitting the femur, I think it would have done a great service uh, to the procedure because I think one of the main key concerns would always be preparing a cementless stem. And because the robot is uh, designed to put in a certain stem and it would know the exact dimensions of the femoral component and if it could prepare the you know by burr or by whatever means if it prepares the femoral and all of that that could be a very big uh, you know uh, value addition if you tell a surgeon like look let the robot prepare the femur and we tell you we can assure you that it will not crack yeah right now we're kind of relying on uh, ingenuity and understanding of the anatomy i mean there's definitely some tips and tricks you know i've done the different stems. I've done the Depew Karai stem and, you know, definitely you have to make sure it doesn't go into varus. You don't perforate the canal. And uh, so there are definite tips and tricks that are hard to teach to uh, surgeons that are embracing DA approach, how to stay out of trouble with that. You definitely have to have a feel and that feel thing is hard to teach or convey to other surgeons, particularly from remote. Uh, you know, I love getting into ORs of other surgeons and showing, showing a few things I have to try to prevent those problems that you're talking about. So my last um, <clears throat> question or comment is, uh, you are an experienced hip surgeon. Uh, you can contradict me, but would you agree with me if I said that a good surgeon uses robot to see the satisfaction of robot, to, see the, to have the satisfaction of seeing the robot do what the surgeon wants the robot to do? So it's actually basically doing what, so you feel good because it has done exactly what uh, you had planned. So, and I agree with that. It, it has to be your servant, not your master. So I think for a surgeon like you, I think that would be the ultimate satisfaction that you made the robot do exactly what you would have liked to be done in that situation. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, you, you have to stay humble, right? So I've done this a long time. This means I'm older, right? But we all have cases done manually. I did manual for many years, but there'd be days when I look at my x-ray and I'm like, ah, the cup doesn't have enough version to it, or it's the inclination is not what I expected. Even with DA using floral, the way that I look at this technology is it helps me be a better surgeon, right? It tightens my, my window. So my distribution of how good my implant positioning is, is much tighter. So I have less variance and how good my target is. This technology is helping me hit my target more accurately, more of the time. Is it perfect 100% of the time? No, but what is, right? But it, in my mind, in my own opinion, it's helping me be a better surgeon doing what I want to do, to, answer, to, to agree with your, your point. I'm tempted to ask another question. So we have a novice who has never done a hip replacement surgeon. So what do you recommend? Should he learn how to do hip replacement and then use robot? Or if somebody is going to use robot, he's better off being trained on the, on the robot itself. You know, it's, 
a great question because we still got to teach young doctors how to do this. And, and I really feel that uh, they need to do, they need to know how to do the hip natural in a manual fashion in case something happens. I mean, you know, I've been around doing this long enough. I've seen the robot have issues or power failures, you know, fortunately I have excellent MPS as they're able to troubleshoot very rapidly, but they, they do break down. There's, there's occasional times it's rare, but it does. And if you have a patient on the table, you have to know how to solve that hip, right? So you have to have that knowledge base first. Every case I go into, I plan on the technology helping me, but I feel fully confident if for some reason there's an issue, I can accomplish it and do a safe, good job for that patient. The surgeon has to have that capability, right? Do no harm. That's our first thing. We got to be able to do a good job as orthopedic surgeons and do a good hip replacement on our patient or knee replacement. So they got to learn how to do it conventionally, first and then fold in the new technology. Great. That's a great answer. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Would anybody have any other questions for Sean? We have kept him up early in the morning. Uh, any questions for Dr. Sean? Got my coffee. I can't thank you enough for joining us at this early hour. I really appreciate. And, you know, if you were here physically, we would have definitely uh, you know, given you a token of appreciation and something you would remember. I'm sure a, a gift coupon will not do the same thing and not do you need it. But <laughs> but I think our appreciation goes comes right from our hearts. Thank you so much. It has been a great learning experience for us. And thank you very much. Thank Cheers, you. everyone. My wishes to all you. Hope to see you in person someday, either in your OR or my OR. Hope to see you. Look forward and have a nice day ahead. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Bye. So, gentlemen, it's now the time to move on to the gala dinner. It's in Essex Farms. So, that's at IIT Crossing. It's just about two and a half kilometers from here. Thank you very much for your patience for having stayed through the day. I think you need some rehydration and some pepping up of your blood sugars. So, see you there. And we start at 8.30 tomorrow morning. Tomorrow, we have... Um, three live surgeries, right? We have one navigated knee replacement. We have one hip replacement, cemented hip replacement with dual mobility. And we have one direct anterior approach hip replacement. I thought that it wasn't planned initially, but I thought, I thought we started this program with a cadaver lab on direct anterior approach. Maybe we should, you know, conclude this uh, program with a live direct interior approach. So we should be done by lunchtime. So I do hope to see you all tomorrow morning. Thank you very much for staying back. And thank you, gentlemen, men behind the scenes. Recording stopped.